Sergeant, can we please start the recordings? PC recording good. Cloud is rolling. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Katowski. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on Education. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video. Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We're ready to begin. Uh, good morning to all. Um, just want to make sure folks can hear me. Um, uh, I, I want to first uh, actually welcome and, and congratulate again, uh, Chancellor uh, Porter. Um, you know, I, I have to share that it, it is very much validating uh, to see an educator uh, at the helm of our nation's largest school district. Um, and it, it means a lot. Uh, to have someone who has gone through the system, uh, educator, principal, superintendent, she, she has seen the system through a number of lenses and all of those experiences and memories um, are with her forever in every decision uh, Chancellor Porter makes. And for many educators, it, it, it means a lot. And so I just wanna congratulate again uh, chance reporter and you know we we wish her much success during the most trying of circumstances so and welcome to your uh, first uh, New York City New York City Council hearing this is where it's at uh, chance reporter so congratulations to you just and welcome uh, here to, to to the city to the city council virtual hearing and I can't wait for us to to get back to uh, to, to city hall uh, so good morning and uh, welcome to the Education Committee's hearing on fiscal uh, year 2022 preliminary budget. First, we will focus on the Department of Education's preliminary expense budget. We will be hearing from Chancellor Misha Porter and DOE's Chief Financial Officer, Lindsay Oates. This is uh, Chancellor Porter's first budget hearing. And again, I'd like to say welcome and thank you for being here this morning. It does mean a lot to us in the council. After uh, their testimony and member questions, uh, we will hear from DOE's Deputy Chancellor, Karen Goldmark, and School Construction Authority Acting President and CEO, Nina Kubota, who will testify on the department's capital budget. Finally, we will hear public testimony, uh, which is scheduled to begin around 12 p.m. or so, although it might run a little bit later. The Department of Education's fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget totals $28.48 billion, excluding pension and debt service, and has grown to represent 31% of the city's total budget. While the budget grows by $921.2 million when compared to the fiscal year 2021 adopted budget, it fails to make additional investments to address the learning loss or really the impacts experienced by our students. That's the, really the word that is really important, the impact experienced by our students during remote learning, nor does it make any additional investments to support the programmatic and operational costs brought upon by the pandemic. Additionally, the budget recognizes $254.8 million in cuts to fiscal year 2022 alone, and will recognize $356.7 million in baseline cuts to fiscal uh, 2022 and in out years since the, since the, the last budget cycle. Of this is a $45.8 million cut to community schools, the learning to work program and the affinity network contracts. These are programs that continue to play a vital role in holistically supporting our students and addressing their academic needs. And, and I'm on the record saying, and I, and I stand by this, every school should be a community school. 
we need to move forward. We can't, we can't go back. So this is going to be a very big priority for the council. And I'm sure it's a priority for the chancellor and folks in DOE as well. The preliminary budget uh, only adds $35.2 million to fiscal year 2022 and in the out years to support the creation of 27 new community schools and the hiring of 150 new social workers. While this is a great investment, it is not enough. Our kids are facing unprecedented levels of trauma, uh, remote learning fatigue, uh, housing and food insecurity, social isolation, technological barriers, and stress. As I have said many times before, and we'll say again, um, yes, every school should have a social worker. Every school should be a community school. Uh, the, the pandemic will leave lifelong trauma for a generation of students, and it is our responsibility to equip them with the support necessary to overcome academic barriers and make the most of their education. This brings me to my next point, special education. According to a report recently released by DOE, 9% of students with disabilities are not receiving any special education instruction, and 37% are only receiving half of the instruction they are entitled to as outlined per their IEPs. Furthermore, 28% of students only receive partial or none of the related services they are entitled to. Many of my colleagues and I fear, uh, Mrs. Chancellor, that the pandemic will exasperate the need for special education instruction and services, and that many of our uh, neediest students will fall behind. I find it unsettling that instead of making an investment in, in fiscal year 22 and in the out years to expand special education services and instruction, the budget adds $220 million for Carter cases in fiscal year 21. Why are we okay with spending that much on lawsuits and, not, and are not investing additional dollars into related services and special education support staff? The state executive budget proposed by the governor would have resulted in devastating cuts to school aid that would have negatively impacted our students. I was relieved to hear that the state budget director announced cuts will not be happening as a result of the American Rescue Plan passed by Congress. I hope to see a budget in Albany that provides New York City with the education dollars we are owed prior to the pandemic and certainly during the pandemic, and that we receive all of the aid intended for New York City schools uh, from the Congress. We hope to hear from you your thoughts regarding the federal stimulus as well. Uh, some housekeeping, I'd like to remind council members that the chancellor and CFO are here to testify on the expense budget. Um, please save questions about the capital budget for Deputy Chancellor Goldmark and President Kubota. Council members will be limited to five minutes in the first round of questions and three minutes in the second round if time allows. Public testimony on the education budget will begin approximately around 12 p.m. Uh, before I conclude, I want to thank committee staff, uh, Chelsea Batemore, uh, Ms. Sarkissian, financial analyst, uh, Doheny Sampura, finance unit head, um, and Malcolm Butterhorn and counsel for, for the committee, Jan Atwell, and Kalima Johnson, senior policy analyst, I also want to thank my staff, Anna Scaife, Vanessa Ogle, Maria Henderson, and Janine Caracchetti. I would now like to introduce my colleagues who have joined us uh, for the hearing um, and just uh, make sure I have everyone that's present. We have Council Member Rose, Council Member Lander, Council Member Gradenchik, uh, Council Member Gennaro. Welcome, Council Member Gennaro. Congratulations. It's great, great to to have you here with an education committee or back to back to the city council. Uh, we have council member Borelli, uh, council member Brennan, council member Lewis, council member Amprey Samuel, council member Kalos, council member Drum, council member Gibson, council member Rosenthal, council member Cornegie, council member Barron. Um, and forgive me if we if we missed anyone, we'll, uh, I see council member Lander, I think I mentioned. Forgive me if we missed anyone, we'll certainly um, uh, add uh, additional folks, um, and and with that we we can we can proceed. Uh, actually, uh, one moment, Chair uh, Public Advocate Williams was going to give 
an opening statement and then we're going to turn and then I will swear in um, the chancellor and her backbench. So, yes, right. and it gives me great honor to uh, welcome and introduce uh, a great partner and friend in government and uh, truly a champion for public education in, in New York City. Um, uh, please welcome public advocate uh, Jumani Williams. Time starts now. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you for your partnership and your leadership on, on so many issues when it comes to our students and uh, uh, their education and the leadership you've shown in the past year trying to get through this pandemic. Uh, welcoming uh, the chancellor uh, and uh, again, congratulations, uh, both my uh, fiance and uh, daughter, stepdaughter uh, were brought to tears when you were introduced as they saw themselves in you. And welcome Council Member Gennaro, who I serve with uh, in person and now we're on Zoom. Uh, so good morning. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jemani Williams, public advocate for the city of New York. I'd like to thank Chair Traeger again for his leadership, continued advocacy around education issues. Uh, earlier this year, the governor presented the state's budget, preliminary budget for fiscal year 2022, which, at reallocate, which allocates $31.7 billion in funding to school districts through school aid. The school tax relief program, also known as STAR and federal funds, the budget also allocates $4.3 billion in federal supplemental funds to schools to support ongoing costs related to the pandemic. Two weeks ago, the Congress passed, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan Act, a $1.9 trillion economic stimulus that will provide $6.1 billion in New York City's budget and $9 billion in K-12 schools across the state. And according to the mayor's financial plan for fiscal year 2022, the city will be allocating $28.5 billion to the Department of Education for this coming school year. Given the fact that we now have additional funding coming into our schools from the federal government, we need the administration to clarify how these funds will affect DOE's budget and our school system. For 2020 to 2021 school year, our Department of Education budget is $34 billion, of which 57% is provided by the city, 36 by the state, and seven by the federal government and other resources. At a committee hearing back in October, DOE representatives highlighted COVID-19 related expenditures due to the transition to remote learning in their testimony. Money was spent on remote learning devices, CO2 devices, HEPA purifiers, PPE. Given that we now have a growing vaccine distribution, the DOE needs to determine how this last phase of the pandemic will impact its expenses. I'm calling on the DOE to designate sufficient funding so every student has a remote learning device and every school has enough social workers and counselors. In order for schools to create and maintain a healthy learning environment, uh, the ratio of guidance counselors to students should re be reduced from its current one to 327 to one in 60 in schools with the highest need and one in 100 in every other school. At a hearing of this committee last month, DOE representatives explained they found out the administration and the NYP were bringing in two new classes of school safety agents of 457 SSAs to be exact, which actually went against the pledge that administration made to the council last year. Before the budget last year, the administration assured the council there will be hiring freeze on SSA, so they essentially have broken their promise. But to make matters worse, the onboarding of 475 new SSAs equates to $20 million, which could have been invested in other restorative justice models. Rather than spending money on hiring more SSAs, the DOE should have used those funds to hire uh, the necessary social workers, guidance counselors with a commitment to three-year rollout of 3,500 new social workers. But, uh, last time I spoke on this issue, uh, the, the union leader actually very intentionally uh, misused my words. Uh, and so I wanna just make sure a correction uh, that uh, we are, I am most interested in making sure uh, all of our students, faculty are safe in schools. And secondly, uh, that no one loses their job and their employment. And one of the best ways to do that if there's going to be a headcount is through attrition. And so I'm sorry to see uh, DOE has lost, uh, has broken their promise. It is important to talk about the response to trauma when having conversations about in-school restorative justice programs. I'm calling on DOE and administration to designate funding for the city's trauma responsive education program, also known as TREP. The program is currently being funded through a grant from a fund from public schools. The training, which is accessible to all city staff citywide, has been extended through June 2021. It will be immensely benefit, beneficial uh, to our school administrators and our students if we continue to fund and expand this program in the coming school year. But another area we need to focus on when it comes, when it comes to funding is language access. It's been reported that English ELL learners and immigrant families are deeply concerned that their children have fallen behind and are, were already behind before the pandemic. According to a new survey conducted by the New Immigration Coalition Education Collaborative, 36% of parents and guidance guardians surveyed that since the start of the pandemic, they have not received information or assignments from their children's school in the language spoken at home. 
given this data, it is clear that more money has to be allocated to our city's parent university program. Parent University is a collaboration of resources and course offerings to help parents become more informed and involved in their children's education. With a growing immigrant population, it is DOE's responsibility to make certain that families whose first language is not English are fully informed of their child's performance and participation. I'd be remiss not to mention the 11.5% increase uh, in spending that NYPD uh, will be receiving from the city in this budget. While the Department of Education is receiving a 6% cut uh, compared to last year's budget, I'd like to also mention that DYCD is facing a 6% cut. Quality education program that meets the social and emotional needs of all students helps promote public safety. Funding for our city's public school system should be distributed towards programs that will improve our education environments, not maintain the status quo. It is time for the Department of Start Prioritizing Restorative Justice Programs. I look forward to hearing how the agency will support our schools given the administration's proposed budget for fiscal year 2022. And just to clarify uh, my last uh, statement at this hearing, uh, didn't bring up any new reports. Uh, I mentioned reports of abuse. It was strange that that was brought up uh, as something new because if we wouldn't be having these discussions if these kind of reports haven't been made. Uh, I think we should all dream of a school uh, where police infrastructure is not the main thing that keeps folks safe. I look forward to dreaming with everybody and trying to figure out how we all can get there uh, with a just transition. Thank you. Thank you, Public Advocate Williams. I will now go over some procedures before swearing in the administration. So good morning again, everyone, and welcome to the fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget hearing uh, for the Department of Education. I am Malcolm Butehorn, counsel to this committee. Before we begin testimony, as with all virtual hearings, there are a few reminders I would like to go over. Today's testimony will first begin with the Department of Education, followed by council member questions. Following the DOE, the committee will next hear from the School Construction Authority and DOE personnel on the capital budget, again, followed by council member questions. Following um, the administration, we will then begin testimony from the public. For the public, I will be calling on witnesses to testify in panels, so please listen for your name to be called. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will give you the go-ahead to begin after setting the timer, so please listen for that cue. We have an extremely large number of witnesses to hear from today, so for everyone to be treated the same, all public testimony will be limited to two minutes. In the interest of time, at the end of two minutes, when the sergeant has declared your time is up, please wrap up your comments so we can move to the next panelist. Council members present, for those of you who have questions for a particular panelist, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you in the order with which you raised your hand after uh, the full panel has completed its testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. For the purposes of this virtual hearing at this time, there will be no second round of questioning, um, but if time allows um, and the chair approves, we will do a second round for three minutes each. Finally, for anyone who wishes to submit written testimony and is not able to be here today or is signed up and has to uh, log off later and has not testified, you may submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. It will be accepted for up to 72 hours after the hearing has adjourned. I will now call on the following members of the Department of Education to testify and answer questions. Chancellor Porter, LaShawn Robinson, Deputy Chancellor of School Climate and Wellness, Adrian Austin, Deputy Chancellor of Community Empowerment, Partnerships and Communications, Lindsay Oates, Chief Financial Officer, Lauren Siciliano, Chief Administrative Officer, Kevin Moran, Chief Schools Operations Officer, Christina Foti, Deputy Chief Academic Officer, Brenda Garcia, Executive Director of School Support and Implementation, and Stephanie Crane, Chief of Staff, Division of Early Childhood Education. I will first read the oath and then I, I will first read the oath and then I will call on each of you in order uh, to respond. Uh, if you could please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Chancellor Porter.
I do. Thank you. Deputy Chancellor Robinson? Yes, I do. Deputy Chancellor Austin? Yes, I do. Lindsay Oates? Yes, I do. Lawrence Siciliano? Yes, I do. Kevin Moran? Here. Christina Fodi? Yes. Brenda Garcia? Yes. And Stephanie Crane? Yes, I do. Thank you. Finally, for question time, due to the large number of administration officials present, anyone that will be answering questions with the chancellor, if you could please state your name before you speak, it will make it clear in the official transcript who is speaking. Chancellor Porter, whenever you are ready. Thank you and good morning. Good morning, Chair Traeger, and thank you for uh, such a wonderful welcome. Um, thank you to all the council members for welcoming me into this space and Public Advocate Williams also. Um, first, I wanna apologize for my lateness. The Bronx really tried to keep me this morning um, and, and, and my council member friends from the Bronx know uh, sometimes the Bronx just keeps you close, but I am here and I'm excited to be here. I also wanna just thank and acknowledge all of the council members I've had the privilege of working with in the Bronx and I look forward to expanding that partnership across the city. So I am Misha Porter, New York City Schools Chancellor, and joining me today is Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson, Chief Financial Officer Lindsay Oates, Chief Administrative Officer Lindsay, Cic I'm sorry, Lauren Siciliano, and Chief School Operations Officer Kevin Moran. I wanna thank you for this time to introduce myself and to discuss the mayor's fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget for New York City Schools, as well as the future of the New York City Department of Education at this most unprecedented time. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the work of Speaker Johnson, Chair Traeger, and the many individual members of the City Council who have supported our students and schools throughout the years. And of course, particularly this year, this most difficult year that we've all experienced across the city. I've witnessed the firsthand the benefits of your advocacy and investment on behalf of our students and families, uh, and especially, you know, principals across the city, thank you for your advocacy around the relief um, that we were able to give them yesterday from, uh, you know, the whole harmless that was provided in, in service of forgiving debts. So I thank you for that work as well. I actually started my first week as chancellor and today is my seventh day. So I'm like an experienced chancellor now. Um, I started my first week on a five borough tour. I visited a school in every borough of the city. I started in Brooklyn, went to Manhattan, had to stop in the Boogie Down Bronx, went to Queens, my, my borough of birth, but I ended in Staten Island. And I have to tell you that every day and every visit got better and better and better. And it was a joy and a pleasure to see the great work happening in schools and the great work that teachers are doing with students both in person and remote. I also was joined by elected representatives from districts across the city. And together we saw that work firsthand. So I wanna thank all of the representatives who took the time to join me. When I think about the ways this pandemic has affected our city, my mind goes to our children first. And that's not just because I've been an educator for more than 20 years, it's because I'm a mother, I'm an auntie, I'm a sister, um, and, and I'm a student of this system myself. And it is because of our young people that I carry the responsibility of engineering a significant recovery for all of us in the years to come. In our school right now, the, the people who are essential workers, the, they're visionaries and city leaders of the future, our students. We, we are, must ground them in opportunities to really move this city forward in a way that we can't even imagine as of yet. It's up to all of us together to give them every tool and resource they need to grow in the next great generation. And I'm proud to be working towards that mission in partnership with all of you. And in fact, in all of the conversations I've had, starting with Tra Chair Traeger um, and public advocate Williams, um, you know, we've talked significantly about this moment. It's not about what the school system is going to do alone, but what about the city is going to do in partnership in service of our students. 
So I'm very newly appointed, seven days, and given that we will be working closely together in the coming weeks and months, I would like to take the opportunity today to introduce myself and to share a little bit about my background and to describe the DOE's goals for all of our schools, students for the coming year. As I said 17 times already, my chancellorship began a week ago on March 15th, but my history with the DOE goes way back. I grew up in South Jamaica, Queens, graduated from Queens Vocational Technical High School, I went to schools, um, elementary school in Far Rockaway and in South Jamaica. I was bused to school in middle school to Ozone Park. And so I know a lot about the experiences that our students have as we think about integration and diversity in our schools. My mom is a teacher and she was absolutely and continues to be my favorite teacher. And what I learned from her is the importance that one teacher can make in the life of a young person. But I learned that from many of my teachers. I learned that from my auntie Brenda, who was my pre-K teacher and still at family gatherings, we must do educational activities because I'm from a family of teachers. My first grade teacher, Ms. Perlman, who just made me feel so special and important. And from my 10th grade English teacher, Ms. Hulak, who saw me in some of the ways that um, we talked about we need to see our students when I was having my own personal struggles as a high school student. And because of all of that, I know with certainty, it's my duty and responsibility that I've carried with me my whole life to lead by moving forward and leaning in to see every student create opportunities for them in every moment and work in partnership with schools, communities, principals, teachers, and leaders. I want to give every student that experience, to have an educational experience that changes their life because I know it's possible. Up until now, I've dedicated my career to service in education in the Bronx. I started as a youth organizer with a group called Take Charge, Be Somebody. And in that youth group, we had the opportunity to become a part of the Bronx Center plan. And as a as an 18 year old, I was able to see a possibility for a Bronx that is present today. When we were part of that plan, they were just talking about building the new courthouse, building, developing a 300 square block area redevelopment plan that included the mall, um, that included, you know, so many things that weren't there when I was 17, but are there now. And it really prepared me to see the possibilities and potential in the moment and not just be grounded in what we see currently, but to really see what can be. And thanks to my friends at the Urban Assembly who have made major investments, not only in our schools across New York City, but also in me personally, um, believing in my potential as a young person to partner with communities and, and partner with residents in the Bronx to build the plan that led to the creation of the Bronx School for Law, Government and Justice. And that work that we did together really speaks to my commitment um, from my very early beginnings of working in collaboration with parents, families, community-based organizations and elected officials to build a possibility. And that possibility became the Bronx School for Law, Government and Justice. And that was about taking that, the Bronx criminal court complex and turning it into a place where young people would learn the inner workings of the court system by being a part of it and not by going through it. Yesterday was a great day for me. I got to go back to LGJ for the reopening of high schools and it was amazing. What was more amazing was to see that the work that we had started many, many years ago continues to build. And Principal Hernandez and the team at LGJ, their commitment to law, government and justice, um, and I'm gonna put an infamous emphasis on justice today, continues um, as I walk through classrooms and watch young people talk about the anti-Asian violence that's been happening in our city and the things that they could do both in their schools and their communities to address it. You know, LGJ built me up from an English teacher to an assistant principal to a principal over 18 incredible years. And I, I've said this to many of you who I've spoken to already, being a principal was my absolute favorite job um, because that is where you have the most impact on what happens between students and teachers in the classroom. And so I look forward to continuing to lean into those partnerships to build our school system. 
And then Chancellor Farina tapped me to become superintendent of District 11 in the Bronx, which includes Pelham Parkway, East Chester, and Woodlawn. And what I learned very quickly in that role was that it wasn't going to be a thing that I did alone to move and develop a district, but it was going to be how I built a community across principles um, to build strong collaborations that would move our collective district forward. It was about the investment we all made in all of our schools and all of our students. And after three years in that role, Chancellor Carranza, who I am so honored to succeed in this role, and I admire greatly and, and you know, am just deeply appreciative of the work that he started for our system, promoted me to executive superintendent for the Bronx. And in that position, I was responsible for leading the entire borough's 361 schools, just a few, and 235,000 students across community school districts seven through 12, including the high schools. And now I sit here in the role of a lifetime for an educator um, in, with great honor to be appointed chancellor of the nation's largest school district. So from this new position, let me just say a few words about where we stand in the reopening process and our goals going forward. Over the past year, I've seen the impact on our children from my point of view as Bronx Executive Superintendent and also as a parent. And I've said this to many of you already, if anything is going to disproportionately affect a community, it will happen in the Bronx. I saw firsthand the impact that remote learning had on, on our most vulnerable students. And so we knew immediately that we had to create opportunities for remote learning that extended beyond that which we saw. And so we built a strong partnership with BronxNet and our teachers began creating lessons that students could not only engage in um, in a remote setting or in person, but also through a partnership with BronxNet and they could view on their public access television. And that's why I keep saying, my main priority as chancellor is open, open, open. As you know, already on February 25th, we were able to reopen our middle schools, um, which, uh, which rejoined the 3K, pre-K, K-5, and District 75 schools that opened and reopened in November. And just yesterday, with great excitement, we reopened all of our high schools. And today, my 10th grader is excited to be going in for her first day and excited about the two days a week that she'll be in person. And she's more excited about the opportunity to reconnect, make those social connections again with our teachers in person, her friends, and just be able to be in a classroom sitting at a desk. Um, yet she's joining up to 55,000 high schoolers who've been doing the same starting yesterday. Approximately half of our high schools will be offering in-person learning five days a week to all or a majority of their students. And we will continue to wrap, ramp that up the same way we did with elementary and middle schools. I'm also so pleased that we will be bringing back all sports in April and offering additional PSAL opportunities throughout the summer. This is essential, not only for academics, but for the mental health of our scholars. Sports in particular provide a much needed outlet for our kids and our children have been without them for nearly a year at this point. By having important offerings and opportunities like sports that are driven by student interests, we can expect to see even more students engaged and excelling in academics. Beginning tomorrow, all families across the city will have another chance to opt into blended learning for the remainder of the school year, thanks to the new guidance from the CDC. This is something I'm very proud to offer because I've heard from so many parents who wanted this opportunity, and I know you have as well. And I can tell you, we're ready to do this. In the Bronx, we saw early on that we could move to five days a week, that we could get more students in person. And we started before we asked because this moment is about what we do for children. It's going to take a Herculean effort on a part of our schools to open, and we're going to help them and guide them through it so that we can serve as many in children students as in person as possible. And we're going to need to do this together with all of you. Health and safety. As of today, with our high schools back open, we have up to 315,000 children learning in physical classrooms, leading the nation by leaps and bounds. And that number will grow even more in April when we implement the CDC's three foot guidance and open our 3K, pre K, elementary school, and elementary district 75 schools to additional students. 
And we know that it is safe. In fact, with a 0.57% COVID positivity rate, our schools are the safest places to be and it's where our children need to be. So we are going to continue with what we know works, weekly in-person testing for our students, educators, staff, and now our student athletes and coaches, 30-day supplies of PPE, nightly cleanings, mandated social distancing and mask wearing and support and monitoring from our situation room. And I can't talk about this without acknowledging the great work that our custodians, our school food folks, our school safety agents, our crossing guards and our nurses have done in our schools to make all of this happen. New York City's school reopening plan remains the gold standard and it's a proven approach to safety. We're proud that many of our measures are now included as national guidance from the CDC as best practices for schools across the nation. None of this would be possible without our school staff and educators, the hardest working group of people out there. I'm also excited about what the summer holds for our students. This summer school will be more important than ever before given the year we're coming out of. It's absolutely crucial for many students in order for them to be set up for success for the coming year. And right now we are reimagining what summer school can and will be because what we know is that this summer will not be like summers past. It's this summer needs to be the most exciting, most fun, most academically impactful, um, it needs to address the social and emotional needs of our students and meet them where they are to build that bridge to September. Reopening goals for September. In the weeks ahead, we will be making progress toward our shared commitment to fully reopening all of our schools to all of our students in September 21-22. Our 2021 Student Achievement Plan reflects the realities of this past year of learning and looks ahead to what our students will need next year. It is rooted in healing and a 21st century approach to learning. First and foremost, I wanna give every student the option to go back into school buildings five days a week starting this fall. I want New Yorkers to know that our buildings are safe and our schools are ready to open. And I hope to see everyone back full-time come September. But we know we are opening schools to a different reality than we close. We are coming back from the hardest year of our collective lives. So second, I want to make sure that what we teach reflects students' lived experiences, including any trauma related to this past year, and that they see themselves in the curriculum that they experience in their classrooms and in their schools. We will have social emotional supports in place as well, not only for our students, but we also must wrap ourselves around our staffs. We are aware that many people will be returning to schools where they've lost somebody. They may walk past an office that was once occupied by someone else who's no longer there. They may think about a power professional who supported them or a kitchen worker who gave them an extra lunch every day. So we will have a dual pronged approach addressing both academics and social emotional learning. And we will continue to support our more vulnerable students, including our students with disabilities, students in temporary housing and multilingual learners as a priority going forward as we have done throughout this pandemic. Third, I wanna take the lessons we've learned during the pandemic into the next school year. As an example, the pandemic forced us to harness technology to create a 21st century learning experience. And we've delivered nearly half a million devices into students' hands. At the same time, it showed us that human interaction is critical. Nothing, absolutely nothing replaces the experience between a student and a teacher in a classroom. So I wanna bring these two worlds together using technology to address students' individual needs, both for those learning full-time in classrooms and those who may wish to continue learning remotely. Budget. These are the overarching priorities, needs, and initiatives that underpin our budget for the coming fiscal year. The Department of Education's budget for fiscal year 2022 is approximately 35.1 billion. I'm pleased that the budget includes 35.2 million for fiscal year 2022 and out years for social emotional learning and mental health work, including an expansion of 27 new community schools and 150 new social workers. As you know, we weren't able to count on stimulus funding until very recently, and we were facing a dire financial picture. However, the tide is beginning to turn in terms of both the virus and the budget. 
The preliminary and budget included reductions of approximately 293 million. But as a result of Senator Schumer's advocacy and the Biden administration's commitment to ensure FEMA funding is available to New York City, the mayor has already announced 194 million will be restored, including the savings involved in fair student funding. We are currently reviewing the new federal stimulus legislation that was just signed into law and how it will further impact our schools. We know that the state could supplant this funding like they did with the last federal stimulus. This means they replace regular state funding with federal funding, denying us our full allotment from the state. This would harm our students since we need every dollar we can get from the federal government to ensure our schools come back stronger than ever. So we are eager to continue to working with the council to make, our, make sure our schools get the full amount they are owed. We are pleased to see that the Senate and Assembly proposed to pass through to New York City our full stimulus amount. With the full stimulus funding, we can deepen our investments by beginning to tackle the lasting impacts of the pandemic and specifically build on our commitments to address the academic and social emotional needs of all of our students who've gone through incredible challenges over the past year. We are advocating our case in Albany every day working closely with the mayor's office and the mayor's executive budget will include our proposals for how to use the stimulus funding passed to us through the state budget process. And we are and continue to be grateful for your advocacy on this front as well. I wanna conclude by reiterating the pledges I made to our communities on the day my appointment was announced. To our students, to young people, I'm indebted to you as a leader, as a teacher, as a principal, We'll expand learning opportunities and do more to address trauma and academic needs. We'll work to ensure you see yourselves every day in the curriculum experiences because we know that this is very, very real. To our families, we'll improve communication and build trust. I've heard you, I've been to your schools, attended virtual town halls, conferences and meetings. We're gonna to continue to build on investments we've made in your children, our children because every child deserves a rigorous, high quality education where they see themselves in the curriculum every single day. To our staffs, our teachers, our principals, our school aides and secretaries, our paraprofessionals, our guidance counselors, our kitchen staff, our nurses, our custodians who have made our building shine and sparkle every day. Our school safety agents who've been at the front lines greeting folks every day, jumping in whenever needed to every single person who works at the New York City Department of Education. We will listen closely so that we can do the work where we need to get it done. And to all of you on the city council and to our many advocates and community leaders, this moment is not about what the school system will do alone. It's not about what I will do alone, but it's about what New York City will do together to invest in our children, to make sure our children know we put them first in this city. I'm ready to get to work. I am so honored to serve in this role. And as I've been saying, let's go, let's do this. I'm ready. It is time to get moving. Thank you. Thank you so much to the council. Thank you, Chair Traeger. And I'm happy to take your questions. Very awesome. Uh, welcome introduction, uh, Chancellor, Chancellor Porter. Uh, again, welcome again. And uh, just want to note also, we've been joined by uh, Council Member Salamanca, Council Member Riley, uh, Council Member uh, Miller, and Council Member uh, Rodriguez. Um, and I, I also just want to quickly note uh, on the record to publicly acknowledge and thank uh, former Chancellor Richard Carranza as well. Um, uh, he is someone who I spoke from his heart, uh, spoke his truth. Uh, educator as well, and uh, was extremely accessible, visible, um, visited every corner of our city, and uh, followed up on commitments in terms of increasing supports for our kids uh, when I first met him. So I, I want to just publicly acknowledge that and thank him for his service to the city of New York, uh, and also say that former Chancellor Farina has an expression, which I shared with Chancellor Porter, that the answer is, is in the room. And the answer to, to lead our nation's largest school system was in the Bronx. Uh, and uh, you don't, we don't have to do a national search when we have right here in New York City such extraordinary talent. And congratulations again, Chancellor Porter. We, we truly are very happy 
uh, for this announcement. And we, we wish you much, much success, particularly in the moment that we're in. Uh, now, now we'll get we'll get to, to questions. Um, and I, I know that we, we touched upon this in, in the opening, just kind of if there's any further clarity, I, I'd appreciate. Um, we know that there um, is still a level of uncertainty uh, from the state um, in, uh, with, with regards to school aid, which is in flux. Um, how much uh, additional education funding uh, do you expect New York City to receive as a result of the American Rescue Plan and the previous stimulus that was uh, passed in December? Um, is, there, is there any rough estimate which the DOE has at this time? Thank you for your question, Chair Traeger. I'm gonna ask uh, Lindsay Oates to take that question. Hello, this is... Can you hear me? Yes, but there's a lot of feedback. Do you have us on the live stream in addition to the Zoom? No. All right, we'll just give you one moment while this 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 is a real life example of uh, of, of the of the joys of remote virtual uh, work. So that uh, we we certainly appreciate everyone trying to make it work. Lindsay, just acknowledge when you want us to unmute you again. All right, if we can go ahead and unmute Lindsay, we'll try it again. Okay, can you hear me hey. now? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear yes. me? Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Um, good morning, Chair Traeger. Nice to see you. Um, as always, thank you for the question. Um, I'm thrilled to talk about good news with all of you today. We've all talked about um, extremely hard cuts and uh, declining resources for the department over the last several years. And those have been hard conversations. And as always, I have very much appreciated, Chair Traeger, your advocacy and that of all council members um, to ensure that uh, education has what we need during uh, tough fiscal times. So your question, Chair Traeger, was about stimulus funding. We, of course, don't exactly know what the full value of the stimulus funding will be, um, partly because the state's enacted budget, as you know, has not yet happened, and that very much will influence the outcome of the stimulus dollars that we will get, and then we will see what the city's executive budget um, will do in terms of our uh, stimulus dollars for fiscal year 22. We do believe that the full value we could get from um, the SIRSA Act, which is the December 2020 package, as well as the American Recovery Act, which was recently passed, could be somewhere around um, six to six and a half billion dollars total. Um, but again, very, very much depends on what happens with the state's enacted budget, um, as well as the city's executive budget, which will be released in about a month. So we are looking forward to having conversations with you over the next um, coming weeks. Um, about those resources. Thank you, thank you, uh, Lindsay. Um, and just to get a note for my colleagues and those watching, um, there there was a federal bill that was passed uh, last December, um, uh, before this American Rescue Plan, and New York State um, was again proposing to supplant that money, which is really outrageous. Uh, last year and last. Uh, year's budget, New York State took $700 million or plus um, in aid and they supplanted, which they cut us uh, during the most trying of times. And uh, so, that we, so we, they passed the bill, uh, Congress in December. Now we, we just had the American Rescue Plan. Um, so it's really important to, to hone in on what exactly is the amount for, for New York City. And also the state is proposing not just cuts, but also increased mandated costs down to the city, which also is really a cut. Um, and so uh, these are very important things to, to keep an eye on. I, I would appreciate if uh, there's a commitment uh, for us to work closely on that so we, we know what, what actual the amount is that we have. Um, so I, I'll turn to some of the key budget priorities 
Um, in the, the fiscal 2021 executive budget uh, introduced uh, and baselined $45.8 million in cuts to community schools, the learning to work program and affinity school contracts. While I'm thankful uh, for your commitment to restore uh, $30.6 million of this cut in fiscal uh, year 2021, I am disappointed that this restoration was not baseline. Uh, these programs, as I'm sure the chancellor would agree, continue to play vital role in the academic and social emotional enrichment of our students at a time uh, where they are most vulnerable. Uh, providers continue to wear many hats uh, as to support our students in a holistic way. Um, and Chancellor, you know, we are expecting this additional funding, you know, once we have priority on the number. Um, but can you commit, uh, once we know what the number is, can you commit to restore and baseline funding for these programs? And if not at this time, what can you do to help us advocate for the baseline funding to be restored? Sorry, I was muted, um, but you know, this is what happens remotely. Uh, so thank, uh, thank you, Chair Traeger, I appreciate the question. Lindsay's gonna take more of it. You know, we continue, we're committed to continuing to partner and be in partnership with, with our colleagues across the city. This has been a difficult budget year, um, but I'm gonna have Lindsay talk a bit more about what we're doing in that area. Uh, thanks for the question, Chair Traeger, and we, of course, again, appreciate your advocacy for the restoration that we had for these important programs this past November plan, and particularly for your advocacy fully restoring the community schools reduction. Um, can't say enough about uh, your advocacy really to support that. One thing I just, so, you know, the obvious thing that we're looking at is whether stimulus dollars can be used to um, support these programs. Um, we're looking at other funding sources that would be available potentially to support these programs. Just as a reminder, stimulus funding is by nature temporary. And so your point about baselining, finding a baseline resource is something that of course we would be advocating for as well and working with our city partners on that. Um, and I hope that you'll see more to come in the executive budget. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and Lindsay, if I could just quickly follow, follow up on that, and I, and I appreciate the answer. And I think, you know, and I, I, I just want to note, um, I think there is a lot of alignment between the council and folks at DOE on the importance of community schools, LTW. Um, we just have to make sure that we secure the resources and just know that we, we will continue to fight very hard to make sure that we have as much resources as possible, not just to restore, but to really advance this across the city. Um, and uh, I really believe it's important uh, that we emphasize that point. Uh, Ms. Oates, if you could just, uh, uh, I don't know if you have it in front of you, um, how many schools net right now um, in New York City do not have at least one full-time social worker? Do, do you have that, Ms. Oates? Uh, Chair Traeger, I do not currently have that number with me, but I will be happy to work with the team and uh, follow up. Yeah, and also, if, if you could just, uh, when, when following up on that point, uh, without a social worker, without uh, at least one full-time counselor, um, to give us a budget estimate of how much would it cost to make sure that every single school had at least one social worker, had at least a, a counselor. I think it's really important because to me, it's not about going back to what February looked like last year. It's about making sure that we move forward and that we have adequate supports in every single school uh, because we need to look forward and we, 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 can't, we can't go back. So I, I, I definitely would, would, would appreciate that. Um, 
I also want to just mention that uh, the uh, preliminary budget proposes cutting uh, $40 million in fiscal year 22 to school allocation memoranda known, or known as SAM. Like fair student funding, SAM allocations are essential to individual school buildings and can be used for supplemental programs and hiring of staff. Um, do you believe that this cut to SAM uh, detrimentally impacts schools' ability to provide a basic and sound education? And of this $40 million, do you believe that a majority should be restored uh, to support our schools? Uh, so Can we please unmute Lindsay Oates? Or yep. Okay. Yep. Can you unmute Lindsay? Yes. Hi, okay, so we're having some technical difficulties this morning, apologies. Um, so I just wanna uh, add something to your previous question too. As a reminder, um, Chair Traeger, obviously we of course uh, value our social workers and all of our, um, our staff in schools and would love to see you know, further expansions. And the preliminary budget, as you know, um, expands social workers by 150, um, which is a good step forward. Um, in terms of the school allocation memorandum reduction that was continued in the preliminary budget, that $40 million, um, we absolutely, and I think you know um, that I'm right there with you in advocating for support for school budgets. Um, that is among the top of the list of items that we would look to restore. Um, absolutely. Uh, we do not want uh, to take school budget cuts ever, and particularly not with uh, the opportunity to do otherwise going forward. So we will, you know, it was a different time in January when the preliminary budget came out and a lot positive things have happened since then. Uh, and we'll be working with you and others to, to hopefully advocate for that restoration. Uh, that, that allocation um, impacts school budgets and also uh, some, some early childhood programs and we would seek to restore, to restore both of those. Thank, thank you, thank you, Lindsay. I'm happy to hear that that is a priority as well for, for, for the DOE. Um, Question, quick question on technology, because this comes up certainly in my conversation uh, with many principals and school communities. Um, does the DOE have any information? How many requests for new or replacement devices have you received uh, this fiscal year? Um, and have students received all of their requested technology at, at this point? So thanks for that question. And you know, we've been really doing the work to make sure that every student had a device and, and also have been partnering across the city, definitely in the Bronx with our borough presidents and uh, with our borough president and the council members to ensure that every student has a device um, and continue to work to, to ensure that that is the case across the city. This moment has allowed us to really cross the digital divide in a real way with our students. But to speak specifically, I'm going to ask Lindsay or Lauren to jump in and give you some specifics about where we are with devices. Lauren, right? Yes, Lauren. See, I'm learning who, what everyone does around here. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Chair Traeger, for the question. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, as you know, we have worked extraordinarily hard to deliver devices to our students, um, uh, including over 450,000 LTE-enabled iPads. Um, uh, all of the requests that we've received have been delivered or are in transit right now, um, and those would really be um, you know, recent requests that we are continuing to fill on an ongoing basis as they come in. So to date this fiscal year, it's been about 140,000 um, devices requested and delivered, but um, we still have devices available and will continue to fulfill uh, needs um, that schools and students have. And, and Warren, thank you for that. Uh, do you have a, a, an estimate of how many students are, are still without um, their device at this time? So all of the requests that we are receiving, we are fulfilling right away. So uh, all of, any requests that we've received are either delivered or, or en route. Um, that being said, as you well know, 
device need is extraordinarily fluid and there are students who had access to a device yesterday who may not today because they lose their internet access or the device breaks or another member of the family needs it. So we don't have an outstanding number of students that need devices right now, but we know that requests will continue to come in and we will continue filling those. And of course, um, if uh, you are aware of schools or students who are in need of devices, um, uh, you know, as you've done throughout the school year, please escalate those to us and we will make sure a device gets to that student immediately. Yes, yes I, I, I would just, I appreciate that answer. I just note that um, the request for Chromebooks keeps coming up, um, particularly in the upper grades and uh, also connections to internet connectivity, particularly students in shelter, uh, that continues to be an issue. Um, this is a question I ask every chance that what well, the chancellors I, I've only met a couple of, of them, but the question I, I'd like to uh, ask uh, the current chancellor, uh, the new chancellor, um, I think this is both a budget question, but really more so, I think, uh, an instructional uh, question and just kind of curious to hear your thoughts, Chancellor. What are your thoughts on class size and how do you view it as a tool to improve uh, academic results? So I think this moment has taught us a lot about, you know, how we can provide students with individual support leveraging technology, um, you know, and, and, you know, we've been able to in the pandemic, uh, you know, obviously support students in smaller class sizes because we had to, and we were forced to, um, you know, I think looking at ways to reduce class size collectively um, across our schools, you know, is something for us to, to look at. And I think, you know, one of the things that we've done as a system is, you know, with, through the small schools movement, through, you know, building in social emotional supports, making sure that students have an adult to connect to in a building. I think that the, the bigger question is how are we looking at ways that students have clear connection, social emotional supports um, in place in their building so that all of their learning needs are met. Because I think what, what this moment is really about and has really taught us is about the need to really educate and advocate for the whole child. And, and I, I appreciate that, uh, that answer, Chancellor. And just from your experience being uh, you know, Chancellor, a superintendent, a principal, um, do, do you believe that an effort to reduce class size aligns with an effort to improve academic outcomes and to better meet the social emotional needs of our kids if you have a smaller class size so you can kind of identify it and provide that kind of personalized, customized approach? I think, again, I mean, I, I would say again that, you know, we've learned a lot in this pandemic of, around how to, how that can happen in a variety of ways. Class size is a contractual matter, um, but I think we've learned a lot about how we can address students' individual way, needs in a variety of ways. And I think one of the things I'm really looking forward to is how do we lift that in what you and I, I think, agree is our new school system and our new uh, move forward. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. A uh, quick question, and uh, uh, you know, whoever has you know the answer to that, you know, please feel free to chime in. Um, how many high schools currently um, don't have a PSAL team, uh, and how many middle schools don't participate in the acronym uh, Champs? Does anyone uh, have that data from DOE? Yep, I'm going to ask Deputy Chancellor Robinson to jump in on that one. Thank you so much um, for that question, Chair Traeger, and for your partnership um, with um, public schools, athletic leagues. I know that uh, that's important um, for you as well as for our uh, new chancellor, Chancellor Porter, who has made this work a priority. Um, we know that we currently have um, 530 schools uh, supporting over 46,000 students. Um, who have participated in the PSAL programming. We look forward to um, getting all of those schools back active with us um, and you know all of the students who are interested in participating to participate with us. And schools right now are making uh, decisions about team reactivation. And in fact, today, uh, more information is going out about PSAL 
to get uh, permission slips and help forms in so that our students can actively participate. Um, as soon as we have the current information on PSAL, we will be happy to send that along to you. But we're really excited that we're coming back strong um, with PSAL. Our communities have yearned for this moment and they're excited about it. We're going to get started with strength and conditioning uh, first and foremost, and then we'll begin to introduce practice and uh, sports drills. And then we're going to start our competitions and uh, we like you to join us uh, for some of the sports competitions across the city and, and other council members as well. Um, but we know as our chancellor has said how important sports are um, to keep young people connected to their peers and to caring adults. Um, and also for their mental health and wellness. It's a whole child model within our school system. And we're always looking at um, increasing access to sports programs, um, but also increasing access in places where we didn't have access previously. That is a priority uh, for us as well. So as soon as we have that information, uh, we'll share that as, uh, with council. And thank you again for your partnership. And we look forward to continuing um, to join forces in this journey for access participation um, in sports programming. Thank you, Deputy Chancellor Robinson, for your leadership and partnership as well. And I, I would just note for the record very quickly that, you know, when the mayor talks about reopening PSAL, which, you know, I think is a, is a great thing. And I, and I also want to give some kudos to some of the members of the council. Uh, I know Council Member Borelli, Council Member Brennan, many of them have been very forceful at advocating for PSAL reopening. But one of the things I want to note for the record is that many communities, particularly communities of color, don't have PSAL teams because they don't have adequate resources. And, and that to me is just not acceptable. Um, so I just want to make it clear that that is a budget priority for, for this committee, for myself, for this office. And as a member of the budget negotiation team, uh, PSAL equity funding is a really major priority for us. And I'd love to work with the DOE to ensure that we expand that, those opportunities to all kids. I'm a former high school teacher. My school did have a team. Those coaches were not just coaches on the field. They were mentors to my students, asking how they're doing on their history classes, asking if they submitted their history reports. And I appreciated that partnership I had with the coaches and, uh, and that entire support system. So PSAL is, is a major, major priority. Uh, Chancellor, I wanna just uh, uh, follow up on summer. And I absolutely, agree with you, there's a lot of alignment and agreement with regards to reimagining summer. I think we need a universal summer for all children, families who, who want and, and need, need that, those reconnections. Yeah. Um, you know, can you just elaborate further on what you believe uh, is needed at this time for our children and families? And I know this, is, this will require a partnership between DOE, DYCD, it's more than just DOE. What, what, if, if you had an if you had an infinite amount of resources and we're, we're going to work to get you as much as possible, um, what should summer look like for our children and school communities? So thank you for that, Chair Traeger. And we, we talked a lot about this. And I can tell you that the partnership has already started with DOE and DYCD. Um, this summer needs to be about one, building the bridge back to in-person instruction for students, helping families feel safe and welcome into their school community, but also providing an opportunity for every student who wants to be in a summer experience to have that. You know, we, I'm sure there will be questions and a lot of folks talk about learning loss and a learning gap, but there was also a significant social disconnect that happened for all of our students. And so this summer needs to be about providing enrichment opportunities, academic support, social emotional supports, um, real wraparound services for our, our students, particularly our K to eight students. And then we need to think creatively about our high school students as well. How are we building SYEP opportunities, learn to work opportunities, right? How are we addressing the credit needs they have, the social emotional needs, the financial needs that they may have. And so we're working really closely with DYCD. We also are working with the United Way of New York City and really see this as a moment to build you know, we, you, you and I talked a little bit about the community schools model. Well, our thinking is to build a community school for every 
summer program and so that schools are partnering with their CBO partners to develop the experience that students need, um, that they know students need because you and I know um, as educators that the folks who know what the students in their community needs are, are those school folks in the school community. And so that's what this summer is going to be about. We, we wanna create, we wanna make sure social emotional needs addressed, academic needs are addressed. Um, we wanna make sure students have fun um, we want to make sure they get back into the building and we want to create the space for schools to plan for that. I, I really, I really appreciate that answer. And I think, you know, open this, opening this up for all of our children, all of our families is really important. Uh, usually summer school is a, is a time where students who are assigned to summer school, I think quite frankly, all of our kids could use some reconnections right now. And, and, I, and I use the word connection because our schools are not, if there's anything, this pandemic has proven quite a bit, but schools are more than just academic centers. They are the great equalizers for our kids. They're, regardless of what was happening in the world, that's where they feel safe, supported, loved, you know, secured. And we need to reestablish those connections for them um, as soon as possible and as meaningfully as possible. So I really would like to work further with you on that. Final question, I'll, I'll turn to my colleagues, special education, which is really, really critical, really important. Um, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, according to a, the February report on special education services, 9% of students with disabilities are not receiving any special education instruction. 37% are only receiving half of the instruction they're entitled to as outlined uh, per their IEPs. 28% uh, of students only receive partial or none of related services they're entitled to, despite the, the stats uh, and the possibility that the pandemic will exasperate the need for special education instruction, the prelim budget makes no new investments to support additional special education instruction and, re and related services. Um, why doesn't the budget add any new funding to support special education instruction and related services for our kids? So we will continue to prioritize our students with disabilities. Um, we know that, you know, putting their needs first is, you know, foremost a priority for our students. And we will continue to ensure that the schools have the materials, the staff resources and supports needed to successfully support and teach our students with disabilities. Uh, I'm gonna ask both Lindsay and Deputy Chief Academic Officer um, Fodi to speak specifically about the budget part and the special education needs and, and what, what systems and structures we've been able to put in place to support our, our students. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. Sorry. Wait, I can't find the thing. Thank you. Good. No. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you for your patience. So, uh, so as we talked about earlier, Chair Traeger, the budget condition at the prelim budget was very different than what we're talking about now. Um, so just wanna you know, ground us in sort of where we were in January when decisions were made about the preliminary budget. Uh, we are looking at um, opportunities to use stimulus funding um, for all of our students, of course, particularly those with special um, education needs. Compensatory services, which I'm sure Christina will mention is a big area that we are um, gonna be looking at. Um, but in addition, a few years ago, uh, the city was able to invest $30 million in expanding special programs for students. We were able to stand up a couple of specialized programs for, for students. We were able to add capacity to our CSEs uh, to support more timely evaluations. That funding was added in the baseline a few years ago and it was not uh, reduced. So those enhancements um, existed. We've seen success in those programs. Christina can talk to, to, um, to those details some more. And of course, we're always looking um, for opportunities to expand those services uh, to students. Um, and I'll let Christina take, take it from there. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Chancellor. Good morning, Chair and all. Um, so as, as Lindsay uh, pointed out, um, you know, all eyes are on our special education students and making sure that they get what they need. I just want to correct, Chair, if I may respectfully correct earlier, um, the numbers you quoted are accurate, uh, but it's not that students haven't received 
instruction. Students are receiving instruction. And, that, and as you know, that's something we're monitoring closely. Um, the numbers you quoted were about uh, students and program services, which we, as you know, we're in, in, in relentless pursuit to get to 100%. Of, of ensuring that those students are coming up on our reports as receiving their programs and services. It's a different number than um, uh, receipt of instruction, which is really uh, something that we look at through our attendance data and, and, and otherwise. But, um, and since we closed school, we have been closely tracking the provision of remote uh, special education services and monitoring student progress. Um, and we are uh, very excitedly planning a very robust, robust um, program of additional services to address unfinished learning um, based on student needs without requiring families to file claims or hire attorneys. You know, this is not something um, families will need to fight for. We are excitedly uh, putting these plans in place and working with Lindsay and, of course, under the direction of our chancellor. Uh, to make sure that we are meeting, meeting these needs and we look forward to future conversations on that topic and uh, sharing in more detail um, what we hope to, put, to provide for every one of our students, but particularly our special education students. Right, and, and I would just note, and I, listen, I, I want to publicly thank Ms. Fochi for being extremely responsive, accessible to my office whenever I email her and contact her, she gets back to families, I mean, so I, I say this with all, with all due respect, uh, just, if a, just because a child was marked present doesn't mean that they were getting the services they really needed. I mean, we, we heard some really painful stories about some of these virtual classes, uh, I, or it's supposed to be ICT classes with over 50 students in a virtual class. There is no way, I, I'm gonna put my teacher hat on now, but there, that is very hard to meet the needs of kids. Hard, in a, in, a, in a over 50 students in a virtual virtual class and and that is that's that's just that's not cutting it uh, Ms. Foti, if I could follow up with you on do you anticipate an increase in the number of students recommended for special education in, uh, instruction and related services uh, post pandemic Chair, and, and just, I, I'm going to answer certainly answer your question but um, and, and just uh, both are connected um, in response to what you just said, uh, absolutely, make no mistake that being present does not mean that we've met your needs. Uh, and so, um, and there is tremendous need, and uh, we are clear on that. Um, in terms of the referral, we do not want to see disproportionate referrals to special education. We never want to see disproportionate referrals or unnecessary uh, referrals to special education. And so, I mentioned earlier um, the robust set of supports we are planning for how to make sure that uh, students get what they need in, in the least, what we call the least restrictive environment possible, which means as integrated and inclusive um, and grade appropriate. Uh, and most of all, it's an environment that meets the child's needs. And so these are all things that we are thinking um, very deeply about and hope to share more information about how we, um, more specific information about how we plan to address uh, in the future, but this is front and center in, in on our minds. Yeah, and just note, we have over 200,000 students with IEPs in our school system. And at last count, we had, I believe, somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 or so school psychologists. Uh, Ms. Foti, would, do you agree with, with, with my view that we need to hire many more school psychologists, particularly also in District 75? Uh, so I, I think that uh, sure that that it, our psychologists are an invaluable resource. We have approximately much closer to a thousand, um, but nonetheless, they they play uh, an incredible role in in the lives of our students, um, academically and socially and emotionally, um, and and we are really assessing overall need and and how psychologists can best support uh, in the upcoming um, year ahead. Um, I think more to come on, on that front. Uh, certainly can't speak to whether or not we're able to increase capacity at this point, but acknowledging the importance of the role that our psychologists play. Yeah, and if you could send me over that number and a breakdown of, of, of where they're at, because I think there is a disagreement about the number or maybe some discrepancy that I'd like to, like to resolve. But with that, I'd like to now turn it to my colleagues. I know they've been very patient and, and mindful of time. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Malcolm, can you please? Yes, on. thank you, Chair. Uh, we were going to first call on the public advocate, but I just double checked and I do not see him in right now. So we will insert him into the queue if he rejoins. Um, in order, we have council members Lander, Kalos, Gredenchik, Salamanca, Riley, Borelli, Barron, Miller, and Rose, and Rosenthal. Uh, I want to remind council members that have not raised their hands to raise their hand if they want to be added to the queue. We are doing five minutes for each council member, and we will begin with council member Lander. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair. Chancellor, it's so good to be here with you. I just want to say a hearty congratulations and welcome. I'm a, uh, a public high school parent and my daughter is off today. I'm sitting in the place where she's been doing her classes for the last several months. I will say she's only got one in-person class. Mostly she's on Zoom in her school today, but uh, she's very happy to be back in her classroom with her, with her friends. And I want to say a few other thank yous first to you and your extraordinary team for the work this year. Uh, I want to say special thanks to Lindsay for yesterday's announcement of getting those 877 schools, the $130 million that they need. As you know, it's been a real passion of the principals uh, in my district and around the city the last few months. Um, I'm excited about what you're proposing for the summer, your focus on social and emotional learning. Um, and the opt-in you know, that, that was announced and that started yesterday. Um, and obviously for all of that, keeping students with IEPs and special needs front and center is so critical. Um, but I guess my question is yesterday, 245 of the supposedly open school buildings were closed because of COVID cases. Um, and in the vast majority of cases, it's my understanding that that is because of the two case rule. Of course, we wanna close the classroom where there is a student with a case and we wanna do good test and trace and make sure. But closing entire school buildings for unrelated cases where there's no evidence of spread is not consistent with public health guidelines. It's not consistent with the quarantine rules of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And way back on February 5th, the mayor and Miranda Barbeau from DOE said you were gonna review the two case rule and reconsider it. Um, those hundreds of thousands of kids in the classrooms if they're closed like every other day when there were no cases in their classrooms, they're not getting the benefit of in-person learning. They're not getting any continuity. So where does DOE stand? I mean, I believe it is time to end the two case rule and use the test and trace approach to make sure that we close classrooms where there are cases, but let our schools broadly stay open. And I thought the mayor and the DOE were headed in that direction six weeks ago. Um, where do we stand? So thank you, Council Member Lander, and thank you for all the congratulations. And we have two excited daughters today to be in school. Um, you know, we are definitely, you know, this, you know, because you've been in at this place longer than I have been in this seat, um, we are grounding all decisions in health and safety, but we are really leveraging the, the new CDC guidance to really look closely at the two case rule. And I can tell you every single day that I've been in this seat, all seven of them. We've been talking about ways to that we can address that, remediate that, and look at um, a classroom diff and differently than we, we look at a school building. So more to come. Right, um, that's very encouraging. A classroom different from a school building makes a lot of sense. When, when, you know, parents are just every single day, every minute asking me about this, when can we expect uh, some more clarity from you? Give us, give us, give me a little time. Um, a little time is a week. Not much time, not much time. Um, you know, I, I'm going to ask if Kevin can jump in on this with me. Um, but we are, you know, the new CDC guidance was really promising in this area in particular. Um, we also are going to continuing to work with our union partners because we want to make sure all of our faculty members and, and you know, our students all feel safe about the Absolutely. decision that we're making and being in the building. So, Kevin, can you jump in on this one for me? Yes, happy to. Uh, thank you for the, the question, Councilman Lander. Um, we do work uh, nightly with our health partners on all the policies uh, that impact student safety within our school buildings. So we're making sure every day we review and interpret uh, the CDC guidance and other uh, guidance. Kevin, I, I don't want to be rude, but I only have a minute left. So I, I just like, how long till we get an answer on when we can end the two case rule and move to a more uh, a safe and supportive and appropriate approach? I would say soon. It's something we're actively monitoring and we're going to get back to you as soon as we can. Okay. 
uh, all right, I'm just gonna, uh, so that's, that's heartening. I mean, we want our kids, you know, 245 school buildings is way more than 245 schools. So um, that is promising. I'm gonna keep pushing. I know parents are gonna keep pushing. We want our teachers safe. We want our kids safe and inconsistent with public health guidance. So just, I'm gonna spit out a couple of quick last questions. First, I'm excited about the summer programs. I'd love to hear about three and four year olds and our early childhood. Um, and also the integration of those summer programs. We've got SYEP, we got NYC supported CBO programs. Uh, we got early childhood needs. How do we mix those things together? And lastly, I'm just gonna ask you, I know it's on the NYPD side, but it does not make sense to hire 475 new school safety agents. Let's use that $20 million on summer programs uh, or other things. I'm expired. You're unmuted, Chancellor. Okay, thank you. Um, more to come on the three and four year olds. Thank you. Thank you for all. Thank you for 37 questions in 20 seconds. Um, more to come on the three and four year olds. Definitely working on X SYEP expansion, and, and, and DYCD is really excited about that, and we're excited to partner on that together. Um, school safety agents, more to come. Um, we're, we're, we're continuing to do that work and, and move forward. So, more to come on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the record, we want to also acknowledge that we were joined by Councilmember Levine. Uh, and next, we are going to turn to Councilmember Kalos, followed by Councilmember Grudenchik. Time starts now. Congratulations on your new role, Chancellor Porter. It is good to have a fellow New York City Public School graduate at the helm. If no one warned you about me, I'm going to ask three questions. They're going to okay. be on 3K, school seats, and laptops. And I'm asking you to get the answers within the five minutes provided, so pencils out. In 2017, Mayor de Blasio announced 3K for all for every district by 2021. It is now 2021, and only 16 out of 32 school districts are slated for 3K, with only three more to be added this year. During this pandemic, countless New Yorkers learned how important child care is, especially as we struggle to convert one bedrooms like mine into an office and school. Full disclosure, my daughter is three, but I've been fighting for UPK and 3K since before we were pregnant. Learning Bridges, funded at $93 million, faces the challenge of requiring providers to rely on a temporary program while 3K would be premiums. When I asked Mayor de Blasio, he said that if we got federal funding, he was open to deliver on his promise of 3K for all by 2021. At a cost of fully full rollout of $200 million to deliver on the mayor's promise of 3K for all, 93 million from Learning Bridges could get us halfway there, can we roll it out now instead of leaving a broken promise for the next mayor to fulfill? Uh, the second question on school seats, we don't have enough school seats. That's why I wrote Local Law 167 of 2018 to create transparency around school seat needs, and we won 824 new seats for my district. These seats are currently funded in the budget at roughly 100 million, and we have found two sites to build the school seats we need. Schools in my district are deeply segregated. I'm asking that instead of building one school to fulfill a longstanding seat need in the neighborhood that will lack diversity on day one, will you support building two schools for a total of 1,650 integrated school seats? And the last question is that the mayor and your predecessor promised every student who needs one an iPad that was purchased at nearly twice market rate as children struggle to tap out essays without a keyboard. How many children are still waiting on devices? How many never got logged in? And would you support my legislation to give every student who needs one a laptop along with internet and a culturally responsive textbook? All right, I'm gonna thank you council member Kalos. And um, I'm so glad I have so many friends, former school system members, teachers in this council. So I'm gonna jump right in and, and pass all of these things around, um, but excited about partnering around making sure devices and Wi-Fi are in the hand of every New York City public school student. Um, Lauren's going to jump in on devices. Karen's going to jump in on uh, building. Stephanie's going to jump in on learning bridges and more to come on 3K and pre-K. Well, let's start with 3K and learning bridges, please. All right, Stephanie. You've got two minutes. Can you unmute Stephanie Crane? Yep, bear with us as we go about unmuting each person. Uh, there we go. Yep. Good answer. afternoon, council member. Um, as always, appreciate your support on 3K and Learning Bridges. Um, so as the chancellor mentioned, 
Um, we continue to think about ways that we can expand 3K given the new stimulus funding and just the way we have seen childcare um, support our city as well in, in the Learning Bridges form and in 3K and pre-K. Um, so short answer is we're gonna come back to you soon, um, but we hear this clearly as a priority and would value your partnership in this work and, and all the great ways you've contributed so far. I'll so we help will you find the sites. Be in touch with you soon. Yes, I remember many calls going over all the sites. So, so more to come and thanks again for your advocacy. Um, just to jump in next on devices. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, any student requests that we've received, um, those requests are being fulfilled right now. So there's no you know, queue of students waiting. We do still have devices available. Those are LTE enabled iPads. We also have hotspots available. Um, uh, and on the keyboard front, we have about 190,000 keyboard cases that are out there for students to use as well. Um, so just wanted to share that. Great, thank you. This is Deputy, <coughs> excuse me, this is Deputy Chancellor Karen Goldmark um, uh, on the issue of new school seats and uh, desegregation. Um, we are very optimistic that all new seats uh, in New York City will serve to advance uh, diversity and integration and desegregation of New York City schools. I cannot uh, comment specifically about <coughs> your request for more seats. Um, in the specific district you were talking about. Obviously, that's a function of enrollment projections, and we have a long standing and long process for that. Um, but certainly happy to work with you on how we can. Time use expired. That's, that's his time. All right. How we can ensure that uh, we're diversifying New York City schools. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from council member Grudenchik followed by council members Salamanca, Riley and Borelli. So if we can unmute council member Grudenchik, please. Time starts I'm now. Un I'm unmuted. I'm, I am unmuted. Uh, Chancellor, good morning. It's so nice to meet you. I'm looking for your little boxes. I uh, look at the chair. There you are. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go one, Ben Kalos one better. I am a Queens public school graduate. Right. I graduate of PS201, IS237, and the former Jamaica High School, uh, which is such a beautiful building, as I'm sure you know, along with Senator Comrie and Assemblyman Webrin and so many other thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people through the years. Um, I want to echo um, and thank you, um, echo uh, Councilman Lander's uh, comments about the $130 million which will hold schools harmless. Um, as Chair Traeger knows, nobody visits more New York City public schools than I do. And um, that has been a major sticking point um, and something that I am really glad to hear um, because when children move in the middle of the school year, it's really nobody's fault. Um, it's a family decision generally. Um, I want to also echo the concerns of uh, Ben Kalos. Um, you know, and we've heard this before uh, for more than one chancellor. We've heard it for Chancellor Carranza and Chancellor Farina. Um, I am really upset that I have to buy the technology for my schools. Um, and I know uh, Chair Traeger's shaking his head. He understands this. I spend almost uh, four fifths of my, my discretionary dollars every year. I have 35 schools and the principals, I don't tell them what to buy, but you know, that's, that's something so I, I just want to put that out there that we need to be doing better by our schools and they need to be on a real plan. And I know this is only a seventh day and the world was created in only six days and, and then uh, God took a rest, but you're not getting to take a rest today. So, um, but I hope you're given strength. Um, the thing that I would like to talk to you about, and I, the other thing before I go on, I do want to say um, I support school safety officers in the school. Um, they are utterly professional. I have never had, I have never once not been challenged, uh, even though most of them know me by my first name. Um, and I just want to put that out there as I have before previously. Uh, I would like to ask you um, about after school programs. And I know there's a lot on your plate today, but um, I represent a district that's uh, more akin to, uh, say, Councilman Borelli and um, Councilwoman Rose, who you're going to hear from shortly. I'm way out in Eastern Queens and it takes parents and guardians a long time to get home from work and our schools don't close at three anymore. Most of my schools are, you know, they're locked up by three o'clock. Um, so that's something, um, and you, when we talk about uh, equality 
and how we're serving students, um, I think there'd be nothing more important, no more major direction that we could go in than making sure that every school in the city of New York has an after school program. Um, it would do so much, especially coming out of the pandemic. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. And then uh, I'm gonna skip off the uh, zoning and franchises. Okay, so I'll just say very quickly, uh, you know, first of all, thank you, council member. And I know about the commutes in Queens for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I will forgive you. I am a Queens girl, but I will forgive you for the Mets because the Yankees. Uh oh, uh, we have a problem here, Mr. Chairman. But go ahead, <laughs> go ahead, Chancellor. Um, but I, I absolutely believe in after-school programs and and know what an enriching experience they can create for our students. And I agree with you, particularly coming out of this pandemic, our schools have to really become places that wrap around students. I'm going to also ask uh, if, if you want to, some more information, or you just want to know where I sit on it. I can ask. Uh, Deputy Chancellor Robinson to talk a little bit more about our efforts in that space. Um, but def it is definitely something I believe in and think is important for our schools and will be an important part of our reopening. I, I appreciate that. And I know growing up uh, in New York City and uh, the struggles that we all have faced as children growing up in New York City that um, you understand. And it's, it's so wonderful to see somebody um, who uh, grew up here and is actually um, is actually the chancellor. The last thing I just wanna to add to what Chair Traeger and others have said about the PSAL. I know it's hard to believe looking at me, but I'm a former PSAL athlete running track um, at Jamaica High School under Coach Scheinbart. And my son is, uh, was a varsity athlete at Cardozo um, and a, JV, a varsity football player, JV baseball player. These programs are so important. Um, and I wanna thank you for taking on this challenge. And I. I hope we can get you out to Eastern Queens so we can uh, we can show you some of the great stuff that we're doing out there. I, Thank you, I Mr. Look Chairman. Forward to coming. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to cede my last 11 seconds. Thank you, Councilmember. Next, we're going to hear from Councilmember Salamanca, followed by Councilmembers Riley, Borelli, and Barron. Councilmember Salamanca. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, uh, one second, Councilmember, you remuted yourself. We'll have to unmute you. Just give us one second. We'll restart the clock. There we go. Right. Am I good? All right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chancellor. It's, uh, it's great to see you. And it's exciting uh, to see uh, that we have someone who, uh, who's, who's from the Bronx uh, at this uh, high level position. So congratulations to you. Um, uh, during the uh, when the school year began, um, you know, I, uh, I came out forcefully uh, because there were schools in my council district that were not getting its fair share of technology. Um, and I thank you because as in your prior position as the executive superintendent of the Bronx, you reached out and we visited a few schools to go over what some of the challenges are. Um, and so my question is, because I, this is an ongoing issue that I'm hearing throughout my schools. What is the average ticket time uh, for when they, to get uh, a ticket resolved for IT issues in terms of technology related to students that you know, take this technology home? Uh, thank you, Council Member Salamanca. And it has been a pleasure and will continue to be a pleasure to work together. I'm going to ask Lauren to talk about the ticket time on, um, you know, that the IT takes to respond to device issues for our students. Great. Thank you, Chancellor. And thank you, Council Member, for the question. And um, we have uh, really enjoyed partnering with you to make sure that students uh, in your district have the devices and the technology that they need. We're absolutely, absolutely committed to continuing to do that. Um, uh, we know that our, our students and families need dedicated help desk support. And so in order to make sure that we could have timely responses, we stood up uh, a separate um, uh, fully family facing help desk that was distinct from the staff facing help desk in order to make sure that we had the capacity to respond. So right now for, at that help desk, we receive about 3,500 calls per week. Um, an average wait time is a minute 47 seconds. Um, depending on the issue that comes up in terms of resolution, um, timelines can vary. For example, um, for students who need a replacement device, all of the devices are covered by Apple Care. So for uh, students who have an iPad that needs to be replaced, we would work with the school 
um, to then swap out the device, um, get it repaired and get the student a new one. Um, so depending on, I raise that as an example of depending on the type of ticket that would uh, dictate resolution. So a ticket like a ticket, a, a ticket such as that one, what's the, what's the turnaround time for a student to get a new device? So the, the turnaround time, um, we obviously try and do it as quickly as possible. It's usually um, about a week or so for the, um, uh, to get to swap out the old device and get the student a new one. But if you are seeing, if any escalations are stuck, you should absolutely um, let us know so that we can make sure that those issues get resolved. And, and, that, and that, that average, that week, that average week is consistent in all five boroughs or are there other boroughs that are getting a quicker response compared to other communities? Um, so the week timeline is driven by the timeline to get the device back. Um, so there, there's no reason why one particular borough would be worse than the other. But um, again, it sounds like there are some specific issues that are coming up and definitely want to troubleshoot those with you if anything is stuck. So the average wait time for a student in the South Bronx that needs a device replaced by through Apple Care, they will get their new device within one week. So I don't have it broken down geographically, but the, the timeline to, to do the swap is about a week. There are all kinds of reasons that that might be longer. It might be if the family isn't able to go to the school, we then work with the family to set up pickup at the home, for example. So that's why it's without knowing the specific cases, it's hard to say. But again, if there are issues coming up, we absolutely wanna troubleshoot those with you. So please just let us know and we'll work to make sure they get resolved. All right, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Chancellor, I you're muted. We'll re unmute you just one moment, Council Member. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Chancellor, I just want to, you know, uh, um, reiterate what my colleagues are saying regarding the uh, the two case COVID rule. Um, I heard you loud and clear that it's being revisited. Um, I really hope that a, a new policy can be put in place as soon as possible. Uh, it's unfair to shut down an entire school just for two cases. Um, there, there's, there's quite a few charter and private schools in my council district. There, are, there may be some cases, they don't shut down an entire school. They shut down a classroom, they may shut down a floor, but an entire school uh, for two cases, I think that's just a little overdoing it. Um, and finally, wanna also lend my, my voice to the $20 million that um, they're trying to spend on, on new school um, um, officers. Time expired. I, I believe in keeping our children safe. I truly believe that. And I'm a supporter of school safety officers. Um, but I also feel that every school should have a social worker. And there are many schools in my district that do not have a social worker. So when we're talking about $20 million reallocating this, I think that funding should go to social workers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from council member Riley followed by council members Borelli, Barron, Miller, Rose, Rosenthal and Cornegie. So we will now turn to Council Member Riley. Item starts now. Thank you, Chair Traeger. And I think I share the same sentiments with saying I am so elated to see uh, our new Chancellor, um, Misha Ross Porter, who has been so great to us here in the Bronx. I've had the opportunity of working with her for uh, my entire career um, in public service. So I am so elated to see you here, uh, Chancellor. I just have one quick question and it's kind of a follow up question that I, I mentioned at a previous hearing uh, regarding the CSIS uh, program. Uh, prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of attention on special education, particularly the DOE's capacity in the areas of managing referrals, planning and delivery of services to special education students. One significant challenge area that we often heard about was CSIS. Previously, uh, the previous testimony from DOE leadership made it clear that the intention was to replace CSIS. So I just wanted to get a stas uh, status of that effort. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Riley. Your whole career, you make me feel really old when you say that. <laughs> I mean, really. No, no, no pun intended. No pun intended. I, I just want to congratulate you also. I'm so excited to see you in the seat you're in. I'm going to pass it to uh, Lauren Siciliano. Lindsay, I'm sorry. To Lindsay? Yes, my apologies. To Lindsay. I'm looking, I'm looking at too many papers. She'll talk to you more about CSIS. Thank you. Yep, I did it. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, Council Member, for the question. Uh, we share this as a goal and as a priority um, to replace the to replace the CESA system. The procurement was a little bit delayed, as were many things, as a result of the pandemic over the last year. We have recently picked that work up. Um, we expect to be able to make an award on that procurement by the end of this school year. Uh, so that is about all we can say now, given that we're still in the uh, procurement process, and I think we'll have more to share. Uh, hopefully very soon. Thank you. And I just want to echo the sentiments of my colleague, Council Member Salamanca. Uh, we really do need more social workers within our schools, um, especially during this pandemic. We are going to have an abundance of students return to school soon, uh, being that our opt-in period will begin again starting tomorrow. Um, a, a lot of students are going through a lot um, during this pandemic, and we want to ensure that we're taking care of their mental um, along, uh, alongside of the academics. So just wanted to echo that uh, with Councilmember Salamanca. So I just wanted to uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Traeger, for your leadership. You continue to do an amazing job. And Chancellor, so glad to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Riley. Uh, and for the record, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Levin and Ulrich. And next, we will call on Councilmember Borelli for questions. Time starts now. Thank you and welcome, uh, Chancellor, to uh, your first uh, budget hearing as Chancellor. Um, hope you're having as fun as, as we all uh, tend to. Um, I, I just have a question. I know we said we're working on the two case rule. We're thinking about it. We're having conversations. We, we've we've you know, used all these terms that we throw around. But, but what specifically are we waiting? What is the determining factor on the two case rule? What are we waiting for? Is there a study? Is there a, a, a question that needs to be answered? Is there a, a device that needs to be installed in classrooms? What is it? There's no, there's no, there's no classified information in city government. So I mean, what, are you, what are you waiting for? So we, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to pull Kevin in and talk more specifically about it. Um, we definitely are leveraging the new CDC guidance that looks specifically about the, you know, about when we close and when we, we do not close. Um, and, you know, part, a big part of this pandemic for all of us has been like centering health and safety. There's so many things that we don't know. Um, we've learned a lot in the last year, which is why we're looking at the two case rule and have heard, I'm sure as you have from many parents um, about this issue. So Kevin, can you talk some more specifically about what we are waiting for? It's just the question of the hour and the day. Yeah. Thank you, Tampa. And thank you, Council Member Borelli. For us, we are uh, multitasking, as you can imagine, and working with multi-agencies around all guidance that's released. As you know, we just opened up our high schools and that was the intense focus. Working with the Situation Room on a nightly basis, looking at cases, working and partnering with the Health Department, partnering with Test and Trace. I think we're all looking at this issue. I wish I could give you a definitive date or a timeline when I could provide you an update. But, but, but there's, there's, no, there's no new study we're waiting for. I mean, we're, we're basically waiting for feelings and, 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 and how things seem to be and appearances because there's no specific study that's going to come out between now and the day where this decision is going to be made. So I, I just don't understand why, you know, why we're not using the day after spring break, for, for example, as a good day to end it. Well, I'll, I'll promise that we'll follow up with you. I do think there are a host and a range of operational considerations about what this would mean operationally and, and how we do that. And so those are the things we're contemplating nightly. I, we're not looking for a new study. Uh, we're looking at what we have present and making the best case decisions that we can. Yeah, Kevin, I'm not trying to press you, but, but, you know, operationally, I mean, if a school is set to be open and the school can close on a dime, you know, what, what operational challenges could there be if we just simply say we're not going to close the school that we, we have prepared to close? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't actually... Yeah, I appreciate your concern. Look, my, my two children are at I-24 and it's closed a bunch, uh, sixth and seventh graders respectively. So uh, I'm very interested in updates to the policy. I just can't offer you a response right here on the council call now, but do promise to get back to you uh, okay. where we are and what we stand. The, the next question um, for the chancellor for anyone is, is the CDC guidance on um, three feet. So I'm reading now from the website, um, three studies, this is from the CDC's website. Three studies published in today's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly report also addresses SARS-CoV-2 in school. Taken together, these studies build on evidence that physical distancing of three feet between students can safely be adopted in classroom settings. They specifically mention elementary schools. Now, in elementary schools, we have in-person learning, but many of them we have cohorting where we have students coming in on different days. 
So if the CDC is now saying that three feet is okay, specifically for elementary schools, they put all sorts of caveats and conditions for middle and high school, and I'll concede that point. But for elementary schools, they say, regardless of the risk, three feet is fine. If we already have the teachers in the classroom, we already have students coming, and now the CDC is saying we have more space for the students, why can't we just put more students in the classroom and give them five days a week? So we have opened up, we're opening up actually tomorrow, the opt-in period, and we're going to keep the window open for two weeks. In, in the middle of the opt-in period is also spring break, which we think everybody needs a break sure. uh, right now. And so we wanted to give a window to schools to also plan what those numbers might look like um, if we need to bring in, identify additional staff. So we wanted to not just open, but we wanted to open the window to open so we can plan to do so safely. We also have to consider in elementary schools in particular, there in that guidance, it also speaks to eating and distancing, you know, um, having six feet of distance for when students eat. So we have to plan accordingly. We can't just open up and say, just come in. We have to make sure again that we do it safely. I appreciate your answer was more specific than the two case rule answer. We, uh, we're, we I promise we're coming back with the two case yeah. rule. And then we, we, we hear it loud and clear from every council member. Time expired. Thank you very much. And good luck to you in the job. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And next we will hear from council member Barron. Time starts now. Thank you so much to the chair for this very important hearing and to the new chancellor. Uh, I wanna welcome you, Chancellor <laughs> Ross Porter and your staff, and to say that uh, you certainly will be a figure to be noted in Women's History Month for the years to come, because you were bold enough to accept this position in challenging times that have never been witnessed before. Your reputation precedes you, so I know that there will be a great legacy that you leave whenever that time comes. And in full disclosure, I do want to always remind people that Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson is a relative of mine. We have a common great, great grandparents in Frederick and Lavinia Robinson. And I also want to invite you to the ribbon, cut, ribbon cutting that will take place this September. Uh, School Construction Authority, despite the pause that was required, is going to finish the school on time. It's a middle and high school and I'll be inviting you to that uh, at the appropriate time. In terms of looking forward uh, to what our students are going to be facing, uh, the former chancellor instituted the title and focus on a culturally responsive curriculum and talked about uh, the social emotional learning that needed to a quad that needed to be implemented for students to have more than just the academics of what goes on into the classroom. I wanted to ask you your position on that in terms of training and um, preparation of teachers to make sure that they respond appropriately. And I also wanted to say that particularly in light of this latest rash of hate crimes that are being perpetrated on, on the Asian community, and that this is a part of what has been a part of our history in terms of identifying particular ethnic groups and targeting them. So I wanted to ask you about that. What's your response to that? Additionally, your admission criteria. How can we look at the admission criteria specifically for the so-called elite high schools and for the early college high schools? LaGuardia High School came and said that there were some issues that they were facing and that they had concerns about in terms of the disparate representation of Black and Latino students in their school programs. And finally, understanding that as uh, you and I and all of my former uh, teachers and principals who are now in the, in the council recognize, the principal is the ultimate person responsible for any and everything that happens in a school building. And with that understanding, uh, what is your position about policing in schools where police officers can usurp a principal's authority and insist that a student be arrested for perhaps a minor infraction that a principal or a social worker could have intervened in and had a more uh, appropriate response in having a child arrested? And how are we going to compensate 
for the learning losses. I think you addressed it in some of your earlier answers. How are we going to compensate for the learning losses that have been exacerbated by this uh, great pandemic that we're in and will widen the chasm of achievement that we see in our public schools between ethnic groups? So thank you, Council Member Barron. And I think all of those questions are deeply connected. Um, and I can see your, you and LaShawn's connected roots in all of the questions that you asked. I'm so honored to have her be a member of my team and I'm gonna pull her into this also. So I'm gonna start from the, the, the principal point because that was my favorite job. And so it's always the point I like to start with. You know, I, I'm gonna say two things, one, I have as a principal enjoyed a, an amazing relationship with my school safety agents and my local police department. We had a great partnership and really worked together to wrap ourselves around students. With that said, I think we have to eliminate policing in schools. We have to replace policing with the social emotional supports and the wraparound services that our students need and principals need to lead that effort because they know what it looks like um, and what we need. I, I will also say, uh, you know, from my, I think my first day here, um, you know, in my onboarding process, one of my first conversations was with Deputy Chancellor Robinson, specifically around how do we build true social emotional learning, academic integration that is grounded in a culturally responsive curriculum. What this recent wave of, of hate crimes against our Asian American brothers and sisters has sh have shown us in a real Time way. Time expired. Our diversity and inclusion plan has to also be about what happens in classrooms, how we train our teachers, how the adults show up for our students. And so it, they, they are all very deeply connected tissue. And the learning loss is connected also to students being able to really see themselves in the, the curriculum they experience. Students need to come back into a school that welcomes them, that is inviting to them, that addresses the trauma that they are experiencing and that we all are experiencing, um, but also you know, a curriculum that acknowledges the diverse experiences across the city, the diverse culture of the city. If, if we're learning nothing about this moment um, that our Asian American brothers and sisters are facing, it is that ensuring that the diversity of our city shows up in our classrooms is critically important uh, in, in this moment. And, you know, if you want to add something, Deputy Chancellor Robinson, I, I'd love to pull you in. Also, also response to the uh, admissions criteria. Mm -hmm. So we are we are looking closely at the admissions criteria. You know, we we took a pause on screens this year for mm -hmm. our middle schools. Um, that is going to be a continuing conversation. I, listen, I'm I'm not going to shy away from the questions about race and diversity in our system and in our school um, and segregation. Our schools are deeply segregated. Uh, what I'd like the, 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 the council to join me on is our communities are also deeply segregated. And so we have to also make sure that there's a great school in every community for every child, while we also look at the ways that, you know, our system fundamentally excludes students and we have to create a system that is deeply inclusive in the, and starting in the admissions process. The only thing that I will add, um, Chancellor, and great to see you, um, Council Member Barron. Um, it's an honor uh, to be here with you today and everyone here. The one piece that I will add is that um, Chancellor Porter is a partner um, in this work. She certainly was a partner um, as an executive superintendent in the Bronx. In fact, um, the Bronx boasts the highest numbers of staff members trained in um, trauma responsive practices, and this work has been implemented with fidelity um, in her school. So we're looking forward to continuing to partner with uh, Chancellor Porter as we deepen this work across the city, and she'll be a partner. And I um, hope to see you at the ribbon cutting ceremony, um, and, and thank you, Chancellor Porter, for your leadership in this area. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Miller, followed by Councilmembers Rose, Rosenthal, and Cornergy. Councilmember Miller. Time starts now. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Madam Chancellor. It is such a pleasure to see you again. Um, 
Happy seventh day on the job. Can you can everyone hear me there? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, how how without standardized standardized testing, and I understand now that standardized testing will happen, but they um, just uh, will be will we be using it as as just a means of to quantify. Uh, the, the learning experience of our, of our scholars over the last year, or, or will they be used in, in the uh, normal way of assessing uh, uh, our children's um, understanding of the work that they've done over the past year? But that being said, because um, we understand that, that over the past year that the students have lost nearly 100 days of, of in-person uh, learning due to the pandemic which then leads me into third part of summer school. Will summer school instruction be for those who just uh, uh, rate a, uh, a, uh, a N or uh, needs additional service or will it, we have summer school? And I, I know you talked about the robust programming around summer school, uh, social emotional learning and, 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 and the plethora of other programming that will be available, but the nuts and bolts of of the uh, in person learning that will be that was missed, will that be available for students uh, other than those who who find themselves uh, rated as students in need? How do we uh, make up for those days for those students? So my goal is to shift the narrative around summer school from a deficit approach to a really holistic, inclusive approach, particularly in this moment, right? We are all coming out of a year and a half ago, a year ago, we would never have thought we would be in this moment. And so every student has experienced a level of loss, um, social, emotional loss, disconnect from school, um, social connected connections to, to, to their students, to their counterparts. And so I really wanna look at summer as an opportunity to, to bring students back into school, to get them back in the rhythm of schooling, but also really redefining what school should look like for our, our students. I also would say um, standardized testing will only be one piece of how we look at students. And we don't have much of that in this moment, right? And so I, we also have to take a holistic approach to uh, assessing learning loss and learning needs and, and to ways in which we need to close uh, learning gaps for students. And so, we will be um, using baseline assessments to see where our students are, but also leveraging ongoing assessment practices to design personal learning plans for students to meet them where they are and bring them to the place we want them to go. Is, is there a summer school program to meet those needs that we have, that at least that what we have seen to what we know to this point that we've lost over 100 days of in-person learning. Yeah, there um, will some of the other things as well as the social. What kind of yeah, robust programming can we expect? Yeah, there will absolutely be an academic portion of summer school, right? There will act, but I, I will tell you, I as a parent would not send my child to summer school for just ELA right? right? Mm -hmm. They've been on the computer doing, my, my daughter has been on the computer doing ELA and math for eight months. She's done, right? And so I think we have to build in those, the, the academics must and absolutely will be a part of some experience, but our students have also not connected to school. They also have not had social interactions. They haven't been on a trip. They haven't been engaged in athletics. They haven't been engaged in dance. And so we wanna make sure that in addition to the academics that they will experience in summer school, that there are a number of wraparound supports as a part of it as well. So um, the last two things are, uh, what does that target audience look like? Who are we looking to attract? Um, are they coming from particular communities or are we, we addressing this equitably and holistically? Every child needs to have this, this extra engagement. And, and then finally, um, how do we codify the transfer of the school safety agents in terms of how do we make sure that we're keeping folks safe? Um, how do we assess the needs of the work that is being previously done? And, 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 and quite frankly, the necessity and how do we make sure that we are engaging these Time expired. community uh, leaders in the process themselves? So I'm gonna ask the 
folks to, to the team here to unmute Deputy Chancellor Robinson to talk about the school safety part on the summer school part. And I got to think of a new name for it. We can't even call it summer school anymore. Okay. Summer. So we'll, we'll, I'll let you know. I'm working on it. I'm good at that stuff too. Um, but the Universal summer. summer. <laughs> yes. All right. We're all, okay. Um, but the summer experience, I want to have open to all students who want to engage. And I want to give uh, to, to council member Barron's point, principals and school teams, the opportunity to design what that looks like and means and, and who they are targeting. I don't want it to be a deficit approach. I don't want it to be the mandated kids, all of our students, all of our children, right? Our, our New York city babies, they all need something to summon. We need to figure out how to get it to them. And I'll just add um, Chancellor Porter um, and what Chancellor Porter has said is creating a safe and supportive um, school for all, our, all of our children. That's the top priority um, for the DOE. And that includes everyone within the school community um, from physical safety, social safety, emotional safety. It is incumbent upon all of us to ensure that we're supporting the needs of young people. I really appreciate that she has also stated that it's the city's responsibility as a whole um, because our young people, our educators, all of us, we've been through so much. So we share in you know, the goals that we've discussed previously and a priority it's of a successful transition of school safety um, back to the DOE. Um, we certainly value and appreciate our school safety agents and we're looking at all of the systems within the school to make sure that they're safe and supportive for our young people um, and being really thoughtful about trauma and how our young people have been impacted by trauma and not creating conditions where they are re-traumatized. So we're con committed certainly um, to working with council to make this transition um, successful and we know that getting this right is a critical step towards long-term success. And we're going to need all of you, the collective here in New York City, to support in this process. And we have a great leader and Chancellor Porter to make this happen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chancellor. Thank you, Council Member Miller. And next we will hear from Council Member Rose, followed by Council Member Rosenthal. So we'll turn to Council Member Rose. Time starts now. Thank you. And, um, and welcome, Chancellor Porter. Um, uh, it's exciting. Um, I have great hopes for your leadership and I want to echo Council Member Barron's remarks about the historic significance of your appointment. Um, I'm concerned about learning bridges and, um, and the lack of, you know, funding beyond June for it. Um, uh, will there be, you know, an effort, a concerted effort to fund it beyond, you know, um, June for summer and fall? And does DOE recognize the value of continuing the Learning Bridges program and learning labs? And, um, and I would really like a, an accurate count of the enrollment of each of the um, learning lab um, programs, not the matches that were made, but the actual number of, of students that participated in, in the programs from uh, K to eight and the, and the pre-K um, side. And then my second question is um, about the learning to work program. In fiscal year 21, um, it included a $32 million cut to the program, leaving a total budget of 42 million in FY21. The program currently um, uh, serves 17,000 students across 46 transfer schools and 20 young adult borough centers. In November, the plan restored only $22 million, leaving the program with a $10 million deficit. Um, and it totally left uh, uh, it out of, fund, of totally unfunded for fiscal year 22. Can you tell me what the plans are for um, learning to work and, um, and again, uh, why uh, this program was cut? Thank you, Council Member Rose, and thanks for your congratulations. Look forward to doing great work together for the city. I'm going to ask, uh, first of all, I will tell you, we're going to be working with Executive Superintendent Tim Lasanti to really look closely at learning to work. We see it as an important tool to level leverage as a part of our summer plan, but I'm gonna ask Lindsay to talk a bit about um, 
the, the budget side and, and Stephanie, if she wants to pipe in here about um, learning bridges as well. Go. If we can unmute Lindsay yeah. Oates. Hello. Bear with us just a moment. I do this so we need to position. unmute Lindsay Oates and Stephanie Crane. OK, yep, I'm on. Mm -hmm. You're not muted. Um, OK, thank you for the question, Council Member Rose. So uh, I'll let Stephanie talk further about the Learning Bridges program. It's wonderful to have such advocacy for these important programs. Just as a reminder, the Learning at Bridges program was designed to be um, just for this year only to support hybrid learning, to support students in the days that they're not in their classroom. Um, and so we had to do emergency procurements for just this school year. Um, we can, Stephanie can talk about what we're thinking about going forward, but certainly I think the hope is that we will have more students in our building in the fall. Um, and for learning to work, uh, again, super appreciate the advocacy for this critical program. You're absolutely right that thankfully it was partially restored for only one year. And we're working with our city partners, exploring whether stimulus funding is perhaps a source of funding that could be used to offset this reduction. Um, ideally, we wanna see the restoration fully restored in the baseline to support these critical services for our students. Uh, Stephanie, can you please add more to the Learning Bridges program question? Yes, um, so thank you very much, Council Member, for your question and your continued advocacy for Learning Bridges. It was with the support of many on this call that we were able to launch this program um, for children across the system with the Department of Education and the Department of Youth and Community Development. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, this has been meant to be a program to support children on the days when they're not conducting in-person learning, um, but we are thinking about how to maximize supports from the Department of Youth and Community Development and our early child care programs across the summer um, so children have the support they need. And so we will provide more information on that and how we might further support this through the Learning Bridges model. And then I think to your second question on enrollment, um, we can provide the most updated numbers to you. As children return to the school buildings, the numbers do change, um, but we'll get the information to your office so you have the enrollment numbers and can get it specific to your community as well. Um, but aren't you going to continue um, uh, remote learning? Um, I, young people are, especially when the schools are closed because of, you know, these incidents of COVID, um, you don't see the need I to um, continue to have uh, learning bridges programs in place? So right now, as I said, the learning bridges is meant to for sustained periods of time. So for children, when they are consistently not in the school buildings, um, and in order to maintain the safety of students, we do not typically make new enrollments for that 10 day period when schools are closed. So it's more for long term planning. But I think if we see um, continued need for children to be supported in that context, we think about it. But right now, it does not support in the briefer closures, but is for the longer term support needed when children are not in person in their buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rose. And next we will hear from Councilmember Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chair. Always a great hearing. Thank you so much, Chancellor. It's, um, uh, we've not met. I look forward to working with you. Everyone, uh, everyone says such great things about you and, you know, so gratitude from the beginning. Um, I have two suggestions and one question. So, and I'm going to word this, I'm hoping to word this question a little bit differently than how others have, but I know it's the same question you're getting. Do you have a ranked priority order and dollar amount of programs or people, things, staff, that you would like to have funded with stimulus money. In other words, if the mayor came to you and said to you, Chancellor, welcome aboard. What are your top five things that uh, we need to fund? Are you prepared to turn that over to him? 
We are actually working on that. Um, you know, we, we've had the greatest uh, seven days because we got the stimulus announcement. They told me the cabinet has never been as happy as they are now. I thought it was just because I came, but I think- Mostly because you came. Thank you. But we are absolutely working with the cabinet on building that because we, uh, we want to be ready July 1 to start spending. Well, right. I mean, hypothetically, you need to get it in the budget first. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think you might have that priority list to share with the council? I think we could have a priority list early um, in, in, in about two weeks. Um, we're working with the cabinet to prioritize how we want to uh, develop what our priorities are for the stimulus money. Exactly. Uh, That's all I'm looking for. Priorities, not yeah. like. Yes. 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 Thank and you. And OMB. Yeah. And I can tell you really quickly, our priorities are around opening. So, right, like our priorities are going to be around what our summer programming looks like. Our priorities are going to be around how, what we do with the professional learning with our staff this summer. Our priorities are going to be grounded in, you know, advancing CRSE practices. And so those are some of the beginning of the things that we're looking for. But we want to first get to the executive budget, um, you know, as we work towards still. I appreciate you so much. I know just City Hall and OMB, they're, they're both plotsing right now and that is okay. Yeah. Um, and and I promise not to hold you to anything. You're well, we also know, you know, we need, to, we need to make the right decisions, right? Right, and I like, guess what I'm- Are one thing, but decisions are another. And I'm, I guess what I'm asking fundamentally is that if you could send over a draft list and allow the council to help in, in that in some way. Um, so here are my two suggestions. Mm -hmm. One is, and this came up at another hearing, uh, it has to do with the length of time it takes to get a new iPad, iPad to a student when, they've, when they turn in their broken one. Apparently, I, what I learned was there are 50,000 iPads in a warehouse somewhere that are ready to be distributed. And I, this just suggestion, I would give a hundred to each school so that when a student turns it in, they get the new one that day, that minute. And of course you would set up a very complicated but important tracking system. Um, but we really, you know, a week wait, just, just doesn't cut it. So that's my first suggestion. And my second suggestion is, I think, uh, given that we all have PTSD, um, but, but in this conversation, we're talking about our kids, that a really good use of stimulus money would be for social workers at every school, not roving teams of social workers, not a social worker in each building, but, you know, come up with a meaningful model of number of social number of kids per social worker and then implement that throughout the system. Um, so those are my two ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, thank you so much for your ideas. I'm also going to turn it over to Lindsay just to talk a little bit about the executive budget. Thank I'm you. expired. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, I think, as you well know, we need the state budget to be enacted first. Um, before we can really determine the size of the resources that we're working For with. Sure. Um, so we appreciate the council members advocacy in supporting the reversal of the executive's proposal to supplant significant stimulus dollars. So we are eager to see that the one house bills which reverse and reject the executive's proposal. Um, we're excited about that, but ultimately we need to see what the state's enacted budget is. And then as you also know, we need the executive budget um, to pass uh, to really reflect what ultimately our FY22 budget will be going into next year and what our, our stimulus dollars are. That said, we are we are absolutely working on those priorities right now. Um, 
And as I've said, it's a huge sea change from where we've been over the last couple of years, wonderfully timed with our new chancellor's arrival. And um, we'll be continuing to talk with you all, I think throughout the next several months, going into the adopted budget about our priorities for stimulus funding. Sure, and in about a week, we'll, we'll know the state budget. So, um, you know, I, I think we'll have a lot of the information that you can work with very much prior to the executive budget. So I don't think the council should have to wait until the executive budget is published to get a sense of what your priorities are and what you're expecting to fund. Again, my two cents. So I, so I would say that you've already started to see some of the priorities um, coming from the mayor's announcement and the chancellor's announcement yesterday, um, holding all of our schools harmless this current year. Um, I think you will, that was $130 million of federal stimulus money. Yep. And uh, so we're, we're already starting to talk about those types of things this year. I think you will hear more from us about our priorities. I'm just reminding you of sort of the process of the, that you well know, we need to sort of figure out what we're working with within For the sure. existing. And the other thing I would just add from a real technical wonk perspective, but that's where I, that's who I am. Um, the federal government and the state government who are our oversights for this funding have not yet actually propagated any of their rules governing the eligibility and all of sure, that. Sure. And so we do need to work within that. We need to understand how we can spend this. We wanna make sure we spend it well. All eyes are gonna be on New York City DOB on how we spend this money. We wanna make sure that we do that right. Um, we're working with two stimulus those packages that have different rules. That's a really unique place for us to be. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we do that well and certainly support all of the, the priorities, but um, follow all the rules, <laughs> of course. So we'll continue to talk about it. The mayor's announcement yesterday was the first big one about what we plan to do with stimulus funding. And you'll hear more from us um, as we move forward. Thank you so much. You got this, Lindsay. You're gonna, you're gonna nail it. Thank you, Chancellor, so much. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Uh, for those council members who have not asked questions, if you want to, raise your Zoom hand now or forever hold your peace. Or you guys can have time back in your lives, which no <laughs> ever is great to have. <laughs> uh, seeing no hands, I will turn it back to Chair Traeger. Oh, it looks like you may have dropped off. We have to unmute. No, no they, they, they muted the chair and, and now they've unmuted the chair. Um, I, I do have to say some clarifying things because it's just a couple of things I just want to, and, and I'm sure the chancellor would agree and folks in the DOE who I have enormous respect for would agree as well. Um, to look at the priority that the prioritization of the stimulus and resources under an equity lens, because I, I, I wanted to say this, and, and I, I am in full support of what we just announced as far as the mid-year uh, school budget uh, adjustments, making sure that schools are not left harmless. But I wanna just dig deeper for a moment what that means, um, because there's an equity issue, right? So if a family, and again, I support all of our families, all of our school communities, but if, but if a family chose to remove their child from the public school and they have the resources and money to enroll in a private school or in a private learning pod, which many families in wealthier zip codes did, um, many families in Coney Island in my district don't have the means to do that and their needs also have to be accounted for. And, and so I, I just want to just be mindful of the fact that there are children who have greater and communities have greater needs than others. And we need to make sure that there's an equity lens in that. I want to just note for the record that just recently a parent in Coney Island shared with me, her child has an IEP and he has regressed during this time. And she uh, feels that he needs, and quite frankly, he's entitled to more services. Um, she took him to a, a, a professionalist uh, or someone who's a professional to, to uh, do an evaluation. And, you know, there's an estimate uh, of a bill, $7,000 uh, that she would have to pay out of pocket, which she doesn't have 
uh, to get an official diagnosis or an official evaluation. And she's turning to, to us for help and support. And the current system right now, again, if we're talking about equity, she would basically have to sue the, she would have to find money somewhere to, to hire the professional. She would have to then hire a lawyer to sue the DOE, which is really outrageous that we have parents have to sue to get services which their kids are entitled to. Um, and so I really, really hope, and I also have to say this, and this is a, a criticism of the mayor and OMB, not of the chancellor of DOE, but just think, think about the language and the responses. When, when, when we're fighting for community schools, we're fighting for, for learning to work, and we're fighting for many of the critical programs that we know work for our students. Sometimes the, the answer from bureaucracy is, well, we have to see what the stimulus money is. We have to see how much we can baseline. We have to see how much. But notice that I didn't really hear that language from City Hall when it came to hiring additional uh, school safety officers in uh, over $20 million in additional agents. I, I didn't really hear that from them. Um, to, to the point that Deputy Chancellor Robinson made, and I'm gonna keep emphasizing that point, the safety needs of our, when our children are, 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 are uh, in temporary housing or living in shelter, that's also a safety issue. When our children share with us that they're hungry, that's also a safety issue. When our children have now become primary caretakers for their families at home, that's a safety issue. When our high school kids are now taking on additional responsibility, helping mom and dad pay rent because mom or dad lost their job, that's also a safety issue. So I really want, this message is really for OMB and for the city hall folks. These are the priorities that we need to be looking at in terms of meeting the, the, the needs of our children and to really have an equity lens because I would like to leave in this final year, in this moment, to ensure that every single school has a social worker, every single school has a counselor. And there are, there are schools that have larger student populations that, that require even greater and more support. Every school has a PSAL team. Every school, we, we, we move the needle on community schools. That really has to be it, that, 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 that sense of urgency and that sense of, of passion has to apply, uh, you know, I think. And, and Chancellor, I would just be, be interested in hearing, you know, your thoughts and reactions to that. Thank you. Yep. So I can say, uh, everybody's going to be like, don't commit to a thing. What we can commit to is that, that, that we're going to leverage the, the, the stimulus money in service of equity and in service of meeting the needs of the children in our system, period. That is the priority. That is what we need to do. We know that there are communities that are affected differently in this moment, and we need to address those issues. And I think, is everybody okay? I think we can agree that that is a commitment that we can make. Thank you. And, and Chancellor, your, and I asked earlier about class size. I'm curious to also hear your, in your principal, you mentioned that that was a very big, I also wanted to say that shout out to our extraordinary school leaders and educators, and yes, entire school support staff, because Chancellor, you would agree that anytime there's a change announced, mm -hmm. it's up to them to have to operationalize everything. Yeah. Um, and, and, if, and so I just want to really just say thank you. I, I cannot stop thanking them enough. Your view uh, on the importance of fair student funding, because you know we're hearing about the needs of our kids are growing, but fair student funding is really where it's at. It's where the rubber meets the road as far as a principal's ability to better meet those needs. Um, and what is your view and how, and is there consideration uh, in terms of helping support fair student funding as well uh, with these added resources? Yeah. So uh, we haven't gotten there yet in terms of what that looks like. Um, I think we need to make sure that our funding patterns are also equitable. And that's what we're going to work towards together. And I'm going to pass it on to my, uh, my partner in education over here, Lindsay, to, to talk more about fair student funding.
Uh, thank you, Chair Traeger, and thank you, Chancellor, for that question. Um, no one has been a greater advocate for fair student funding than you. I was just talking about the fair student funding hearing that you held uh, several years ago. Uh, seems like a long time ago, a different world. Um, so we appreciate your advocacy getting the fair student funding cut last year restored. Um, obviously, we were thrilled that the mayor was not did not implement the fair student funding cut that had previously been considered for the preliminary budget. As you well know, but I will say again, one of the biggest issues we need is for the state to step up and continue to support um, New York City schools so that we can afford to raise the floor. Um, I want to really emphasize that piece along with the stimulus funding. So stimulus funding is de designed to be supplemental um, and we really need the state to continue to support um, all localities throughout the state, but particularly New York City in increasing state aid. As you know, they are far below their commitment um, per the campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit. We need them to continue to reflect increases in state aid so that we can afford to make these permanent investments in the fair student funding formula. And I appreciate as always your advocacy as we work towards that goal in this enacted uh, state budget uh, to be released soon. Uh, I appreciate the answer, Lindsay, and, and I, I would just say that, you know, I, I'm tired of the city playing defense on this. Uh, we need to play offense. Um, we're in a moment where we cannot go back, and I think that, um, and to all of our colleagues up in Albany, to everyone who's watching, also count colleagues in the city council, we can't play defense anymore. Um, we cannot go, that the mindset cannot be, let's go back to what February was before this started. No, that, that's, that's, that's destructive to our kids because there were pre-existing uh, conditions plaguing our school system that got us here in, in the first place. And I also have to say um, that, you know, I know that there's a lot of concern, quite frankly, about um, the, the reopening and closing. And, and I, I just want to make sure that public health experts are driving that conversation because you know, we, we lost uh, about 80 or so DOE employees. That was as of June of last year, the number could have grown even larger. So I'm not up, up to date on, on the count, uh, but you know, folks, we, we lost school family uh, due to this pandemic. So those health and safety protocols came out, I think out of an abundance of caution to make sure that we, we do protect, we, we lost principals, we lost teachers, we lost school, school safety, school, school support staff. Um, and we still also sometimes have staff under quarantine, which is also CDC and health guidance. And for the record, New York State released their reopening guidance for schools pretty late into the summer. And usually principals, I think Penn Supporter would agree, start planning for September, not by July or August, that they start planning January, yeah. February, you know, much sooner. So in fairness to our school communities, you know, don't it's don't please don't assign blame to our principals for our schools. They are they can only deal with what they have and, and information that they have resources uh, which they have. Uh, but you know, I just because sometimes the blame gets assigned to, really to the wrong folks. There are politicians and, and bureaucrats, you know, way above us uh, that uh, quite frankly bear a lot of responsibility. Um, so I know I, I see that we've been joined also, Councilmember Gibson. Um, from from the great borough of the Bronx, so I, I think I think you know who Chance Reporter is, and uh, you've been a big fan, and, and you, you've been raving about Chance Reporter even before she became transfer. So I'd like to invite Councilmember Gibson, uh, who's been a, a big champion supporter, also of fair student funding, and also accessibility in our schools. So please uh, uh, say a few words. Thank I'm you, Chance. Now. Thank you, Chair Traeger, and good morning to all of my colleagues. Good morning, Madam Chancellor Porter and your team. Thank you so much to everyone at the Department of Ed. Uh, Chancellor, I had the honor to join you and the mayor just yesterday at Law, Government, and Justice as we reopened our high schools for in-person learning. I appreciate your compassion, your conviction, your commitment, and everything you've done. And while Southeast Queens can claim you, uh, we claim you in the Bronx for your professional career in school district nine and in hybrids that I'm proud to represent. Um, previous chancellors always know I talk so lovingly about district nine and the work we continue to do. And Chair Traeger has been phenomenal on fair student funding, on lifting up our students and families, community schools. We work to save single shepherd in district seven in the Bronx. And I thank you for that, Mark. Uh, universal breakfast and universal lunch, making sure our students come to school with a nutritious meal because many of them don't have access to all of these things. Um, and so I fundamentally believe in all of that as you do. 
I believe in restorative justice and social emotional learning and trauma informed care and holistic services and safe spaces for our children. We have all been traumatized by COVID and I worry that so many of our students, particularly students of color are behind. Our District 75 kids, students with IEPs and you all know I represent a lot of students in temporary housing. So I just have a few questions in terms of your partnerships with some of the other agencies. Number one, the partnership with DHS. As we see the eviction moratorium in place, holding a lot of pending evictions, we know these are families of color and working families that have lost their jobs. I worry about students in temporary housing and the numbers going up when the moratorium is lifted. So I wonder what the DOE can do to help those students to make sure that we don't get more students in temporary housing into our school system, number one. Number two, I'm sure Chair Debbie Rose talked extensively about summer youth and the partnership with DYCD is important. So I'm wondering, are you working with them on what the summer season looks like? And in addition to DYCD, I wanna add our NYPD and the New York City Football Club. They have a program called Saturday Night Lights. And it's a program that we started pre-pandemic where we look at some of our DOE campuses that have gymnasiums and spaces that are normally closed on the weekend. And Friday, Saturday night from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m., we open up the schools for basketball, for soccer and programs. We know that a lot of families do not feel safe having their children in the local park at night during the summer. So can we have these conversations about a Saturday Night Lights program using some of our DOE spaces on the weekend, specifically Friday and Saturday? And then the final question I have is I want to understand with some of the um, social emotional learning and, and a lot of that curriculum, the school-based health centers, the partnerships with them, are we doing anything different now with in-person learning, recognizing all that our children have endured, as well as our educators and teachers, right? I recognize the incredible value of the work. I visit my schools. I've seen the school aides, the cafeteria staff. You know, they are holding it down in the best way they can. And we have to do more to assure them that we support them, that we are there. And this budget, this blueprint, which is a reflection of our values is really going to make investments. So the final thing I'll say as my time runs out is thank you for your announcement this week and recognizing that schools should not be penalized because of a reduction in enrollment. When enrollment goes down, they lose money per student. Thank you for recognizing for a lot of our schools, particularly in neighborhoods like ours in the Bronx, you know, those schools need that money. So I thank you for restoring that. And I hope that is a commitment that will continue, uh, even if we do see reduction in enrollment. So thank you so much. And thank you, Chair Traeger, for everything that you do on behalf of our kids. I appreciate and love your passion. Thank you, Council Member Gibson, for your just continued partnership with uh, around our school, especially yesterday in the Boogie Down yes. Bronx at LGJ. Um, it felt like old times uh, <laughs> to get together. Um, I'm going to ask if uh, the, if we could unmute uh, Deputy Chancellor Robinson to talk some more about some of these pieces. Um, but I will say uh, we are working closely with DYCD on SYEP expansion and, and how they become a real part of our summer program. Um, you know, uh, we we one of my goals is to do more partnering. We're going to be Lashawn's already been talking. Time expired. Parks department around how do we partner now around PSAL and so we we think this this idea that the city needs to wrap itself around our children is a very very clear one and that includes all of the agencies that we work with. Um, so I'm going to pass it to LaShawn to talk more about our cell practices. You know we're expanding our community schools model to to add more community schools in those neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID, 150 social workers. You, you know, I know you know all of the top lines because I know you pay attention. Um, but uh, LaShawn, if you could come in and talk some more about um, the, the partnerships around sports, NYPD, um, DHS, and our, our students in temporary housing. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. And thank you, Council Member Gibson um, for your continued partnership and advocacy um, especially for our single shepherds. They are critical to our school communities, especially now during this pandemic. Um, and thank you to um, Chair Traeger for your advocacy in this area as well. 
we know that when we support our children and their social emotional needs, we're giving them the tools to succeed academically. And uh, that has been the chancellor's charge to ensure that we are fully integrating uh, social emotional learning and academics. We call that the cell academic integration. Um, cell is central to all of the work that we do um, across the DOE because we understand that it creates the conditions for optimal teaching and learning um, to occur. Over the course of this administration, we have invested in um, increasing the number of social workers and guidance counselors in our schools. We've invested in restorative practices, uh, social emotional learning um, and mental health programming, um, harmony in all of our elementary schools, uh, restorative practices in our middle schools and high schools. Um, we've increased health education, um, and we've added our school response clinicians to support with trauma. Uh, most recently, um, as many of you are aware, we implemented um, trauma training across our schools, not just to support our young people, but to support our educators as well, fully recognizing the impact of this pandemic on all of us. Uh, we have also um, partnered with health and hospitals um, for added support, we redesigned the um, school mental health specialist role in partnership with uh, DOHMH and the Office of School Mental Health. And as the chancellor has shared, we are so excited um, to be able to add to our community schools. We truly believe in the value of community schools. We'll be adding 27 new community school partnerships. And as the chancellor shared, 150 social workers, and then also investing in um, cell screeners uh, to really understand where our children are in a targeted way. How do we support them? Um, so making sure that you know our young people and educators who need more receive more, but really engaging and transformative work in the power of partnership. Uh, we're working closely with um, HRA and DHS to support our young people and temporary housing. So really thinking uh, in, in really deep ways about you know, how we partner for support. Um, you can uh, rest assured, uh, Council Member Gibson, that you will see the uh, Saturday Night Lights um, programming continue along with our flag football programming um, and Far Rockaway um, has been uh, partnerships that we've had in the past that we really want to see continue. So we fully recognize um, the impact of our young people, housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, how our young people, many of them have been disconnected um, from their peer groups, from their teachers, connected in different ways, but certainly disconnected from um, the school community. And we want to do everything that we can in partnership across this city to really uh, restore supports um, and engage in resilient um, recovery citywide and accelerating uh, learning for our young people citywide. Okay, thank you so much. I look forward to working with you. There is a lot more work to be done over the next several weeks. And I just, again, encourage all of you to work with all stakeholders. As, as much as we invest in our students, we have to invest in our educators, teachers, administrators, principals, support staff, paras, parents, leaders, faith, clergy, after school, community groups, community partners. I know them all and we have to make sure we engage with them because everyone has the same interests. We want the best for our children. Their future should be brighter than ours. And every child, God's children are all destined for success. No matter where they live, where they come from, their zip code. And I am extremely passionate about this work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I appreciate all of you. And I know that, you know, it's not easy. Uh, no matter how far we go, we seem to take steps back. But you know, I am reminded that every setback is preparation for a comeback. And this setback of COVID, we are going to prepare for a comeback like never before. So I thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Chancellor. Congratulations to you and to Chair Traeger. Thank you so much for today's hearing today. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Gibson. And I know that we've also been joined by Council Member uh, Donis Rodriguez, who I see his hand is, is raised. Is Council Member there? I'm starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And congratulations uh, to our new chancellor. And uh, as someone that knows also the school model that she started teaching at, I also have uh, one of my friends, Joanny Garcia, 
who yes. is a principal who is a principal in in one of the school also working for so many years in the public assembly model so i know that the heart is there i know that we you know have to continue doing the best we can but also i also know that you and the rest of the team know that you know we have a public school of the middle class and upper class and the public school of the working class and i think that that's where you know we have to continue and then putting all the resources talk those issues connecting parents you know with the resources that they need in order that we can try to you know equalize the level of education you know for working children who live on the certain community as they should have other children that they go to public school but that's the type of public school that they raise five million dollars mm -hmm. so one of the challenges in a game, one of my questions to you is like, what is the legacy that you want to leave in the time that you, that you will be serving as a chancellor, you know, to close that level of, of access to real quality education to those kids who live in the third community, uh, as close as those uh, kids that they go to working class, uh, to working class, uh, uh, who live in working class community, but they, they don't have the same level of education. It's not because as a teacher, I was a teacher for 15 years. I've been a co-founder to a school. So we know that the heart of the teacher, the heart of everyone is in the right place. The question is about resources. So one is what is the legacy that you want, that you are working to leave? The second thing is everything is local. You know, 38% of the students in New York City, they're Latino. And they are English language learners. They deserve the same opportunity. They deserve the, what they say, access, resources. So again, in the matter we say how we describe it, we know that we have left that community behind. They are the English language learner, like myself, are as equal as important of any children, such as my two daughters, who also been the born and raised here. So how are you? you know, working to connect that population, the 50% of the Latino students who made 38% of the New York City population in New York City, you know, a student that they will have the same resources as the rest of the students. And two pieces with that is about how you, and if you have not, look at how much does the DOE invest in, is in purchasing a book or book on the uh, investing uh, for a school to buy the textbook. And as you know, I'm not gonna be asking you the numbers or do you think that we have few percentage or, or author who are black and Latino whose book are used in the school because we know that that's the reality. So what, what are you looking like or the number that we have? And if you have a one percentage of author that write book, those books that are used in New York City public school are black and Latino and Asian, and what is your goal to, uh, to, to close it, to provide most opportunity for, for, for those Black, Latino, and Asian authors who have not been uh, getting the opportunity to get the books in, 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 in the classroom? Because the publisher working with DOE has been there for years and years, and it is very easy for them to justify why they had to continue having the low percentage of black Latino nation have book used in the DOE. And the, and the other piece is about parental uh, engagement. You know, one of the things that my wife, Christina and, and Melendez uh, uh, said, and, and I say a lot of the education based on things that we talk is that until DOE look at parents as equal partners, to fix the problem that we face on education, we will not move from where we are. So that's my last piece. What is your goal? What are you looking to do with parents to give them the respect, to look at them as equal partners in our New York City public school? So I'll, I'll just come in and say like that, you know, I, my, what has always been important to me uh, as a, a educator, but really- Time expired is that the, the school that I lead, the classroom that I teach in, and now the system that I lead has to be full of schools that I would send my own children to. 
period, point blank. Um, and so, you know, you asked me about what I want my legacy to be, and I would say that would be my legacy to ensure that we have um, classrooms, that we have quality schools in every single community. You know, I led an amazing school for 11 years as principal, but spent 18 years building that school. And, you know, we, we had AP classes. Our students went to high level colleges and universities. We never saw a deficit in any of the students in the South, South Bronx that came to the Bronx School for Law, Government and Justice. We were a six through 12 school. Our middle schoolers entered high school with regents credits. Um, you know, we, we knew that the, the, the priority in closing the gap for them outside of our school was about creating a, a bridge to college for them. And so that's, that's my legacy. My legacy is I want every school leader, every teacher to see what I saw at my school um, and what, what, what potential and possibilities existed there. As far as parents, when I talk about this city is responsible for to wrap around our students, I'm talking about all of our students. I'm talking about our English language learners. I'm talking about, um, you know, ensuring, but I'm also talking about who our partnerships are with and parents. And, you know, there are many of us on this call that are parents of New York City public school students. And so we are the most important partners. We are the first teacher. You know, um, De Deputy Chancellor Adrian Austin has done an amazing job of building out parent university. Our CEC elections are coming up. We need you all to help us get the word out. This is an opportunity to really build parent vo voice in a real way through our publicly elected process. Um, in the Bronx, I saw that as a huge equity issue. I was pushing superintendents every day to say, no, we're not gonna let the Bronx be left out of this moment. We're not gonna allow the Bronx to not have voice at the table for parents. And so those are all of the things that you said are connected to that which I want my legacy to be. I want kids, students to walk into classrooms and see themselves in the curriculum, in the textbooks they experience, in the lessons, in the heroes we celebrate, in the holidays we celebrate. I said to folks at, at a meeting, um, they were talking, we were talking about how they celebrate culture in our schools and they talked about all the food and the celebrations they have. And those are important, you know, because we had a lot of celebrations that were rich with food. I was always responsible for the macaroni and cheese and banana pudding at a celebration at LGJ. They still expect me to bring it every Thanksgiving. I only got out of it because of the pandemic for, for last year. Um, but what I will say is, there's more to celebrating culture than food and dance. It is celebrating the heroes, lifting up the legacy, lifting up the impact that our cultures, our, the varying cultures and communities have had in our city, in our state, and in our country. And so if, if I, I do nothing, it is that students see themselves in the curriculum, that we level the playing field for parents, and that the city really wraps itself around New York City public schools. Thank you. And uh, just making sure I don't think there's any other uh, uh, member whose who's hand to raise. And just to, to close, Chancellor, I want to, uh, you know, thank you for staying in the, the entire you know, duration of our hearing. I, I do want to close just, it's not really a question, it's more of a reflection and feel free just to add, because I do think this is important. Obviously, we're all here for our students. You know, it's always my pr principal who I work for, always said it's about the kids and keep it focused about the kids. And that's 100% accurate. Um, what I'll share with you, Chancellor, and I think it's important for me to share this you know, openly. Um, I've been on the phone with school leaders and teachers, school staff, probably more this past week, even though I was a teacher myself, but every day. And the number of times where school leaders would literally just break down also in tears because they wanna, they wanna do more for their kids. and. Um, anecdotally, um, I am just hearing concerns about school principals or assistant principals and teachers and others who are looking to retire, leave, resign, transfer um, out of the school system. Have you seen any data about what the retention numbers look like as far as from our school communities? Are you concerned about the trend and the direction? What are we doing to make sure that we support 
schools at because they're also human beings. You know, they're not robots. Um, they have many of them are parents themselves or caretakers for their families have lost people in their lives or lost colleagues. So people sometimes think of them as some robotic people. They're human beings and we need to make sure that they're okay and that they're supported because they are an integral part of our school community. So can you just speak about if you've seen anything in, in numbers in retention that worries you, what can we do as a system to retain and hire more of our extraordinary school leaders and, and teachers and to better support them in our school communities? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll say quickly and then I'll pull in Lauren who might have some more specifics. Um, but I, I will say, you know, we were, were, we were thinking about this even when I was the executive superintendent and the superintendent, we were thinking about potential retirements, the number of principals that we would expect to lose in this system. And as you stated so eloquently, um, it's been exacerbated by this pandemic. People have just been exhausted and have said, you know, I'm just, I, I just gotta go. But we've also had people say, I'm gonna stay because I can't leave my school at this moment. And so I think this is a moment for, we also have, I will say, brought in a number of substitute teachers to help support us through this process and have identified a new level of talent of folks who never thought they wanted to be teachers. And so how are we cultivating them as a part of our system? And so I think, and Deputy Chancellor Robinson talked about this a bit also, this moment of wrapping around is not, it, it is our, our students, our children, our babies, our priority, but it is also about how we're wrapping ourselves around our staffs, our principals, our teachers, and, and all of the staff members that, that you mentioned, including our central office staff members. You know, this pandemic has, has done a thing to, to all of us. And so this moment of wrapping ourselves around folks, you know, has to be really important. And your advocacy around the fair student funding, your advocacy around forgiving the, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the debt that schools had as a result of register loss. Let me tell you something, that goes a long way, right? Folks seeing us recognize you know, what the hard work that they put in in this moment and, and what they really need from us as a system going forward. So I think there are a lot of ways for us to really show up in this moment. Um, and I think the continued advocacy from the council um, has really helped. Uh, and we're gonna wrap ourselves around our people. I, I promise you that we definitely will so that they know that they're not out there on their own and alone. And I said this to you and I said this to all the deputy chancellors and the team here, our job is to work in service of schools. Our job at the central office is to ensure that every move that we make is in service of what happens between students and teachers in classrooms. And that's the message that I wanna get out to our school leaders. Um, I don't know if um, Lauren wants to add any specifics on the staffing piece, uh, but th that's what I would offer. Yes, happy to do so. Uh, very hard to follow that up, Chancellor. That was uh, that was really wonderful, and uh, of course, completely agree and support everything that you just shared. Um, and thank you again, Chair Trigg, for all of your advocacy here. We know that it's so critical to make sure that our schools have the staff support that they need. Um, in terms of retirements uh, and just attrition overall, the most attrition and retirements happen over the summer, and so um, as we. For, for this year, from, from this past summer leading into this school year, uh, attrition was actually down compared to prior years, both for, for principals and for teachers. Um, we will, of course, continue to monitor this over the course of this summer to make sure that we are preparing for, um, to backfill anyone who is leaving. Um, but as, as the chancellor said, there, um, there were some folks who left the system, but there were also many folks who decided to stay and we will continue to keep a close eye on this. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And I, I just, I, I feel it's just the last point worth just to kind of emphasize. Um, the folks who, are, who, who have talked about, you know, whether they, they can't, it's hard for them to continue. It's not, I don't, it's not at a, it's not weakness. Um, it's, you know, as a teacher, um, and I did this every start of every new semester, every new school year, um, you know, before you go into open up your notebooks, let, let's get let's get to work. 
you have to make sure you're establishing a, a, a trust and, and a certain level of trust and relationships in, in, in a classroom. And there's a critical moment in, in a school year, in the, in the new school year, when students look you in the eye and you look them in the eye and they have to be able to trust you and to know that you speak from the heart and you care about them. Um, and for a lot of our school staff, it's been hard to face people in the eye or whether virtually or in person and to say everything is okay when a lot has not been okay. And um, many times during the course, and this predates your tenure chancellor and quite frankly, I'm not even faulting the previous chancellor. It wasn't his fault either. But a lot of announcements, a lot of decisions were not always made in the greatest consultation with folks uh, at the school level. And quite frankly, I'm sure the DOE itself has been blindsided by some big decisions above them too. Um, but at the end of the day, folks on the ground have to operationalize everything and it's hard. And, and sometimes it's okay to admit that you're not okay. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of it's hard to look folks in the eye, your staff in the eye, students in the eye, parents in the eye, and and to give them to give them answers. They want answers, but they don't have all the answers themselves. Um, and again, when when the mayor makes a decision about schools, parents and community members they don't call the mayor because it's hard. They can call three one one. They call principals. They call the, the school secretary. Shout out to school secretaries yes. and all. The, they yeah. are the front lines who answer the phone. Yeah. Um, and so I just want to tell them that we see them, we hear them, we have their back. Um, and I just, whatever we can do to support, better support our educators, our frontline staff. And also, again, I know Chancellor, you have said this and it's worth repeating. School buildings physically have been open in many cases, school food workers, our school safety, the school crossing guard, um, school safety, they were serving our families at, at, for grabbing go sites, for meals, being a critical lifeline. We see them and we must have their back, not just in words, but in action. So in closing, Chancellor, thank you for thank staying you. here from beginning to end and, and for your entire team. Lindsay, there are some follow-up questions uh, that we, we need. We need some, I guess, some homework assignments, Lindsay, uh, in terms of the supports because social workers in every school, counselor, nurses, which, we're in a pandemic. I think Jim I'm taking a pandemic to realize every school needs a nurse as well. But I, again, thank you for your time, Chancellor. And again, congratulations in your new role. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. And now we will begin the capital portion of this hearing. Um, Lauren Siciliano will be staying on for this, so I'm not going to swear her in. But I will call the following members of the School Construction Authority and DOE for this capital portion of this hearing to testify. So from the SCA, we will have acting president and CEO Nina Kubota. Uh, from the DOE, we will have the following, Karen Goldmark, Deputy Chancellor of School Planning and Development, Anurag Sharma, Chief Information Officer, John Shea, Chief Executive Officer, Division of School Facilities, Thomas Taratko, Chief Executive Officer, Office of Space Management, Ling Tan, Senior Executive Director, Division of Capital and Reimbursable Finance, Rebecca Rawlins, Chief Executive, Office of District Planning, and Elizabeth Williams, Director of Data Analytics, Division of Early Childhood Education. I will first read the oath and then I will call on each of you individually to respond. If you could please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? President Kubuda? I do. Deputy Chancellor Goldmark? I do. Anurag Sharma? I do. John Shea? I do. Thomas Tarico? I do. Ling Tan? I do. Rebecca Rollins. I do. And Elizabeth Williams. I do. Thank you. Uh, and again, as before, due to the large number of administration officials present, for anyone that will be answering questions um, with President Kubota or Deputy Chancellor Goldmark, uh, the first time you speak, if you could just state your name uh, for the record, it'll be uh, make it more clear in the official transcript. Um, and whenever you are ready to begin, thank you. 
Thank you, and good afternoon, Chair Traeger and members of the Education Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Nina Kubota, and it's my pleasure to join you for the first time in my new capacity as Acting President and CEO of the New York City School Construction Authority. I'm thrilled with the opportunity to build upon and continue Lorraine Grillo's many accomplishments at the Authority. I am joined by Karen Goldmark, Deputy Chancellor of the Division of School Planning and Development at the New York City Department of Education. We are pleased to be here today to discuss the February 2021 proposed amendment to the current FY20 to 24 five-year capital plan. I wanna start by reiterating our gratitude to the City Council for its continued strong partnership and generous funding of our schools. We have been successful in large part due to our ongoing collaboration and pragmatic approach to providing, uh, excuse me, our students with the spaces and tools they need to succeed. We are deeply appreciative of your commitment to our schools, which enables our students to have the best learning environments we can provide from auditoriums to gyms, science labs, and specialized space for our special education students and way beyond. In fact, I'm happy to report we recently received OMB's authorization for ResoA projects for fiscal years 20 and 21, and members should start to see those projects getting underway shortly. We are truly grateful to our elected partners for your ongoing support. So far in this plan, we have received over 800 million allocated by the city council, borough presidents, and other mayoral council sources. And again, thank you for your support. The last time we appeared before you was when our current 2020 to 2024 plan was adopted. Since that time, the plan has grown from 17 billion to 19.3 billion, an increase of 2.3 billion. At 19.3 billion, this is our largest ever capital plan. Here are a few highlights of our February 2021 proposed amendment to the capital plan. 7.8 billion for over 57,000 new seats in fulfillment of the mayor's commitment to reduce overcrowding. 750 million to make 50% of elementary school buildings partially or fully accessible and a third of all buildings fully accessible. 276 million for electrical work to support air conditioning in all classrooms by the end of 2021. 589 million in support of the 3K and pre-K for all initiatives, over 1 billion for technology enhancements, and 84 million for improved ventilation. The proposed February 2021 um, amendment to the FY 20 to 24 plan has funding allocated in three overarching categories. Our capacity program, totaling 8.92 billion, the capital investments category with 6.72 billion allocated for work in our existing buildings. And finally, our mandated programs at 3.63 billion. We remain committed and are well on our way to identifying locations for all 57,000 seats funded in the plan. There are 20,676 seats already in progress and, an, uh, and another 5,000 seats currently in the pipeline. That means we are nearly halfway towards identifying these seats only a year and a half into our five-year plan. As we have done with great success in our 30-year history, we will continue to create seats in areas of current overcrowding and projected enrollment growth. We will be opening eight new buildings and additions as well as three 3K centers this year. This year, we will break ground on the largest project in our history, a much needed 3,079 seats high school on Northern Boulevard in Queens. We will also begin construction on a new school home for PS 47 in Broad Channel, replacing a building that was devastated by Superstorm Sandy in 2012, along with a new 550 seat middle school at 650 86th Street in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. In the Bronx, we will break ground on a new 458-seat elementary school at 1302 Edward L. Brand Highway, which is part of the Jerome Avenue rezoning. We thank the council for your partnership on these uh, projects and the many other projects we have pursued together. We also continue to identify new and creative ways to bring our students the facilities they need. This past November, we joined the mayor, chancellor, CUNY leadership, elected officials, 
and community partners to announce a collaboration that will yield a state-of-the-art competition-sized gymnasium, science labs, and classrooms for Medgar Evers College Preparatory High School, as well as new space for Medgar Evers College. We will demolish the transportable classroom units our, our kids have been using and replace them with a, a facility to be proud of. While creating seats is a vital part of what we do, we cannot forget that 200 of our buildings are over 100 years old, and the majority of our buildings are over 50 years old. The plan directs a total of 6.72 billion for capital investments. The capital investment portion of the plan includes two main categories, 3.11 billion for the capital improvement program, which includes building upgrades and necessary capital repairs, such as roof and facade work, structural repairs, and safeguarding our buildings against water infiltration. And 2.8 billion for school enhancement projects, which funds the realignment of existing facilities to better suit instructional needs, bathroom upgrades, science labs, the mayor's universal physical education initiative, accessibility, and other necessary improvements. Every year we make progress on removing TCUs in use across the five boroughs. This plan dedicates 230 million in both CIP and capacity dollars for the ongoing removal of these units with dedicated capacity dollars allocated in this plan to fund the construction of the needed seats to allow for the removal of the TCUs. To date, we have removed 226 of the original 354 TCUs. Of the 128 remaining TCUs, we have plans in pro progress to remove another 79 and we are developing plans to remove the final 49. Other highlights in our capital investment category include 200 million for safety and security, 119 million for specialty room upgrades, 100 million for athletic field upgrades, and 50 million for bathroom upgrades. The mandated programs category with 3.63 billion allocated includes approximately 650 million for boiler conversions in buildings currently using number four oil. The remaining funds are assigned to cover other required costs, including code and local law compliance, the SEA's wrap up insurance and completion of projects from the prior plan. As always, public feedback is an important component of our annual capital planning process. Every year, we undertake a public review process with community education councils, the city council, other elected officials, and community groups. We offer every CEC in the city the opportunity to conduct a public hearing on the plan. As you know, we also partner with individual council members and CEC to identify local needs. We also regularly attend community board meetings and are always willing to meet with parents and other stakeholders. Many factors contribute to the successes we have experienced in implementing our capital plans, but one of our strongest core values is our commitment to our MWBE contractors. Continually developing a larger and more diverse group of contractors who can bid on our work and complete large and complicated jobs helps us to deliver better projects more efficiently. We have been incredibly successful in increasing participation of our minority owned businesses by providing a framework for eligible businesses to develop and grow within the construction industry and establish long-term business relationships with the SCA. So far in this plan, the SCA has obligated 221 million to MWBE in prime construction contract awards. And we intend to award 70 million more in our contractor, in our mentor program to small contractors before the end of the current fiscal year. Under this administration, the SCA has obligated 3.1 billion to MWBE firms in prime construction contract awards, representing 24% of our prime construction contracts. In addition, the SCA has awarded 29% of subcontractor work to w, uh, MWBE firms, totaling over $2 billion. Firms that have participated in our mentor program have increased MWBE uh, participation by more than 367% three, since 2015 and account for 62% of all MWBE awards at the SCA. 
We are, of course, proud of our accomplishments in this area, but we continue to identify more ways to build, to build on these successes. While this overview of our five-year capital plan highlights our long-term impacts, it is safe to say that the past year is nothing like the SEA has ever experienced in our 30-year history. It is hard to believe that we have been managing through the impacts of COVID-19 for a full year now. As all of you will remember, in March of 2020, we began working remotely and hundreds of our projects in various stages of scope, design, and construction were paused by executive order. Since that time, we've worked closely with City Hall and OMB to successfully resume our work. We started hundreds of projects thoughtfully and gradually during 2020 and 2021, focusing first and foremost on our capacity projects. That is why I'm so proud to share, despite the many obstacles we faced, the SA was able to successfully complete and open 11 new schools, additions, and leases, as well as 10 3K centers for the 2020-2021 school year. Each location was opened on schedule last September, despite the construction pause. This is truly a testament to the dedication of our team, as well as our continued focus on equity and excellence in our schools. At a time when our children needed new schools more than ever, the SEA was able to deliver despite the unprecedented circumstances. The 11 new schools, additions, and leases added over 5,500 much needed seats. The 10 3K centers added 1,440 new seats for our youngest students. Under this administration, the SEA has created 51,540 new seats in fulfillment of the mayor's commitment to reduce overcrowding and increase diversity, including 10,973 seats as part of the mayor's pre-K and 3K for all initiatives. We were extremely deliberate about how we prioritized the resumption of work following the pause. We wanted to maximize every inch of space within a school's footprint, both indoor and outdoor, to facilitate adherence to rigorous safety and social distancing protocols. This means we have waited to start many new projects that would require us to take spaces offline during construction, such as auditorium upgrades and playground renovations. We also prioritize the resumption of work in neighborhoods that were hardest hit by COVID. And as always, we have worked closely with our school communities to minimize construction impact as much as possible on school operations and will continue to do so. And we work tireless, tirelessly with our partners to get construction crews back to work with rigorous protocols to keep our school communities, our staff, our contractor community safe. Early in the pandemic, restarting our mentor contracts became an urgent priority for us and the many MWBE contractors who depend on SCA's mentor program to provide them much needed construction work. Our business development staff assisted our mentor firms in securing paycheck protection program loans worth more than $3.2 million. But it was clear that our mentor contractors were under tremendous financial strain due to the construction pause. In July 2020, we were able to restart more than 400 mentor projects worth approximately $180 million, primarily under our Air Conditioning for All initiative. While our priority in resuming this work was to put our MWBE contractors back to work, restarting these projects also allowed us to keep our commitment to complete this initiative by the end of 2021. Upon the completion of the AC initiative, roughly 15,000 air conditioning units will have been installed in classrooms along with supporting electrical work in 700 school buildings throughout New York City. 2020 was a year like we have never faced, and the lengthy construction pause has impacted the construction schedules of all projects. We have reassessed the construction schedules for hundreds of projects and will continue to do so as we work our way back to normal operations. We recognize how important these projects are to the school community, and we look forward to completing all of these projects. But given the enormity of the challenges we faced, I am so proud of the dedication of the SEA team and all that we have been able to accomplish. Thank you again for your ongoing partnership. I will now turn it over to Deputy Chancellor Goldmark who will discuss additional aspects of the plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, SEA President Kubota. Uh, good morning, Chair Traeger and members of the Education Committee. 
<clears throat> My name is Karen Goldmark, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm the Deputy Chancellor of the Division of School Planning and Development at the New York City Department of Education. Before I begin, I would first like to thank Speaker Johnson, Chair Traeger, and the City Council for your continued leadership throughout this pandemic and for all that you have done on behalf of New York City during this time. You remain fierce advocates for equity in our school communities, and we are so grateful to have you working with the DOE on how, on how best to serve all students of New York City during this time. Your insights and support have been crucial in the midst of this crisis as we pivoted to remote learning in our 1,600 school communities <clears throat> across the city last spring and then opened school buildings this school year. Having seen firsthand the incredible resilience and commitment of our DOE staff, uh, and I should say SEA staff, because the partnership has been really uh, even better than usual this year. Uh, so thank you for that, President Kubota. Uh, so as, as I've uh, seen firsthand the incredible resilience and commitment of our DOE staff, SEA staff, students and families, as well as New Yorkers generally, I know that we will continue to respond in extraordinary ways to these extraordinary times. The proposed February 2021 plan continues to demonstrate the administration's commitment to create, creating a safe and positive learning environment for all students and staff. We're proud to say that we're closing the digital divide, making critical investments in technology, and improving ventilation and accessibility in our school buildings. The pandemic exposed existing inequities in our nation and in our city. And we know these resources and upgrades are central to moving our school communities forward and to advancing our equity and excellence for all agenda. In the area of technology, the proposed amendment allocates $1.02 billion for technology, which includes funding for emergency remote learning student devices, increasing bandwidth in school buildings, and upgrades to classroom connectivity. Since the start of the pandemic just over a year ago, ensuring that all students have access to remote learning devices has been a priority. And we've purchased over 500,000 LTE enabled iPads to support students in need. Prioritizing equity, we started distributing centrally purchased <clears throat> internet enabled devices to our most underserved students. We continue to fill device requests as we receive them from schools to ensure families have what they need to participate in remote learning. We're grateful that the council's longstanding and continuous investment in technology for our schools made it possible for the DOE to distribute devices to students since the onset of this crisis. Another anchor of the plan is the $750 million allocation towards improving school-based technology. Since 2015, the DOE has increased our overall internet bandwidth to 240 gigabytes across two major da data centers, which allows schools to access much faster connectivity. Previously, the DOE had only 14 gigs to share across our, all of our schools. So that is a massive increase. This investment will also allow us to upgrade critical equipment like routers, switches, firewalls, and wireless access points in schools. Upgrading also ensures that the equipment has the latest security protections and controls in place. When it comes to ventilation, health and safety are at the center of every single decision to reopen school buildings. And the science shows that our rigorous multi-layered approach has made our schools the safest place in New York City. As part of this comprehensive effort, over the summer, we surveyed the ventil ventilation in every building and we've conducted extensive repairs in spaces that needed attention. Following federal centers for disease control guidance for school operations on air ventilation to reduce the spread of COVID-19, every classroom was inspected by school construction authority led teams of professional engineers. Repairs and remediation efforts were based directly on those assessments, including fixing windows and fan motors and cleaning air ducts. Out of the 64,550 classrooms across our system, over 99% are safely in use. We also identified and prepared alternative spaces for those schools that needed them. And we have made the clear commitment that any space that does not meet our ventilation standards will not be used. In buildings with central HVAC systems, we've replaced existing filter elements with new ones rated at MERV 13. The DOE has also purchased indoor air quality monitors for CO2 testing, uh, as carbon dioxide is an indicator of adequate ventilation. 
and 67,000 high efficiency particulate air or HEPA purifier units. These purifiers are certified to remove virus sized particles from the air and are being used in all occupied classrooms, nurses offices and isolation rooms. We'll continue to order more equipment as needed. Relatedly, custodian engineers are key contributors in ensuring that our school, our students and school communities remain healthy and safe. DOE's Division of School Facilities reallocated building cleaning staff to ensure continuous daily touch points and whole building overnight disinfection of all occupied school buildings. All buildings were provided with electrostatic sprayers to increase the efficiency of disinfecting labor tasks. In addition, all schools have sufficient PPE and supplies to ensure safe operation for full in-person learning, which our custodial engineers manage for the entire building. If the past year has taught us anything, it's that teaching and learning can blossom even in non-traditional spaces and even under the most adverse conditions. As part of this proposed amendment, we're excited to launch the IDEAS initiative, which stands for Innovative, Diverse, Equitable, Accessible Spaces. This new IDEAS undertaking will foster the creation of dynamic and innovative learning spaces in ways that empower communities, respond to students' voices, encourage new partnerships, and advance diversity, integration, and inclusion. These efforts will further support the DOE's work to promote equity and excellence by providing access to 21st century learning opportunities to more students across New York City. The proposed February amendment continues to recognize the importance of ensuring access for all students and has emphasized accessibility as a major priority. As part of this administration's equity and excellence for all agenda, and as a direct result of support from the council, so thank you, uh, and our community partners, the amendment continues to include $750 million, a historic investment, towards the critically important work of making our school buildings more accessible. We greatly appreciate the council support in this area. And I wanna stress that we greatly appreciate the council support. It has been essential. Our team has been meeting with students, families, and community partners to ensure that we truly understand the needs of students and families and that we can make the necessary changes as quickly as possible. To drive this work forward, we established offices of, account of accessibility planning within the DOE's Division of Space Management and School Facilities, as well as at SCA. Working together, DOE and SCA have already planned and approved 41 new accessibility projects in our historically underserved districts. We're committed to making a third of the buildings in every district fully accessible by 2024, and at least 50% at least of our buildings housing elementary school grades fully or partially accessible by 2024. And I'm pleased to report that we are on track to meet that goal. In a system this big, there will always be more work to be done. We will continue to update our capital plan in response to changing conditions and needs from our school communities, and we will seek your input in that process. We are thankful again for your collaboration and generous support of capital projects now more than ever. We're really thankful for the partnership between SCA and DOE. Our students have been able to expand and improve their educational experiences because of these efforts, and we look forward to seeing our future students benefit as well. We're proud that we were the only large school district in the country to safely reopen. We wish everyone else had been able to do it, but we're proud that we did it. Um, to safely reopen school buildings in the fall for in-person instruction. And we look forward to welcoming all families back this coming school year. The pandemic has posed unprecedented challenges to all of us, but together we've stepped up and responded in extraordinary ways on behalf of our students and families. And of that, we can be very proud. Thank you again for allowing us to testify today and we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark. And I, I also want to just publicly, um, you know, thank you and uh, folks from your team. Um, this has been trying for a lot of folks, uh, but I know how diligent and how many late nights you've also personally experienced to try to uh, give our school communities the very best in terms of guidance and, and what, you know, you, you you search the world for best practices to. Uh, to implement here in the city. So we thank you for your service. And I, and to President Kubota, you know, a, a big part of leadership is preparing the next generation of leadership. And uh, so the first budget hearing without 
um, Lorraine Grillo, who is a legend in, in New York, um, and we wish her continued success in her new role. But the mark of a leader is preparing the next leader. And uh, we really appreciate you. Um, we have seen you, I've seen you in numerous meetings and, and hearings, and uh, uh, we're very fortunate to have you uh, take on this role. It's a, it's a big task. It's a big job at a very critical time. And uh, thank you for agreeing to take, to take on this responsibility. Uh, we are in good hands. Um, and uh, I'll just say for the public that's watching, uh, look, as Deputy Chancellor mentioned, the SCA has room to grow and, and, and the council is not shy to point out those areas of growth. But in New York City, it takes uh, that the, the SCA can build an entire new school in about between two or three years, three years or so on average. It takes the parks department over 10 years to build a bathroom in a park. So the SCA, quite frankly, is on another level in terms of getting things done in New York. So I wanna just thank you uh, to President Kubota and your team, your staff, that's been incredibly responsive and accessible to, you know, to my staff and folks. So I just wanna begin by, by, by acknowledging that. Um, I'd like to, and I think some, some of these uh, questions I have, some things have already kind of been touched upon, but if, if further elaboration would be, would be appreciated. Um, how, how, if you could describe uh, the, the ventilation work in our schools. This was an issue before the pandemic, certainly got high, highlighted big time during the pandemic. Um, how many systems were upgrades how many systems were repaired? How many were completely uh, re replaced? Does anyone have that breakdown? Um, so I think I will start and then uh, President Kubota, please jump in and I will also invite in Kevin Moran um, and or John Shea from operations in the Division of School Facilities. Uh, this was an example of the remarkable partnership uh, between DOE and SCA. There was uh, all, we just sat down and said, what does it take to get the work done? Um, so in terms of ventilation, uh, we knew last spring, this was something that we were going to need to work on as we work towards uh, school buildings reopening. So we sat down with SCA, or I guess we, we Zoomed with SCA and DOE, um, and we identified a process to start the survey process, to just start figuring out what the status was of each school. Even before we did the official inspections, we started working. For example, fixing windows that had been uh, bolted shut. Um, so we did a bunch of repairs. We then had um, inspections done through the SCA and we did further repairs as we found uh, issues. So, um, when you, I'm going to try to get to your specific question. I'm not trying to duck the, the data question. When we approached uh, September, we uh, were very pleased to be in a place where there was only one school of all the buildings in New York City where the ventilation system needed further work. Every other system was actually functioning as designed. Um, and we had all of the ventilation uh, in place and operating. So that one building, of course, was the MLK campus, and we were able to identify uh, alternate spaces for those schools in partnership with CUNY um, and actually Success Academy. And we are grateful to both of those ent entities for helping us uh, find that alternative space. And we then use the fall to quickly make the repairs needed at MLK. And many of us have personally walked through that building several times, um, and the ventilation there is now fully functional. So uh, in your question is how many ventilation systems did we repair? I'm not sure that we can quantify that because we did, we did work across the entire system to make sure that everything was working, but sometimes that work was very minimal, like taking bolts out of a window and other times as an MLK, it was a significant effort on the ventilation system. So I would invite, uh, um, President Kubota or uh, Kevin or John Shea, if you'd like to jump in. So, I guess we think of it as a finish line that we had to get every school to, as opposed to which schools had um, work done. But again, others jump in. 
Right. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start just by saying, and, and John and Kevin can jump in uh, with more detail, but I think uh, Division of School Facilities, DOE in general, did a lot of work that really wasn't highlighted between, you know, sort of March of 2020 through the summer. Uh, as you mentioned, we were sort of the, the, the final survey point, but there were so many checks along the way and so many things that were done. Um, and, and I can't speak to the number of repairs. I know that uh, DSF worked uh, tirelessly to get it done. In terms of the SCA's capital work, um, we, we did do a lot of return fan work over this summer. In fact, we, we started out with 30. They, they, we didn't need to do uh, as much work as we thought. So it ended up being 19 projects that we completed. Uh, we do have some longer term projects. That's not to say that the systems aren't working, uh, but they, they are old and we would like to replace them before they no longer work. Uh, and there are about 40 projects uh, in process uh, on that front. Uh, but again, I think I would invite uh, John and Kevin to talk about the extraordinary work they did both uh, last spring and into the summer and quite frankly, through now, so. Great. Uh, thank you, President Kubota and Deputy Chancellor Goldmark. Uh, a couple of things that I will add. Uh, first, I want to uh, reinforce that the, the SCA and DSF have both done uh, a great job over the years. We've always paid attention to, uh, and as you can see from prior capital plans, the, the amount of money that the SCA has invested in making sure that our HVAC systems uh, remain in good operating order. Uh, it, it's not something new, but of course, in a COVID world, we knew we had to pay attention to it a little differently. Uh, so again, to reiterate some of the things that I've already said, we were ahead of the curve with this when COVID first became an issue uh, in late February, early March, we were already out in the buildings. And I, and I wanna really thank our custodian engineers and our skilled trade folks who are our front line of defense uh, in these issues. We were looking at what we had to uh, think about repairing uh, and we, we were in pretty good shape, but there were certainly things that we needed to do. Uh, and I think the, the second round of inspections that were done by the School Construction Authority with the professionals uh, was also great for us to give us some tools and some data to, uh, to know where to target our resources so that we could get back to that 99% of all classrooms being ready uh, last September. Uh, and that's just gotten better. Uh, again, want to make sure everybody understands that our commitment has always been that if a building, if a, if a space was not meeting our ventilation standards, we were not going to use it. And with the enrollment that we've seen, we've had more than enough space. Uh, the multi-level approach that we've taken with ventilation, depending on the systems, whether they were a central HVA system where we were able to put in MERV 13 filters or whether it was an older building that just had windows and exhaust fans for ventilation, uh, we were able to supplement that with uh, the, uh, the air purifiers. Uh, we equipped all of our custodian engineers with the indoor air quality monitors so that they could look in each one of the buildings, each one of the spaces within the building if there were any concerns about ventilation uh, and train them on the use of that. And also we ha now have anemometers so that we can take uh, ventilation airflow readings where we need to. So uh, continuing to work with the custodians with the changing CDC guidance and then working with the Department of Health, making sure that we stay current on those things. As we've been sitting here in this hearing, uh, things have continued to break across the system. It's a large system, that's just what happens, but uh, we're, we're remaining out in front of it and continuing to make sure that we make the repairs as we go along. And uh, when summer comes and we have all of our buildings open for everyone that will be able to accommodate everybody on the ventilation side. I'd like to just take one moment to give a shout out to John Shea because I don't really don't know when else I'm gonna get the opportunity to do this quite so publicly. So there were many, many moments many, as you said, long nights, early mornings. And I can't remember exactly when it was because that's how the last year has been, but there was a point quite early on where John Shea, quite casually as his style, sort of mellowly, he said, I've already ordered the MERV 13 filters. <laughs> he had ordered tens of thousands of MERV 13 filters before anybody had really gotten to the point of saying, hey, John, we need to order these. And that actually, was tremendously helpful because naturally one month after that, the national supply of MERV 13 filters was incredibly tight and he had gotten that er order in early. He just went ahead and did it and it was not in a bad way, <laughs> but it was, it was fantastic. It was one of those great moments of uh, feeling like the team is covering all the bases, even if we haven't had a moment to talk about it yet. And I, so I just wanted to give him just that specific shout out because 
I don't know if we're gonna be able to like hold up a sign in the ticker tape parade that I hope is forthcoming a year or two from now. <laughs> well, thank you, Karen, that, that's very kind, but it does speak to the team that we were allowed to make that decision uh, in a group and, and move forward uh, under the leadership of the chancellor and you and everybody else. Uh, so, so thank you for saying so. And, and Ursulina Ramirez who has since left. Yes, there are some folks who have left the system who deserve a lot of credit. Um, uh, you know, a lot of behind the scenes work. Um, Ursulina is certainly uh, is, we appreciate her very much so, but I, I do want to certainly recognize that custodians, school cleaners, they've been frontline essential workers even before the pandemic, certainly, um, I, you know, I would argue that if we should always be giving them resources to properly maintain buildings shouldn't have taken a pandemic to really highlight that work. Um, but I, I do need to kind of follow up on this point because, you know, I, I think it's not a secret that I took a lot of interest in the MLK campus junior uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but is it accurate to say that the DOE uh, or whether it's Virginia School Facilities or SCA, were folks aware about the broken ventilation system prior to the pandemic at the MLK junior campus? So I'll actually start and invite whoever wants to come in. Candidly, um, the, uh, we had, uh, I don't know if they were consultants, I think they were volunteers. We had uh, HVAC experts from Tishman Spire come do a tour of the building with us as we approached reopening. And they actually said to us here, you could actually probably get this ready in time for the start of school and here's how. And we wanted to not rush for the start of school and cut any corners. Um, and so the, the ventilation system at, at MLK, the, and John, correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is that we, we did not have to actually do major repairs. We had to make adjustments so that the airflow would be what we needed it to be in the context of the pandemic. So it's not that the ventilation system was broken. Um, it's that with adjustments, we could get the airflow that we needed in the current context, which is different from prior. Um, that said, uh, we, as with all the buildings, were super cautious about making sure that everything was working as designed to work um, before we put uh, students in the building and we didn't want to do a rush job at MLK. Um, and I will invite uh, John or Nina um, I, can, I would also like to invite in Tom Taraco, who's the chief executive of the Division of Space Management, to talk about all the work we did at MLK because we took the opportunity um, to actually work with all the schools in the building to make sure that we can come up with a campus plan that works for all the schools because the building is challenging architecturally and we've been able to uh, make great strides in terms of uh, really important improvements in that building, not just the, the HVAC. Um, so I guess, sure. John, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start on the ventilation part and then uh, turn it over to President Kubota if she's got anything else to add, then Tom. Uh, if you're familiar with the building, Martin Luther King Campus is a, an interesting building from a design standpoint. It's actually a great building design for a school uh, because it's uh, from the HVAC side, it's a high volume, low velocity system, which is good because it's quiet. Uh, and, and provides a lot of airflow, but it's also harder to tell like a normal system, if you're familiar with a, a ventilation duct in a normal system, even in your office, uh, you've usually got one uh, distribution of the air coming out of a vent in the room. Whereas in Martin Luther King, all of the classrooms, the air is distributed through little ventilation ducts in all of the light fixtures. So if the ventilation's not working, it's, it's tougher to tell than in a regular building. Uh, having said that, when we did the inspections and with the help of the SCA and Tishman Spire, the building was from, from the equipment side, structurally sound. Uh, there were no major failures. Uh, we did find that the biggest issue was a couple of fire dampers that had closed. 
which again, we didn't realize, uh, but that's a typical maintenance item that happens. And we were able to use this as an opportunity to go back and open those up, balance the system again, which we did successfully. And we've shared the airflow readings uh, with the school community, with the principals, with the parents and the, and the students so that they could see that we had a professional go through and actually take ventilation readings. Uh, and we did a bunch of minor repairs and took the opportunity to use uh, the time that building had been so heavily utilized that it's difficult to do maintenance in that when it's open from seven o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, seven days a week. Uh, so uh, we, we were aware of some of the maintenance issues, uh, but there were no major structural concerns with that building and uh, we, we didn't have major work to do, uh, contrary to what you might have heard. Nina, you wanna add anything? No, I think I think that was that was everything. I will say that the the sort of long branches of the duct work uh, also contributed to sort of at the end of that branch, you know, not seeing the airflow, and then we discovered it was the dampers, like you said. So there there were a lot of things that I think you know we we could not have known going into this, but certainly with all the checks and the double checks is really what brought our attention to it. So. Um, I'm not sure if we lost uh, President Kubota, but uh, what I'll what I'll add is that um, the photographs of the school that I what folks sent me, um, I don't see windows in the classes, and I'm not used to that as a teacher. Uh, I'm used to seeing windows in my class, and that certainly made it that much more important to have a functioning ventilation system and. Um, I just wanted to make sure that it, it, you know, that we make the the investments in this critical infrastructure work um, always, and not wait for a pandemic to kind of get the work done. And also, Deputy Chancellor, whoever, whatever consultant try to push us to cut corners, I hope they're not working with us anymore. Oh, no. Because I'm glad to hear that because that is not the that is not what we need. Um, and, Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Clarify that for a second. Yeah. That was, um, a, that was a volunteer who actually is a national expert in HVAC and they didn't say cut corners. What they did was they looked at the system and said, you can get this system working. And, and we were so close to the start of school, we wanted to take the time to get the system working and put that uh, it's a challenging burden on the schools to have them be in a different location. But absolutely, they, they did not encourage us to cut corners. Um, and I appreciate you bringing that up. They were actually a great partner uh, to us in assessing the system and also um, providing much needed external information um, because parents understandably wanted some, some validation from industry experts, which they deserve. It shouldn't just be the private real estate industry that has the, the leading experts in HVAC systems. So we are grateful that they helped us with the assessment. It just, that's the one school that, that was not um, ready in time for that September start date. And um, we still consider it a pretty magnificent achievement to have all the other buildings in New York City have been ready. Um, and it's a, it's a testament to the work of the people you mentioned earlier of the uh, carpenters, the skilled trades folks, the custodians, the cleaners. There was a, a lot of work put in. So you mentioned that this was one school uh, that had this issue. Uh, what, what I would, at last year's hearing, I had had asked for, and I think uh, uh, Kevin Moran, he had testified that, you know, the, the DOE would have a winter plan. I know now that we're, we're, we're now in spring, but they mentioned a winter plan in terms of ventilation, because in many of our schools, particularly older buildings, the ventilation system is inadequate. And so what counted for adequate ventilation was opening a window. But I had feared, um, I had feared and I had visualized uh, teachers and kids in a class with coats on, with the window open, with cold blistery air coming in to be, you know, check a box that that's ventilation. But in fact, that is not how you, that is not the learning environment that students can learn and thrive in or staff deserves quite frankly. Um, so I'm just curious to hear, uh, did, did your offices receive complaints from schools about staff and kids freezing cold in classrooms 
because opening the window was the only source of ventilation. Well, we received complaints. We certainly saw commentary on some social media. What I will say is uh, here's, here's where having such old buildings is both a, a blessing and a challenge. Many of our buildings were actually designed in the wake of the 1918 influenza pandemic um, and in uh, a time when the city was trying to respond to tuberculosis being widespread across the city. And so this, the buildings were designed with giant windows and heating systems that could essentially heat way more than the heat needed if the windows were closed. And actually many of us have this in our apartments as well. Our apartments get really hot and we open the windows in the winter and we think, why are we doing this? This is kind of a waste. Um, because 100 years ago, uh, people were figuring out that ventilation is so important for public health and it obviously continues to be so. The actual ventilation of a window and a heating system that can actually heat a room, even with the window open, was an intentional design for those buildings. Obviously, newer buildings have modern HVAC systems, and it's not such a challenge. But in the older buildings, they actually are designed to be able to support that. But that does not mean that the window should be open for like all three feet, right? And one of the things that we found is that the windows can certainly provide more than adequate ventilation without being open all the, all the way. So some of it was just making sure that everyone understood what's the, you know, how open do you need to have the window? Um, and, you know, that is one of the challenges of having a, a building stock as ours, which is beautiful and amazing and has its challenges as hundred year old buildings. Um, so we certainly noticed that as a trend and we made a point of making sure that custodians and building staff understood that and uh, John, I'll just invite you if you want to add anything here. Yeah, I sure do. I really want to uh, highlight the partnership again with the SCA on this specific issue. They were very helpful with us uh, working with the calculations to determine just how much the windows would have to be open. Uh, and as the deputy chancellor said, you really only need in most buildings two windows open two to three inches in order to provide enough airflow uh, to, to meet the safety standards. So uh, again, I meet with my staff weekly. We have been messaging that out to custodians. We've provided them with the indoor air quality monitors so that they can check that. The fact that we've added air purifiers to those rooms is an additional layer of protection. Um, all of those things together uh, and, and uh, we've also had uh, heaters, uh, temporary heaters put in if we had uh, concerns and complaints where we couldn't overcome for whatever reason, the colder temperatures with opening the windows, we've supported schools that way. So uh, we've, we haven't had nearly as many complaints as, as I would have thought. Uh, we've responded to those complaints and I think in every case successfully. Uh, and, and the deputy chancellor was right about the design of those buildings. That's the way they're supposed to work. There was an article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago that, that illustrated that I think fairly well for those older buildings. So uh, we did get through the winter and, and now we're looking forward to our summer ventilation plan. <laughs> Well, I mean, and, and that's going to you know, certainly bring us to, to the push for more air conditioners and HVAC systems. But I, I, I do just, just to close on this, um, and I, again, I worked in an old building and I worked in a school that had some ventilation challenges. And even if you, and it's quite fascinating that we're having a conversation about how much of the window to open, but if you're that child sitting near that open window, you're gonna say in class, it is cold. I've had that. And then we would shut the window. And then a few minutes later, people would say it's hot again. So from an instructional standpoint, that is a problem. It's a nightmare uh, because it's hard to get kids and folks to pay attention. And, uh, and the, 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 cold, the cold air comes in and it's in. Um, the answer is to have 21st century functioning ventilation systems in all of our schools. Um, is there a rough estimate I know that this is an extraordinary expense, but just to have a rough number of what it would cost to upgrade and have 21st century upgrades, HVACs to all of our schools, understanding that many of them are old, but is there at least a number that, that does it, does anyone have? I am not aware of such a number. I invite my colleagues if they 
are aware of one to share. I am not aware either. Um, if uh, folks can get back to me on that, I, I would appreciate that. You know, we are in a moment where I think Congress is now uh, negotiating or discussing a, an infrastructure bill and infrastructure is also about schools and communities. And so I think now is the time to certainly. Uh, yes, I will say that I don't think we would need to spend the entire federal hundred billion dollar that may be proposed, but we might take a big chunk if it were every building in New York City. We will absolutely look into that. And yes, the uh, prospect of federal support for school infrastructure is eagerly awaited by those before you here from SCA and DOE. Yeah, and it's not just ventilation, although that's critical. It's making sure that our schools have adequate bandwidth and internet, 21st century equipment and supports because the physical space is really important. And can't really divorce the physical space from the academic and social spaces for kids. So that's that's something I think we need to need to prioritize. Um, very quickly, on the issue of maintenance, um, is the DOE uh, providing resources in terms of custodial maintenance supplies to uh, early childhood education providers in CBO spaces? Uh, can you speak to the level of support there? Um, have they made requests for additional support in terms of uh, in terms of their expenses? Can anyone speak to that? I'll invite John in here. I know early on we were supplying cleaning supplies and PPE to any educational entity that wanted it across New York City. Uh, but I'll admit I don't know what we currently are doing. So John, I'll turn to you. Uh, that's correct, Deputy Chancellor. Early on at the beginning, we did provide PPE cleaning supplies, in some cases air purifiers, uh, supported them with delivering other central supplies, uh, but they have uh, probably twice as many facilities as we do, uh, and we don't, as school facilities, even deliver stuff directly from a central location to our own buildings. We have our integrated supplier that manages that for us. So there's really no system in place to be able to distribute supplies to our CBOs, except on an as needed basis. Of course, we do field one-off requests. If there's something that they need, we're gonna help them out. But systemically, we're not providing any additional support at this time. And I'll invite Elizabeth Williams from the Division of Early Childhood Education to speak. She may have information about the support that we are providing. Yeah, thanks, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark. Yeah, we actually are continuing to ship PPE to our community-based providers. We send 60-day and 90-day shipments um, and have been doing that throughout the year. So those, those go directly to our CBOs, our family child care providers, our learning bridges programs, and they can request uh, more or different compositions of those things sort of at any time from us. Okay. I mean, I, I, I just think that, you know, we're still in the pandemic, we're still in this moment, and I think that we should still be a source of, to be, to, you know, to provide help and resources to all of our, all of our kids, regardless of what settings, you know, what, in physical DOE space or CBO settings, I, I, I really encourage a DOE to continue that support. I want to get to, to seat need. Um, the SEA plan funds 57,489 seats with 20,676 seats in process and cited. Uh, what is SEA's timetable to cite the remaining approximately 37,000 seats? So um, I, I think I, I mentioned in my testimony that we actually have over 5,000 seats in process, meaning we're negotiating with landlords or with uh, landowners. Um, so we, we can't cite that until that negotiation is, is complete, but there, there's another 5,000. So, um, and we have several other leads, as you know, we have our uh, our real estate firms out there looking in all districts where there is a fund in need. Um, and while some real estate markets are tighter than others, we have been quite successful. I, you know, I, I, I do think that almost 50% cited or 46% cited um, with a, about a year and eight months into the, into the capital plan is, is, is good progress. We won't stop. We'll keep looking for, for sites. Um, and of course, you know, with, with council members' uh, suggestions, uh, we always welcome them. Um, we've been successful a few times in, 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 in your suggestions, and we would encourage that 
uh, for, for council members or anybody to um, email us at uh, sites uh, at nycsca.org anytime. So we appreciate that. Yes, and I, I think President Kubota, you and I and Deputy Chancellor Goldmark have discussed a site in my district, which I cannot wait for us to move forward on in advance to better meet the needs of our kids. And uh, that's a, we'll follow up on, the, on that conversation after, after the hearing. Um, but uh, I'm mindful of time and, uh, and I'll now turn it over to my colleagues who have questions. Malcolm. Thank you, council member. I just want to remind uh, committee members that <clears throat> if you uh, have questions for DOE or the SCA on the capital portion of this hearing to use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order that you have been, that you raise them. Um, there will be five minutes for each council member for question and answers. I do just want to put out there now though, it is 116. We have two public witnesses that need translation services and the interpreter is only available until 2 p.m. So as we get closer to two, if I have to um, come in and moderate, I will. Um, we wanna make sure that those people have that opportunity to testify. So we will first turn to council member Kalos, followed by council members Barron, Gibson, and Rosenthal. Council member Kalos. I'm starts now. Good Chancellor Karen Goldmark. First, I wanna start with a thank you. I saw a letter you sent to Life Sciences High School in my district. This school is 99% students of color, with I believe zero students from my district, but I fight for them nonetheless, and perhaps even harder. And uh, you've given quite a lot of capital commitments. Uh, so I wanna thank you and just, uh, we, we can be sure all the repairs will be made before September when school opens again. Uh all Perfect. of the letters in the commitment, uh, all the commitments in the letter will be met, yes. Great, uh, I mentioned this in the prior, prior questioning, I referenced local law 167, the fact that uh, we found seat need following that transparency for 824 additional seats in my district. I noted that my district is incredibly segregated and um, I, there, we were out of time to have it back and forth. In, in your response, you indicated that any new seats would be integrated seats, which I entirely 100% support. If we have 824 seat need for this neighborhood in order to integrate, and I'd like to integrate at a 50-50 model versus a 60-40 model or 70-30, I think it should be as close to 50-50 as possible. Uh, we would need to have an additional 824 seats on top of it. Uh, I have two sites. I've got both in play. Uh, I've also offered any developer, I'll say it right now to anyone watching from home, I will print you air rights to build a school. If you need 100,000 FAR, I will print you 100,000 FAR for that school. Uh, so uh, Deputy Chancellor, how can we get, uh, and also for uh, uh, the, the SCA, how do we get these uh, schools built? Thank you so much, Council Member Kalos. So, um, the issue that you're raising is actually precisely why we've created this category. Um, that is, let me back up a moment. In the capital plan as we've traditionally structured it, there really are two main categories, new capacity and existing capital improvement projects where we're making needed building system upgrades like a new roof or a parapet in capital improvement projects. And then in new capacity, of course, it's new seats in new buildings. Um, and one of the things we've realized is that there is a lot of hunger in the community for different type, types of educational models. So one great example of this is the Brooklyn STEAM Center, which is a consortium of eight high schools that send students to the Brooklyn Navy Yard where the students pursue post-secondary credentials, they pursue CTE certification, and they also have work-based learning experiences with employers on the Navy Yard um, where they're learning state-of-the-art light manufacturing and, and tech-based work uh, skills that correspond to jobs that people actually have in the Navy Yard. And so the Brooklyn Steam Center is a model that's not a new seat and it's not a building improvement project. So this was why we created this category for innovative programs. Um, so it, uh, and that's, I'm not committing that to this effort. What I'm saying is we've recognize the need that communities have brought to us for new educational models and new ways of addressing some of the educational innovation and inclusion 
and access and diversity challenges that the system faces. Would you agree um, so, that if we don't use an innovation model or something well, else, and all we do is just build the 824 seats, that that would not go toward the integration that you and I are both looking for? Uh, I can't really agree with what you just said because I'm not, uh, the way I would characterize it, and certainly I've done a lot of uh, diversity and integration work um, in Brooklyn on the Upper West Side, is that the way that we do it on the Upper East Side. Well, the way that it has worked, uh, and also well, in District 13, well, um, the way that it has worked is to really have uh, committed community engagement and community planning. So the participatory action research efforts the efforts to really take time and have dialogue where all parties are at the table, we'd be happy to do that on the Upper East Side as well. Um, but that's what leads to the real, uh, the real way of equity um, and integration. And, and along the same lines, in order, whether we get 3K in 2021 as the mayor promised, or in 2022 or 2023 or 2024, construction is happening now. Manhattan is a largely built environment. Uh, can we work with SCA to start locating the sites, uh, retrofitting them and getting them in place so that when we are ready to roll out and keep the mayor's promise that we have the seats ready so we don't have to do what we did in my district of going from 100 seats up to 1,000. Time expired. Um, I won't speak for President Kubota. I will just say in my experience working so closely with President Kubota over this over the past several years and of course with Lorraine Grillo before her, um, I've never known the SCA to do anything other than welcome any leads and follow up on any leads. Well, I don't even know the number of buildings that you looked at over the course of the last 12 months, President Kubota, because uh, that was by itself a, a massive work stream. So anything you wanna say on any any leads, I, I know we're always open for that. Absolutely, and and, and you know, uh, Council Member Kalos, you, you've been a really good partner uh, to us and, and you have put forth many sites and we appreciate them and we know very well the two sites you're talking about and we are looking at both of them um and you know in terms of 3k or pre-k yes absolutely we should definitely connect uh it would be it would be great to uh to have some of your your insight here so we appreciate that thank you thank you council member kalos next we will hear from um council member salamanca had his hand up um, but I'm not seeing him on, so we will turn to Council Member Barron. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chancellor Goldmark, and to uh, Ms. Kabuda from the School Construction Authority. My question, my first question regards um, a new facility that's going to be opening here in September 2021. I have the highest commendations for uh, the uh, SCA being able to meet that deadline. Chancellor Carranza knew this was a very, very important project and he assured me that he himself had to get there and operate that equipment, it would happen and it is happening. And I'm very pleased to know that it's on schedule despite the pauses that had to take and that, had, that were required in the construction. I wanted to know what adjustments needed to be made, if any, during the time of this pandemic and knowing now that there might be other kinds of considerations. Were there any particular adjustments that needed to be made to that particular building that you know of based on the fact of what the requirements are that we know based on the pandemic? So um, that that East New York Family Academy is 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 near and dear to all of us. I, I've I've been around for a while, so I know how important it is to to you also, uh, Councilmember Barron. But um, yeah, and and I have to say the in terms of any sort of design or any uh, adjustments, none of them had to be made. We are using MERV thirteen or better, fourteen, fifteen, um, in 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 all of our HVAC systems. So nothing in the design needed to be done. 
I will say because of the pause, um, you will you may remember that we really wanted to get this open earlier. So what we're doing is we, we have sort of two TCOs in place. One is for them for the main building, um, and then the pool is separate. So we'll actually be able to obtain the TCO uh, late late April, early May for the main building, and it, we won't get the TCO to till uh, probably about end of July for for the uh, pool portion. But that's just to say that was the adjustment we needed to sort of segregate the two and have them phased, but both will open before uh, school opening. But th that was the adjustment we had to make in terms of schedule. Thank and you. And if I can just jump in here, because very early on in my uh, time in this role, I got to attend the groundbreaking for East New York Family yes. Academy. Yes. I cannot tell you how much I'm looking forward to attending the ribbon cutting to be yes. able to see it end to end is so exciting. And you're right, the Carranza was so deeply committed to this project. Yes. To be able to get him to come to the party and Chancellor Porter as well. Uh, it is really, it, it's a tremendous project and you've been such a driver of it. So thank you, really, thank, uh, you. thank you for that. And yes, thank President you. Kubota has done an amazing job, the entire SEA. Yes. It's really an unprecedented thing to have such a long construction pause and, and they've been very careful about Sort of what they're promising, etc. But really, to see the speed and to see how they've come back has been really inspiring. Uh, to I'm, I'm so pleased. Said. I'm really so pleased. Thank you so much. And then my other question uh, is related. As you may remember, there were, I believe, eight portables in that little schoolyard. So, what is the status of those TCU removals? Have we removed all of them throughout the city? or are there still some that need to be removed and what's your timetable for that? Uh, you, uh, President Kubota, would you like to take it or would you like me to? We we have both been told to memorize these numbers so either one of us can do it. Okay. <laughs> you want to take it? So, um, yes, thank you for that question. So uh, we, we can tout a little bit of our, our hard work out of the 354 original TCUs uh, that existed in the city. 226 have been removed. Um, and so we now have 78 um, in 79, sorry, in process. Uh, and so the remaining 49 we're developing plans for. So we're well underway. We, we intend on removing all, all of them. Um, and what's, what's great about this plan versus the last plan is if you remember, Two plans ago, we didn't have any money to remove any of the TCUs. Last, last plan, we were able to add some money. This time, we've actually been able to add uh, capacity funding. So there are instances where we've needed to uh, build an addition in order to get rid of the TCUs. Mm -hmm. And so in this, in this plan, we've dedicated $180 million, uh, towards capacity where we can't remove the TCOs without adding that capacity. So that's what's different about this plan. And uh, so we are well under uh, under time expired. OK, and that's that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I'm very pleased and look forward to both of you being at the ribbon cutting. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. And next we will hear from Councilmember Gibson. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Chair Traeger, and good afternoon to our, our new president and CEO of SCA. Thank you so much for all of your work. I've heard a lot of great things about you. A uh, huge fan of Lorraine Grillo. Um, I'm thankful for all of the work of SCA and to Deputy Chancellor Goldmark and everyone at DOE. Thank you. I have a couple of questions and I represent the Bronx uh, School District 9. So I wanted to understand your thoughts on and get an update on the school cafeteria design plan. We've been talking about transforming our school cafeterias into cafes. I believe it was a $100 million proposal from advocates and we started with a down payment of $25 million. So now that the moratoriums have been lifted, capital is moving. I just wanna understand where we are with school cafeteria design. School accessibility, the deputy chancellor, you've spoken a lot about that. And I definitely wanna understand where we are as it relates to some of our Bronx schools. Um, as an example, the Taft campus in my district has about $33 million of capital work that's ongoing. And I remind all of you at SCA and DOE, Morris High School at 1100 Boston Road has had a scaffolding up for 20 years, 20 years. And no one has ever explained to me why the scaffolding remains up. 
and it's been a sight for sore eyes. We've been doing amazing work at Morris with the five schools there, but the scaffolding refuses to come down. So I just wanna understand what we're doing specifically at the Morris High School campus. Um, brand new school buildings. I wonder where we are. When I last talked to our president Grillo, I know there was a delay in some of our new school projects. So I want to bring up the new school in district nine at 1302 Edward L. Grant Highway. This was a part of the Jerome neighborhood redesign and re, um, uh, rezoning back in 2017. And I understand that there could be a delay on that. Uh, and then the last thing I wanna bring up are capital projects. Every year we work closely with the SCA on Reso A funding. We work with our borough presidents. We join jointly on projects. A lot of it is related to school technology. Uh, I've been doing a lot around the digital divide, giving our schools money for technology, for the PA system, the cafeteria, the auditorium, the library, the science lab, the art studio. I mean, I think I funded almost everything <laughs> uh, because I realized our schools in the Bronx are needed. But now with you know, the moratorium lifted, I wonder how these projects are going to move forward. And I worry about any projects that we've already fully funded now being underfunded because of the delay due to the pandemic. So is there any way that you guys could just let us know broadly how we move forward on capital discretionary for each of our districts um, and then collectively uh, what we can do to help you push these projects along uh, this budget year and moving forward. Thank you so much. Wow, that was a lot. That was a mouthful, right? <laughs> I'm writing it down. Thank you so much, Councilmember Gibson. You are always <laughs> such a great advocate for the Bronx and for District 9. Um, President Kubota, shall I start on accessibility? Um, you mentioned new buildings. Uh -huh. Testimony, there's Rezo A, Morris, and Taft High Schools. That's what I got. Yes. And cafeteria. The cafeteria. Oh, sorry, I skipped a line mm -hmm. there. Yes. Uh, so the cafeteria uh, redesigning continues. Um, and I'm going to actually invite Tom Taracco in to talk about some of the work we've done with cafeterias and accessibility. In some cases, we are combining those projects in the same building. So we're making a building accessible and we're upgrading the cafeteria. It gives a whole uh, overall um, better feel to the whole building. The cafeteria work has been really successful in terms of um, student appeal and also uh, food consumption. It's actually the students are eating more of the food when it's presented in an attractive way, uh, mm -hmm. like, a, like a cafe. Um, so we are back at that work uh, quite a lot. And accessibility, um, we are on track to meet the goals and we've done projects across 41 buildings. I will ask Tom Taraco to just jump in he wants to talk about some specific Bronx projects. Okay. Hi, Council Member Gibson. Thank Hi, Tom. You, Good Chancellor. to see you. Good to see you. So in District 9 specifically, we have two projects approved moving forward, and that's X073 and X110. Uh, but overall in the Bronx, uh, there was we had a few historically underserved districts up there, and I'm very happy to tell this committee that there are nine current projects, whether it be in, they're approved at the subcommittee level. They've been sent over to the SCA. They have LLW numbers and they're moving forward through scope design and then it would be, um, you know, construction bid and, and award. So a lot of good things happening up in the Bronx and we're very, very excited about it. So good seeing you. Okay. In terms of Taft, um, Tom, you wanna talk about Taft, Tom? Cause you and I have been talking about that. Recently. Yeah, it's it's been a few months since I've been up there, but we, we did a lot of work up there and I would have to circle back to get more details uh, of that work. So I haven't been there in a while. We've been kind of busy <laughs> over here with, uh, with other items, but uh, we will definitely circle back because uh, I, I would like to see where we are there and what we can do moving forward, especially now working with Chris Tricarico from School Food on his piece with the cafeterias as well. We'll have some some sway in in uh, you know projects that'll get done and, and help. Okay, us. we can talk offline because we added a D seventy five school into the Taft campus as well. So I want to make sure that that work is ongoing. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to visit okay. the place with you. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah, we'll get up there soon. And just in general, one of the things that that Tom Taraco has been working on closely with DSF and other offices is this notion of a campus wide plan. So 
not just doing a project in a building, but taking the opportunity to actually look at the entire campus and help the entire campus make sense. Uh, and that worked really well at the MLK campus. And we've been talking about that for, for Taft. Um, Nina, did you want to say something? Yeah, I turned off my video in, in hopes that my connection is a little bit better. Um, I will say for Taft, uh, we did have a we, we did have to bring in a new contractor, which has delayed the project, the exterior project. Uh, so I, I don't, um, and that is due to complete uh, by the end of this calendar year. Um, so we do have that. We recognize that it's been up for a long time. Um, uh, sorry, for, and that was for Morris, uh, my mistake. Um, and then uh, the, the other thing about the cafeteria uh, upgrades, yes, the 25 million has been allocated. We have been working with our school foods folks and we've recently identified, um, or they have identified 39 projects that they wanna proceed with. Um, 10 of which are in the Bronx and we can, we're, we're happy to send those, uh, send that information over to you. Um, and then finally, yes, we have had some of our delays with our FY20 and FY21 ResoA project. Some of which also was a result of, remember, not wanting to take any interior spaces or playgrounds for that matter out of, out of service uh, while we were identifying as much space within a school as possible. But we are now working through those. Um, and, and so those should be, uh, you know, underway very shortly. So again, happy to discuss uh, offline some of the specific projects uh, in, in your district. Um, and I do finally think that um, 1302 Edward L. Grant. Edward L. Grant, right. So that, that um, two things about that, because of the extensive delays, uh, the pause caused, um, we did, we do believe that that will uh, open in September 2024, which I believe is a, a year later than originally it thought. Is. Um, and also just, just to point out that that is currently used being used as a testing center. Um, right. so that, that's not the cause of the delay, but, but that is, uh, we are working with health and hospitals to make sure that that becomes available to us, um, this summer so we can begin construction. Okay. And I'll talk to you guys offline about the Morris campus, but I do understand with the pause act. But I am not happy that that site is delayed by a full year. That's not acceptable. Yes, it's being used as a COVID testing site, which I'm grateful for. We're using the land. But a year later to have to tell my local parents and, and CEC, um, to me, is not acceptable. So I want to find a way where we can expedite that. Whatever hitches are in the system, we need to identify them because a full year to me is a problem. I fought tooth and nail for that school to make sure that that project would be a reality. And I don't want to tell my parents that they have to wait until 2024 when it was supposed to be 2023. So I'd love to talk offline about it as well as the Morris campus and the capital work that's there. That scaffolding 20 years in my lifetime, if I can get that scaffolding down, I think I'll be successful. Uh, I want to do that before I leave this earth to get that scaffolding down from Morris campus. <laughs> And you guys are going to help me. <laughs> we, we will. On the construction delay, I understand it's Absolutely. so challenging. I'll just note that we had an eight-month construction delay. So the challenge, okay. of course, with eight months is that school years run in school years. So if we, even if we don't lose any time beyond the eight months, it puts us out of fall 2023. And do we really want to move a building in March 2024? And so it's very challenging. I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll certainly discuss it further. I just okay. need us all to remember that there was an eight month construction delay in that it was really very long. And so that's, it's, it's not any fault of the SCA. It's not any oh. slowdown in the process. It's simply the, the freeze we were all under and, and how school year calendars work. And then it sort of doesn't make sense to move into a building in May. Okay, but well, let's keep talking about it because you've pushed us into, and gotten us to do lots, lots of things before. So I recognize yes. you're not going to let it go. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair thank Traeger. You. I appreciate the additional time. Thanks so much. Thank
Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Uh, I'm just going to ask for the indulgence of Deputy Chancellor Goldmark and President Kubota, just so we can hear from the two witnesses, because we are time limited on the translation services. So we are, um, uh, and all public testimony is limited to two minutes. So we're first going to hear from Milagros Council, oh. and then Jimena Vargas will provide the translation. Then we will hear from Bibiana Hoyos, and then Jimena will uh, then again translate. Uh, for Bibiana. So we'll first start with Milagros. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jimena Vargas. Señora Milagros, usted puede comenzar a hablar en este momento. Yo lo voy a hacer su traducción. Ms. Milagros, you may start speaking now. I will translate for you. Señora Milagros Cancel, ¿está usted ahí? Are you there? Señora Milagros? Le habla la intérprete. This is Jimena, the interpreter. We can come back. So let's we'll let's unmute Bibiana um, and then we'll come back to Milagros. Shall do. Time starts now. Señora Viviana Hoyos, le habla la intérprete. Está usted ahí? Tiene usted dos minutos para hablar y yo lo voy a interpretar. Ms. Hoyos, this is Jimena, the interpreter. Are you there? You have two minutes to speak. Hola, y gracias por permitirme un espacio en esta audiencia de educación. Mi nombre es Viviana y soy madre de tres niños que asisten a una escuela pública en Brooklyn. Un segundo, señora Viviana. Un segundo, por favor. Hello, everyone. My name is Viviana Ojes. I am very grateful that you have given me this space to speak in this audience. I am the mother of three children. Continue, por favor. Eh, hablo hoy para pedirle a nuestro consejero de la ciudad que invierta en la educación culturalmente responsable. A nuestro consejero de la ciudad que invierta en la educación. I, I am asking today that uh, our new director has spent, uh, uh, spends uh, money in the improvement of our educational system, uh, culturally and responsibly. Continue, por favor. La, edu la educación culturalmente responsable, CRE, es un método de educación rigurosa centrada en el estudiante que cultiva el pensamiento. Uh, the uh, Responsible Cultural Education, CRR, is the very rigorous system in which the student is the center. Uh, it's in the center of the studies and it improves their education. Gracias. Crítico en el lugar de solo prepararlo para tener las habilidades para hacer los exámenes estatales. It is very critical that they um, they are prepared to help them to be helped in their uh, skills to do their uh, state exams. Continue, por favor. Relaciona el estudio académico con los problemas contemporáneos y las experiencias de los estudiantes. It ties together the uh, academics as well as the uh, students' personal experience in the contemporary context. Aumenta las entidades académicas, raciales y cultu culturales positivas. And it improves uh, the academic, racial, and cultural abilities. Continúe, por favor. Desarrolla la capacidad de los estudiantes para conectarse a través de las culturas. And it helps students develop uh, their ability to co uh, communicate better and to interact better culturally. Gracias. Empodera a los estudiantes como agentes de cambio social. It empowers the students as uh, people who might make social changes. E inspira a los estudiantes a enamorarse del aprendizaje. And it inspires students to fall in love with learning. Las investigaciones demuestran que tanto en el caso de los estudiantes. Studies have shown that uh, in the case of students as well as. De los estudiantes de color como en el de los estudiantes blancos. Uh, that it, it, it helps uh, students of color as well as the students as white students. 
El CRE disminuye las tasas de abandono y las suspensiones. CRR uh, diminishes the um, um, uh, suspensions and the absences. Y aumenta la participación, la confianza, el rendimiento académico. And it allows the, uh, for more participation, better uh, academic development. Y las tasas de graduación de los estudiantes. And the number of, uh, and it increases the number of graduates uh, for the graduations for the students. Es fundamental que el Departamento de Educación de la Ciudad de Nueva York se convierta en un modelo nacional. It is important that the education uh, uh, skills of, the, of New York um, turn into an academic um, national model for everybody. De equidad al adoptar la educación culturalmente responsable para erradicar las brechas raciales. It is important uh, to be able to embrace all the cultural differences and embrace CRR so that we can erase uh, the inequalities, the racial inequalities and social inequalities. En la educación pública. In public education. En 2021 es completamente injusto que a nuestros niños se les enseñe un plan de estudios. It is incredibly unjust that in 2021 our students have a model of studies que no refleja la realidad del mundo en el que viven. That is not reflecting the world in which they live in. Y tampoco el de la gente que los rodea. And neither the people who surround them or who are around them. La ciudad de Nueva York es uno de los lugares más diversos del mundo. New York City is one of the most diverse uh, places in the world. Y nuestras escuelas son un reflejo de ello con más de 180 idiomas hablados. And our schools are a reflection of that with over 180 languages that are spoken. Por nuestros estudiantes. Uh, by our students. Sin embargo, esta diversidad no refleja en nuestras tasas de graduación. And, if, and uh, sadly, this uh, diversity is not reflected in the numbers in, of, gradu of graduations. In 2016, only 67% de los estudiantes afroamericanos y latinos. In 2016, only 60% of Af Af Afro-American and Latino students. Y el 31% de los estudiantes que tenían inglés como segundo idioma. And 31% of students who had English as a second language. Lograron graduarse de la escuela secundaria en cuatro años. Managed to graduate from a secondary school in four years. En comparación con el 82% de los estudiantes blancos. In comparison to 82% of uh, white students. Uh, Jimena, this is Malcolm. Uh, time was called. If you could just uh, ask Vivian if she could wrap up her final thoughts, and then we'll go to Milagros. Absolutely. Señora Hoyos, le ruego que me disculpe, pero me han avisado que usted al uh, tiempo se le ha terminado. Si usted quiere simplemente resumir en un minuto, luego tenemos que pasar a la señora Milagros. Okay. Um, estamos pidiendo que las escuelas de Nueva York inviertan en la educación y tengan todos los niños de color, blancos, latinos, que todos tengan una, el derecho a una misma educación y respeto. We're asking the Board of Ed to improve the education for our children and that all the children, Afro-American, Latino, white, have the same opportunities uh, to get education um, in the public schools. Eso es todo, señora. Thank you. Thank you. See, okay. she's done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we will go ahead and go to Milagros if we can go ahead and unmute her. Señora Milagros, um, puede usted um, quitar el botón de mute? Señora Milagros. If you could tell her that. We, oh, okay. there she goes. She's unmuted. Okay. okay. Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon to everyone. Mi, mi nombre es Milagros Cancel. 
soy madre de un niño con autismo y la presidenta del comité Timón, Dos People and the Family Charter New York City. Uh, perdón, señora, ¿usted es la presidenta de qué? De la pre, presidenta del comité Timón, The People ¿Timón? and Family okay. Charter New York City. Y madre de un niño con autismo. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Milagros Cancel. I am the mother of one child with autism, and I am uh, the uh, president of the charter, the New York City Charter of uh, Time and um, Time and Pack uh, for Families. Sorry. Okay. Continue, por favor. Okay. Hoy estoy aquí en las vistas testificando porque mi al igual lo, al igual que yo y otros padres hispanos, cada día se nos violentan los derechos en el IP. IP. I am writing here today uh, to speak on behalf of myself and other Latin American parents uh, that are having our, our rights uh, violated with the IEP. Continúe, por favor. Y en este mes se me violentaron uno de los derechos en el IP de mi niño. No respeto, no no mandando a tiempo las fechas, eh, mandando las fechas para el IP de mi niño. Para el IP. And this uh, month, my uh, rights, the rights of my child in IP were violated when they weren't, they did not send the IP in time for my child. So, yo quiero decir que desde la era de la esclavitud oprimían a los esclavos como la, como la ley para mantenerlos controlados cuando era ilegal enseñarles a los esclavos a leer y a escribir. I like to say that it, during the times of slavery, uh, they kept the uh, slaves uh, um, uneducated. They forbade them to speak, uh, to, I'm sorry, to learn to have, how to read. Continúe, por favor. Por miedo de que fueran a discriminar la información para liberarse de la revolución durante la era de la, de, de, durante la, era de la abolición for fear that they would cause a revolt and liberate themselves during the time of slavery. Continue. De allí empezó la opresión educativa. And from there, uh, op uh, educational oppression has started. Este ha sido el sistema de opresión que ha existido en este país, especialmente en lo que se refiere a los estudiantes de color. This has been the system of oppression that has existed in this country, especially when it comes to students of color. Cuando la ley de educación no existe la misma oportunidad para los estudiantes que vienen de comunidades minoritarias. When the, when the laws do not apply or the rights do not apply the same equally to the students who come from uh, minority communities. Esta es la historia de este país y ustedes son parte de esta historia. This is part of this country's history and now you are part of its history. Todavía hay segregación en el sistema escolar. We still have a, a segregation in the school levels. A nuestros niños de color no le dan la misma educación. Our children of color are not receiving the same education. Esto se asemeja a esta época de opresión. And this is similar to the time of oppression. Está claro que la segregación de vivienda está directamente vincula, vinculada con la segregación escolar. It is obvious that uh, uh, the oppression, the housing oppression is, uh, in, is, com is uh, complete, directed, affected by, uh, it direct, directly affects uh, the oppression in education, discrimination in education, sorry. Hay que sorry. crear programas para el aprendizaje cuando los estudiantes están en la escuela. Time expired. Okay, uh, there has to be a program that starts when, for when students are in school. No cuando, te, no cuando terminan en cárceles por no haber tenido el acceso. Instead of when they end up in jail because they did not have access. Y tenido los servicios equitativos en su educación. And, and did not have access to the same uh, services um, in their education. Señora Milagros, lo siento, pero el tiempo se acaba de terminar. Uh, Mr. Uh, Buckler, I'm letting her know about the time. Thank you. Um, si usted puede, por favor, resumir lo que, un, un, resumir algo y decir un último punto. Okay. Solo le pido el, conse le, le pido el consejo municipal y al alcalde y al gobernador que hagan lo correcto para los estudiantes con discapacidad, especialmente en, comunitaria, en comunidades min minorarias, que I'm le den los fondos the, a la educación. 
I'm asking the Board of Fed, the governor and all the uh, executive bodies to please uh, give the same education to the children with uh, um, discapacities uh, and to please, especially the kids that come from minority communities. And to please fund, give funds to the, the educational funds in an equal manner. Le pido a los legisladores que, la, que apoyen el uso de fondos, de fondos de ayuda federal para complementar los fondos de educación estatal, estatales ya asignados. And I ask the legislators to please approve the use of funds to help uh, with the, to improve the help, the federal help with the state help. Los fondos de ayuda federal no deben usarse para reemplazar los fondos estatales existentes, sino que deben proporcionar como una línea de financiamiento adicional necesaria. Gracias por su atención. The, the federal uh, help, economic help that we're getting should not be used to replace the uh, existing state uh, funds, but it should use to improve it. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Milagros. Thank you, Jimena. We're Gracias, really... Señora Milagros. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh... Uh, Deputy Chancellor Gomark and President Kabuto, thank you for that. Uh, the chair had just texted me. Um, I just need to ask your indulgence for one more time. Uh, it's just going to be a quick two, uh, two minutes. Um, CSA President Mark Hanazaro has to get off the Zoom in four minutes. So if we could, um, if the master muter could please unmute um, the CSA President. I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you now. Oh. Great, thank you so much, and, and thank you for indulging me. I'm sorry, I have to, I have to jump off. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for this opportunity to testify, and, and thank you to Chad Traeger and, and the entire committee for your support throughout the years, um, especially with the hold harmless uh, with, with this, this year's budget due to the pandemic, uh, too many schools lost register that could not be predicted, and, and your strong support was vital in um, convincing the Department of Education to hold schools harmless. Um, so that is such a big, big victory and, and we appreciate your help there. Um, second, we have a fair student funding, which as you know, uh, we have been um, advocating alongside, alongside you and this, and this uh, committee, the city council for years, trying to get all schools to 100%. Uh, we believe that this year with the federal stimulus money, that should be a first priority before any other priorities uh, are set. Um, we have also in our contract uh, agreed with the Department of Education that it's a best practice to have an assistant principal in every school. We have about 111 schools currently with no assistant principal. And we will be urging the department to make sure that there is a, uh, an assistant principal funded in every school. Um, I heard, I heard earlier reference to the fact that there is going to be significant turnover in school leadership and teaching positions uh, coming up due to the pandemic. Um, that is true. And there is also a tremendous recruit, uh, uh, recruitment problem regarding uh, school leadership because uh, not only due to the pandemic, but due to the last several years, uh, the challenging leadership positions that people are asked to take on have become really unattractive. And our ALPAP, our executive leaderships, Assistant Principal Leadership Program prepares principal for, uh, assistant principals to take on the role uh, to be successful principals. And we're going to ask for continued funding through city council where you have been so generous in the past. Uh, so we will be leaning on you to continue to support that vital program, which is even more vital um, at um, this time. <clears throat> and, and just finally, it's our early childhood educators who are continuing to do the terrific work with our youngest students um, and, and they have uh, been understaffed and underfunded for years, and we're going to be looking for support there also. So thank you very much. I just want to say uh, publicly to President Canizaro, um, I, I meant it earlier when I, with my exchange with the uh, Chancellor and folks, um, I will never forget the calls I've had with principals uh, this past year. I mean, I um, they, they will be with me for the rest of my life. Um, and principals and our school staff, they move heaven and earth to make this work for kids with very limited inadequate support and with, with, with no consultation in many cases and no heads up and finding out about announcements Friday, three o'clock 
Um, and uh, as I mentioned to the chancellor, parents don't call the mayor. They don't have, they don't have, many of them don't have his number. They call principals, they call their school communities. And um, we just want you to know that, that this council, this committee, we, we have our educators' backs. Um, and I know that the CSA championed initiatives even prior to the pandemic that are really a support system for school leaders and to prepare future school leaders. It's gonna be a major priority for us uh, in this council uh, to make sure that we not only restore cuts, but actually increase support. Um, and fair student funding is where the rubber meets the road. You know, all the, all, the, all the wonderful positions our schools need and all the great supports, that's where fair student funding comes in. If they don't have the money to do it, it just doesn't happen. Uh, and thank you for always centering that. For every year I've known you, you've always centered, that's where the rubber hits the road for our schools, whether we have the money or not, for all the support staff. And I uh, just wanna thank you for your leadership and to all your members. Uh, we see you, we appreciate you, and we must have your back in this budget. Thank you. Thank you, and, and we really appreciate all that support and we recognize it as well. So thank you very much. Have a great thank day. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, CSA. Thank you, SCA. Thank you, DOE. We now go back to our regularly scheduled program, albeit a little behind schedule, but we are now going to call on Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Miller, and then back to the chair. Time starts now. Gotta go. Hi. Uh, oof. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, to all the DOE representatives, thank you for all the hard work you do. It's a pleasure working with you. Um, two quick questions. Um, and I'll ask both, because uh, so you can think about one while you're answering the other. So the first is that the capital plan, um, if I remember right, drops uh, remarkably between, um, sorry, I think really prepped here, uh, after FY24. So for the capital plan for the SCA, it's looking like 22, 23, and kind of 24 hover around $4 million to spend commitment. And then starting in 25, it just drops to 1.1 billion for the rest of the 10 year plan. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that sort of, um, you know, I know we hit pause, I understand all of that, but if you could, you know, are you confident that it'll only be 1.7 billion in the out years, blah, 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 blah. My second question is, um, how many about the MWBEs? How many businesses are part of the program, the MWBE program? And what is their share within SCA's pool of contractors? So I guess that means if you have total value of the contracts, what's their percentage? Isn't it supposed to be 30%? And then what's the, if you just look at number of MWBE contractors? as a, a part of all contractors. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to start on the capital plan question. And I think we need to unmute Ms. Goldmark. Oh, oh, I think I thought I was unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, yes you're unmuted. Oh, uh -oh. okay, thank you. Um, so I'll start on the- We need to unmute Ms. Goldmark. Who has a lot to say and would be answering my question? No, Councilmember Rosenthal, she is she is unmuted. We can hear her. So everyone else can hear me. Telling me every single Councilmember Rosenthal. No, no, no. She's unmuted. Can you hear us? No, I don't think you can. It's not me. It's you. <laughs> can you hear us now, Councilmember Rosenthal? Can you hear us? I can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. You missed my bad joke, council member. I said, it's not me, it's you. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I don't mean it. It just was there. Um, so, uh, President Kubota, if it's okay, I'll start on the capital plan question and then please jump in. Uh, so, a couple of different intersecting laws, right? The city has to have a 10 year capital plan. <clears throat> 
an outlook and the DOE is required by statute to have a five-year capital plan, which, which we develop relying heavily on school construction authority. Um, and that dates back to the creation of the school construction authority. Um, and the sort of, at that point, prior to mayoral control, big challenges in terms of school construction delays. And so the creation of the school construction authority to cut through all of that and their tremendous track record in that part of the structure is a five-year capital plan. So we know, and that's actually what we are testifying about today. And that's something where you see the amendment usually if there's not a pandemic every year. Um, so the five-year capital plan numbers you're looking at are the five-year capital plan. The city's 10-year capital plan, it's a placeholder number and you'll see a change when we develop the next five-year capital plan. Oh, so it goes by five-year chunks. Got it, got it. So for the next three years, we current the next three years, we're just missing a year or two. Do you have to wait every two years when you're doing a five-year plan or something? Because I only have three years of numbers around 4 billion and then it drops right down. So we are in, <laughs> are we in year two or year, what year are we in, Nina? We're in year two. Year two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a timing thing. That's I, I cool. think we remember the creation of the plan. It was just before, as we say. Okay. So it's a timing thing. I guess my question is for FY22 then, are you confident that for 21 and 22, are you confident about the amount that you um, that you have committed there? Do you think you'll really get there? Thank you. President Kubota, with an eight-month construction delay, I don't know about FY21, but I'll, I'll, I'll let President Kubota handle that. <laughs> yes, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I think the difference, just, just to reiterate what you were saying, um, is that we are at a fixed five-year capital plan, so FY20 to 24 versus a, a, the city's rolling 10-year plan. And I think that's sort of the, the gap between the two. So it's not that we just need to look ahead uh, past the two years, it's that fixed period. So, um, so as Karen mentioned, uh, we, do, we do work with OMB and obviously City Hall as the next five-year capital plan cycle approaches us, which we'll, we'll start that in FY23. Um, and the, the funding levels that you're seeing um, in, in, uh, of 1.7 billion in fiscal years 25 and 26 are quite similar um, to, to what, what they were as we went into this capital plan back in, uh, in, in 18. Totally got it. And so if you were thinking about the commitments for end of the year 21 final, what would that number be? And what's your expected for 22? So uh, we are planning on um, committing $4.5 billion for FY21. Uh, we we were able to resume our designs and everything, and we do have in this last quarter uh, about $2 billion that, that we are planning on awarding, so we are well on our way to uh, achieve that. Yes, I know. Let me know. Thank you so much. And, and similarly in FY22 as well. Oh, did anything get pushed out to FY22? From mm -hmm. FY22? because it seems to roughly be four, bill, four plus billion every year. So I think there was a bit of a cascading effect due to the pause. So there were a lot of projects that were not awarded in FY20 that would have moved to FY21 and similarly FY21 to 22, uh, you know. Got it. If you could just send those over, that would be incredibly helpful to, to the finance team or what, however you send that information over. Um, that'd be great. And then about the MWBs real quickly. Right. So um, I had mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, in this administration that we have uh, the SEA has obligated over three point one billion dollars uh, to MWBE firms in prime construction contracts and over two billion to subcon uh, w, uh, MWBE subcontractors. And uh, what, your window. Sorry. So FY15 through current. Okay. So um, I will also say that uh, we have a, a 156 firms that participate in our mentor and graduate mentor programs. 
Um, and we have 100 and I'm sorry, 1,968 qualified firms of which 962 are MWBE firms. So we- 90% of the firms you contract with are MWBEs? So uh, about 50% of the contractors that are- Of uh, 1,000, sorry. 1,900, sorry, 1,968. 100. Right, right. Okay, about half. Yes, about half. That is correct. Okay. President uh, Kabuto, thank you so much for all of your help. You've been amazing, and I know you're really helping my district as well, and we really appreciate it. And Deputy Chancellor Goldmark, it's great to have you back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. And finally, we will hear uh, from Councilmember Miller. Time starts now. <laughs> Saving the best for last. So um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam President. It's a pleasure to see you in that seat. And uh, um, obviously, we've worked together over the years for, for, for quite a while, and uh, uh, which is probably the nexus of what I want to talk about. Uh, is is some of the projects that we've talked about over the past six or seven years uh, that are in queue. I want to talk about the the the, the, uh, the scheduling and the impact that the moratorium has had. Uh, if in fact that we are going to resume a normal schedule, um, have we prioritized it? Is there some work that we can do as other agencies have done, where there is minimal um, disruption? uh to to the functions of of the building uh what, what what exactly does it look like what projects can we expect to see moving forward um citywide and then we can localize it just a little bit president Carter, would you like to start or if you'd like to, that's fine. I was going to talk specifically about um, some of the projects in 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 council members' district, uh, in particular the um, um, so, so so citywide. Just let, let's just take a step back, right? We we definitely prioritize a restart of our capacity projects, making sure that our FY our September twenty twenty one schools would open on time, which we did. But then when we got to the more granular level, we certainly prioritized our MWBE firms, um, which I mentioned earlier, and also those projects that that were affecting the, the hardest hit uh, in terms of COVID uh, rates throughout the city. So that was our prioritization process as we as we restarted hundreds of our projects. Um, and, and, and we try to do it as equitably across uh, the entire city. Uh, that said, some of the things happening in, in your specific district is that we, um, we've we just authorized a new 800 uh, seat high school. We've begun the secret process and working with the community board to start that public review. Uh, I think Campus Magnet is, is something uh, close to you as well. Uh, and, and so we anticipate that to be going out to bid uh, and starting construction this summer with completion of fall of 2022. Uh, so we're, we're really happy that we've restarted. And this the gymnasium portion. Sorry, say that again. That's the gymnasium portion because there was a number of jobs and, and uh, campus magnet. Uh, I think we were specifically talking about both the gym and the athletic field. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm super disappointed, but if we get started, that's okay. Those were participatory budgeting and, and, and we really wanted to see, you know, in order to encourage people to participate in that process, they need to see the projects and that one's probably five years in, in the running, um, but glad that they're happening. Uh, in terms of uh, full broadband and access uh, and wiring, uh, uh, can, can you say that all of our schools have been equitably wired and, and that we're able to receive um, in-person uh, uh, instruction uh, without any uh, disruption due to lack of broadband? Um, I'm happy to speak uh, about that and to also invite in um, uh, Anurag Sharma and anyone else from the uh, DOE who'd like to speak about this. Our, our CIO uh, Anurag Sharma is also here. Uh, in terms of broadband, we've made a significant additional investment. The capital plan, this five-year capital plan already had $750 million 
um, funding it, and we've increased that. So we're now at $1.02 billion, and we've been able to increase the uh, capacity across the entire system from 14 gigabytes to 240 gigabytes, so more than 10 times uh, the amount. In addition to that, we have now a five-year tech refresh cycle, so every school has equipment. Uh, we just essentially, we go through and we keep refreshing as we go. So 20% of the schools get the upgrade in any given year. And that's because of that large investment. And it's because of the attention that council members such as you and, and your colleagues on the committee have been bringing to the technology issues for years. Um, so we're very grateful for that support. And so the good news is that at this point, um, the schools have more capacity across the entire DOE system, significantly more. There are two data centers operating where there used to be just one. Um, and we have converted all of the- Time expired. Uh, all of the wiring sort of of the network over to fiber optic. So everything up to the school wall is addressed within the school wall uh, at this point. It's again that twenty. And, that, and that's in every every school. That's across every school, and then um, at this point, there's the tech refresh happening in every school. Okay, so, great. And 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 just it, very quickly, um, I believe it was PS ninety five that we were looking at uh, seat additional seats. They were uh, tremendously overcrowded. Uh, we looked at a couple of locations uh, in the area, the same area that we're talking about building the high school. Is there any, and that is an elementary or K through eight, is there any headway uh, that we've made on um, that particular location? And if you can give me some clarification, uh, just in, cause I think we, we left it at 50% of MWBE or was it 50% of MWBE participating in the mentoring program or actually those who are gaining contract, uh, uh, contracts? Um, I'm sending everybody toward the DOE. And school construction. So, so we didn't find anything yet as an alternate to PS95 or close to PS95. We still are searching. Uh, so, you know, we continue that search. And, and, and like I mentioned before, we welcome any suggestions and we are still early in this plan. So we, we will continue our search there. Um, what I was saying about those are pre-qualified firms uh, that 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 are that make up fifty percent of our pool of contractors uh, and, and vendors. I will say though that um, that our mentor program has been fabulous. It was established in ninety three, um, and it's you know. What, what, what we do is provide that technical uh, assistance and access to capital and bonding uh, and mentoring as part of that, that program. Um, and I don't know if you're aware, but we have increased the value of the mentor program. It was previously 1 million for each project. It's now to 1.5. Beginning in July, it'll be two and next July, it'll be three. So the access to the number of potential projects that a mentor firm can bid on is tremendous. And I will say that uh, about 60% of all contract awards uh, uh, go, go to, to Black and Hispanic firms. Okay, that, that is good to know. And we have to figure out a way to ensure that we're reaching our target audience and, and involving more folks into the mentor program. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and 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 I, I guess everybody gets to go home now. I have to jump on transportation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, that's it for council member questions, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thanks to the uh, administration. And uh, um, again, I, I I certainly you know we all agree that we have a lot more work to do. But I do appreciate acknowledge um, that a lot of folks here have been working long days and nights um, and. Uh, more to do and more resources to secure for our schools. So thank you all for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. And that concludes um, testimony from the administration. I am just going to uh, go over uh, once again, procedures uh, for the public portion of this hearing. Um, 
We're sorry that it's behind schedule, but this is an important budget and an important year. Um, and there were lots of uh, council member questions from the education committee. So for public testimony, again, uh, the public clock is for two minutes. Please wait uh, after I call your name for the sergeant at arms to give you the cue that you may begin and a member of our staff will unmute you. After the two minutes, when the sergeant calls time, we ask that people please wrap up um, their final thoughts. So we will first hear from, we were going to first hear from the UFT, but I believe Michael Mulgrew is currently on another Zoom. So we will go to our next panel and then we will go back to him. So for the first panel, we are going to call and I apologize if I am mispronouncing anyone's names. Liana Garcia, Stephanie Pacheco, Rashida Harris, Anna Jean Lewis, and Jenny Metheny. And we will first start with Liana Garcia. Time starts now. Hello. Hello. Your connection is garbled. We can't hear you. Uh, oh, yeah. off. Go ahead. Uh, is, am I? Like, I can. Oh, okay. Here we go. Um, now we. Now everyone can hear me. Okay. I stand in solidarity with my fellow youth advocates across New York City who have long demanded police free schools and who have been silenced by the Department of Education. And I'd like to point out that our problems we have, the problems we have, have been here long before COVID and they will continue to be here unless the Department of Education decides to work with students and parents. As a student, I demand that I see more people of color in our curriculum. I demand New York City schools be centered around healing and helping low income homeless black and brown children like myself be able to get the educational experience the best educational experience they can get in school. I, do, I like to use the rest of my time to sit, in silence, to, sit in, to, to sit in silence to symbolize how the Department of Education has silenced students who have long called for police free schools. Time expired. Thank you. And next we will hear from Stephanie Pacheco. Time starts now. Hello, um, I would like to second the thoughts shared by Liana. I also stand in solidarity with all, with all of the youth across New York City that have been demanding to have police removed from all of our schools and demanding a fully funded and just education for all black and brown low income students. I will also be using my time to stand in solidarity with these people who have been consistently silenced by people in this very call. Um, and I stand in complete solidarity with their fight and with our fight for fully funded police free healing centered schools. Thank you.
time expired. Thank you. And next we will hear from Rashida Harris. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rashida Harris and I'm providing testimony on behalf of the Healing Center Schools Working Group today. I stand in solidarity with the youth advocates across NYC who have long demanded police-free schools but have been silenced in the real discussions surrounding this transformation. But I am here today to talk about how much money the city currently spends to criminalize and harm students and how that money can be invested in healing. I have four points and one question. All the next points I'm about to mention come directly from Girls for Gender Equity, GGE. A, redistrib a redistribution of NYPD's $450 million annual school policing budget across all 1,600 public schools would give every school budget an additional $282,000 each year. If School Safety Division was a standalone police department, it would be the fifth largest in the country. The 188 officer uniform task force, which are actual uniformed NYPD po police, not SSAs, in our schools, cost a whole whopping $24 million. The mayor's budget, that's just our reality, the current budget reality that we talk about when we talk about funding our schools, right? The mayor's budget offers the following. We pay for every 1,000 students the numbers I'm about to quote are for every 1,000 students. So please keep that in mind. So for, we pay for every 1,000 students, five, we pay for five SSAs, 2.6 school counselors, 1.3 school social workers, 0.9 school psychiatrists, psychologists, and 0.6 school nurses. I, need to, I don't need to remind y'all that a budget is a moral document and we need to prioritize healing centered and restorative practices through an anti-racist, anti-biased, culturally responsive lens. Question, Chair Traeger, are they still planning to hire 475 new school safety agents at a cost of $20 million from the DOE's budget? I implore you to block that, please. It's not prioritizing healing center schools. We need culturally responsive, sustaining education, smaller class sizes, and we must, must include students and parents and community members in these planning meetings. Our healing center schools roadmap provides the framework for making this happen. We all need healing. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time and peace. Thank you. And that concludes this panel for those that are present. Um, we will move on to our next panel who's rejoining us, Michael Mulgrew from the UFT. Uh, good starts. afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I want to thank the city council for having this hearing. I want to thank Chair Traeger for all his great work and all the other city council folks who are here. Um, look, I, I want to be really we quick here. We're facing phenomenal challenges at this point in time. Uh, the amount of damage that has been done because of COVID and what we're looking at uh, is going to take an immense amount of work and funding. Thankfully, uh, uh, with a lot of effort, we were able to get a president in the United States who actually believes in investing in actual people and not corporations and banks. And now we have this funding. But the question for us as a city is, are we going to spend it wisely? This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to do a lot of good, or is it gonna become political footballs and a waste of time and, and, and funding? And I'm imploring folks here, we have a five point plan, it's in my testimony. We need an intervention team for every 200 students for academic intervention, as well as an emotional uh, and social assessment. We wanna make sure that we're doing everything in our power right now to spend our money wisely. Okay, we want to make sure we have a real intense summer school experience right now, not what's been in the past. And we want people to be brought together safely. Um, and these are the challenges that we have. But we are willing to, we want to take these challenges on, but we really need partners. And that's what City Council has been, our partners. Uh, and, and this is really, as we go through the rest of this school year, making sure all of our graduating seniors get the support and develop the support and information that they need so that they're making really good choices about their college or careers or whatever path they're choosing to do. All of these things are imperative right now. So we are asking city council to be there and work with us with on behalf of the children of New York City. 
Lots of stuff is tough. We understand it. And as to the last speaker, I do not agree with hiring 475 more school safety officers. I'm just telling you that right now. No reason to be doing anything like that at this moment. So again, I want to thank Chair Traeger and everyone else uh, in city council support for all the things you've done with in the past. But now some of our greatest challenges ever are before us. And I, I want to say a couple of things publicly as well. And I, I'd like for President Mulford to hear because, uh, you know, there's been a lot of commentary from folks who never spent a day uh, working in, in a school uh, about school reopening or school safety concerns. Uh, I just want to remind the public that the city administration did not even come up with or even work on a plan to reopen the school system until after July 4th. Now, if you actually worked in, in the school, you would know that school communities prepare for September, not in, not in the end of July, not in August, but you prepare maybe January, February, yeah. earlier in the year. There was no plan, if anything, the UFT to their credit, to their credit, did the work really of the administration to at least call in public health experts to provide some level of guidance on the path forward, reminding the public that as of June of last year, close to 80 DOE employees passed away because of the virus. Principals, educators, support staff. And there was understandable distrust of the government because we put people in, in very dangerous situations where the virus was spreading at, at the time. So the administration did not even come to the table with any plan until later in the summer. And to the UFT's credit, and I would say CSA others, they brought in public health experts. They wanted to hear from infectious disease experts what is best to protect our kids, not just the staff themselves, but we're here for the children. So I want to just get that straight. And as I mentioned with the uh, uh, DOE earlier in SCA, there was a school in Manhattan, MLK campus, uh, MLK junior campus that has no windows and they failed the ventilation test because of the infamous toilet paper test. That's why that school community had their school opening delayed. So we need to get the facts out there because educators always prioritize the safety and well-being of their children and of their classrooms. And educators are not robots, they're human beings. And we publicly should acknowledge and, and, and thank a, a, a workforce that literally transformed the largest school district in the nation from in-person to remote, moving heaven and earth with inadequate support, even while facing challenges in their own personal lives, losing loved ones, being primary caretakers. And Mr. President Mulgrew, I, I mentioned before with CSA, it's worth repeating with the UFT. I also empathize with teachers who go above and beyond teaching virtual and, and, and recording the lesson to do in person, vice versa. They're doing going above and beyond what the requirements are, not even, even being compensated, but just go, going above and beyond doing wellness calls. Because teachers are de facto counselors, social workers, because of the inadequate amount of social workers and counselors we have in our school system. So to our educators, to our so support staff, to our nurses, everyone, thank you. And we see you. And we're always going to have your back. And I think it's important to get that out there, President Mulgrew. Thank you very much, Jim. Chair Traeger, excuse me. Um, and that, uh, yes. Oh, no, I was going to say, I don't see any um, questions from other council members at this time. Um, and Mr. Mulgrew was by himself on this panel. Thank you. Thank you, President Mulgrew. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next panel that we will be calling is Jonathan Rampagoa. Jade Entian, Akira Adams, Brielka Rodriguez, and Smita Vargas. We will start with Jonathan. I'm starts now. Good afternoon, City Council Education Committee. My name is Jonathan Eastern Pagoa, and my pronouns are he and his. I'm an Elmer's Queens local. I attend Bard High School at College Queens. I'm also a member of the New York Civil Liberty Unity Activist Project. Today, I'm calling on this body to allocate additional funding for ventilation and PPE for public schools. 
This is especially essential for the current school year and for the next academic year of 2021 to 2022. Yesterday, based on the Mayor de Blasio's decision, NYC high schools reopened for in-person learning. It is imperative that students who transition back to full in-person learning have a healthy and spaced environment that adheres to the CDC guidelines. There are a number of health concerns with regard to the ventilation in our schools. According to the NYC DOE, of the 96% of classrooms that have functioning ventilation systems, there are still another 2,882 in need of repairs. Additionally, ventilation action team inspectors say 21 schools housed in 10 buildings throughout the city are unfit for teachers to return to due to poor ventilation. We demand that there be full accessibility and a complete installation of ventilation systems in all our schools in our city. This would lower the risk of contracting COVID-19 amongst faculty and students alike and also decrease the chances of transmission throughout the city. There are still questions remaining to how students will get the vaccine. So until we all have access to this vaccine, we must receive proper ventilation and sufficient PPE for our schools and it must be mandated citywide. I'm also calling on the body to increase funding for enrichment and extracurricular programs for our public schools, especially districts who are suffering and struggling with underfunding during this pandemic. All children deserve to be given opportunities to thrive in their academic and after school activities. And this includes the opportunity to participate in a wide variety of educational and artist programming. To reiterate, here are my two demands. Number one, allocate funding for ventilation systems and PPE for our public schools. And number two, increase the budget for extracurricular and enrichment programs for all public schools so that all children have a chance to have the holistic approach. Time expired. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jade. Time starts now. Great. Um, I'm going to be reading on behalf of Jade. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jade, and I'm a junior at Dream Yard Preparatory High School and a youth leader and board member at Sisters and Brothers United and a youth leader at Urban Youth Collaborative. As a young person, fighting for police-free schools means fighting for my liberation. When I see police in the schools, I can't help but feel uncomfortable, scared, threatened, inferior, and like a target. So why put them in our schools? These are real feelings from students in New York City. With police in schools, our freedom is not only limited, it is taken away. How can we feel safe in our learning environment knowing that there are people there trained to hurt us when we need help the most? In New York City, with predominantly students of color, there are more police officers than students, than student counselors. We've also seen in the past more than 90% of students, hang, students handcuffed during child and crisis issues be students of color. Children as young as five years old have been handcuffed during a mental health crisis. With data like this, who am I supposed to turn to when I need help the most? If I don't feel okay, if I'm scared, if I'm about to have a mental breakdown, who is going to help me? The same people trained to mace me if I scream in fear, the same people who will pin me down if I need space, the same people trained to hit me if I feel uncomfortable being held. Our schools continue to feel more like prisons than actual schools, and the police wants us behind bars. That is much clear. What makes the school to prison pipeline in New York more painful and complex is that our people, People who look like me are the ones that are tasked um, to police us in schools and communities. It is time to reimagine safety. But when we say we want, when we say we keep us safe, we don't mean we want time expired. Education is the starting line to my future, to all of our futures. And to get there, we cannot continue to utilize the same oppressive practices. We need real investment and support. And it starts with police free schools. I asked the council today to fight for a budget that does not hire new cops in our schools, but instead invest in the money in counselors, social workers, and restorative justice practices. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Akiria Adams. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Akiria Adams. I'm a youth leader at the Urban Youth Collaborative and I'm a high school junior in Queens. As a student that attends an over-policed public school with mostly students of color, I have witnessed and experienced the impacts of spending so much money on school cops. Our schools need more guidance counselors and mental health resources, especially during this time. I recently had an issue that only my guidance counselor can handle. It took two months for me to reach her. My peers at school are going through even worse situations than I was and can't get any help. 
Schools, cops can't solve issues that students have, yet we spend $450 million on them each year and are even paying them right now to patrol empty schools. School police are known to escalate situations and harm students. I have seen school police in my school use excessive force and hurt students until they are bruised. I have seen them arrest students and yell at them during me metal detector searches. I once had a fork in my bag for lunch and they told me I couldn't go to class unless I threw it away, making me late to class. I've been taking, I've been taken to the side nearly every other week to be scanned by a wand because of items like a hole puncher, jewelry, or any other harmless items. Why do city budgets prioritize policing instead of resources to help students? It is unfair that there is a hiring freeze on other educational staff, yet there is a negotiation to hire more school police when they don't benefit students. It's also unfair that the city wants to transfer school cops to the, from the NYPD to the DOE, which does nothing to remove them. Stop neglecting our needs and give us police free schools and resources that help us. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Brielka. Hi, my Hi. name is Wilco Rodriguez. I live in Staten Island. I am in ninth grade and I'm a youth leader at Make the Road New York in an urban youth collaborative. I'm here today testifying because after years of young people campaigning for police-free schools, it's a slap in the face to learn from that to learn that the city is planning to spend two 20 million to hire 475 new school cops. All while the mayor already cut 700 million from the year's education budget. New York City already spent 450 million on schools police, school, schools cops. We need funding to make our school more equitable and compassionate, com compromise based to learn. I will be. I was excited to be in high school, and, but my freshman year was not how I imagined to be. When the pandemic hit, it made me realize that my school and other schools across New York City were not equipped equipped to deal with the situation like this one. My first day of high school was disorganized, stressful because I was not informed by any of staff about my school schedule, nor emotional support that was available to deal with my anxiety, anxiety from the pandemic. I became aware that there is a lack of funding for emotional support and mental health support for students. To me and probably to many other students, the lack of resources is a nightmare. My school is located a couple blocks away from where Eric Gardner was killed. It's unbelievable to know that those same police from the precincts are in my school. It's frustrating that close to 400 and 450 million is spent on police, police in schools, even more so that they are, are doing is now policing empty buildings. My school is a community school. This is important to me because community schools are more important than ever in providing the support students students and families need as we return. However, community schools could be facing cuts in the upcoming year. We need to say, what does that mean to me and other students about where the Time city expired. is choosing to invent their money, policing me or supporting me to be success, successful. We have to stop spending money on policing in schools. Hiring new school safety agents is not what young people like myself want. For years, we have been extremely vocal about removing police out of schools. We have been demanding to reallocate the funding from police to students' social, emotional, and mental health support. There are more school safety agents across New York City schools than social workers, guidance counselors, and school nurses available for 1 million students. Every time students of color like myself walk inside a school building, we have to go through metal detectors. We get treated like as a problem, but we're but we aren't the problem. Racial, ra racist police are the problem. We can, can't can hire new school safety agents and can't transfer them to the Department of Education. It will not erase the harm NYPD has inflicted black and brown young people like myself. This transfer will not undo the trauma that many have experienced. I have a little sister who is nine years old and is element in elementary school. And because of her, I'm committed to keep fighting so she does not have to go or ever experience police in schools. Numerous cities have already completed removing police from schools, including Oakland, Seattle, Portland, Ranchester, Denver, and a couple of weeks ago, Oregon, announced that they will not renew the contract with police departments. While, her, while other cities are cutting size with the police department, New York City is increasing its fundings for schools police and removing and moving them into the DOE, making it fall even more behind in the national movements and racism institutions. 
now more than ever, we need everyone to listen and stand by us. We need guidance counselors that can make us be on track. We need student success centers that can make the process easy, less stressful, and less scary. We need staff on our side that will make us feel safe and supported. I want to go into a school building that prioritizes students' needs and well-being, not that criminalizes just because of their skin color. Thank you. Thank you. And next, and finally, from this panel, we'll hear from Smita. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Smitha Varghese. I'm the New York City Campaign Coordinator for the Alliance for Quality Education, which is also a member of Dignity and Schools Coalition. And uh, DSC's main mission is to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. My written testimony has specific numbers, but in summary, there are more SSAs policing our students than there are guidance counselors and social workers combined, as the student who just testified before me mentioned. And Chair Traeger, you have said this many times before. This is what systemic racism looks like. When the city council continues to vote for a budget that includes funding to maintain police and police infrastructure within our schools, and that same budget provides meager supports related to students' social emotional needs, then in 2021, it's the city council who's gonna be held accountable for being complacent in maintaining the systemic structures born from white supremacy. The mayor's preliminary budget continues to allocate 445 million to keep cops in our schools. So AQE calls on the council to put back against this proposal um, to continue funding SSAs and instead reinvest that money into restorative justice programs, hiring more black and brown counselors, teachers, psychiatrists, and other critical supports needed to uplift our youth instead of criminalizing them. AQE also rejects the mayor and the NYPD's plan to hire 475 new cops. Um, and it's important to note that the city is also receiving at least $4 billion from federal stimulus money. We hope this money will be used for things identified by school leaders as being needed to address the needs of their individual schools and creating real restorative justice programs and more social emotional supports for students struggling during the pandemic. Lastly, we reject intro 2211 that would solidify the transfer um, of COPS. Um, and we hope that the council votes no on it because it would just transfer COPS from you know, the NYPD to the DOE. And this would just create more infrastructure um, to police uh, and criminalize our students. I would like to use the duration of my time to sit in silence to symbolize how- time expired silencing students calling for police free schools thank you thank you and that concludes the testimony for this panel next we will hear from donald nesbitt <laughs> the vice president of local 372 time starts now thank you uh councilman traeger Local 372 uh, New York City Board of Ed employees. Um, I'm here today to testify on the mayor's proposed budget for education. Um, and I'm here on behalf of the 24,000 members of Local 372 and under the leadership of President Sean D. Francois I. Thousands of workers that Local 372 represents perform essential support services to help the 1.2 million public school children of New York City to be learning ready from our school crossing guards to school lunchroom workers to school aides to family workers um, to our community titles the parent coordinators um, and who work with the with the Department of Homeland Services to make sure that children have a place to sleep at night um, to our sappers counselors who are going to help um, our children navigate this system now um, after the COVID-19 pandemic is over. Uh, throughout the pandemic, we have examples of the school crossing guards and school lunchroom employees who have um, who have fed communities, who have fed families, um, and who have made sure that they were safe going to and from the school communities. We have our parent coordinators and community titles who have communicated with parents and have been a liaison between families and schools to remote learning and teachers and, and the administration. Uh, we have our family workers who have, who have checked up on, on families, uh, our school aides and so on and so forth. Um, it's important to note uh, that SAPIS, they already provide um, a social and emotional strategies that help students uh, remain learning ready. Um, this includes classroom mandatory presentations and counseling on mental health services and crisis mitigation in the individual and group settings. So they are already ready to meet 
time expired. Mr. Nesbitt, your internet connection after this is coming in and out. Um, in are you there? Yes. Is it better now? Uh, a little bit. Yes. Try is it better it now? There we go. Okay. I just want to say two things. Uh, we have members who are in the public schools and the charter school system. And at this time, the city and the state have acknowledged um, that uh, the Renaissance Charter School, the members there um, have acknowledged that the funding gaps that the, that, that charter school faces have provided um, problems with um, them being able to hold up their financial assistance to the workers that are there. Uh, we ask that the city council support them in whatever funding that is needed at Renaissance Charter School in District 30. Um, in closing, Local 372 just extends their gratitude to the city council for their support for our titles. We recognize that they are tough decisions that will have to be made and there's not enough money that may be able to go uh, for every worthy issue or service um, throughout the city. Uh, but we thank you for everything that you have done in the past. And we just ask um, that you um, assist um, and make sure that, that the students are um, supported by our support staff. Uh, one last thing I just wanna include that I forgot on um, the school lunchroom workers, if we can fit into the capital plan um, something with ventilation in school cafeterias. Um, the, it's about to be spring and summer, summer again, and our members are in excruciating uh, pain and hurt and suffering uh, throughout the summer months when temperatures hit close to 130, 140, 150 in our school cafeterias. Thank you, uh, members of the council. And, and I just want to say, uh, as I, as I, you know, I thank the other uh, key unions um, to DC 37, to Mr. Nesbitt, to your membership. Um, we owe you more than thanks. We owe you more than recognition. Uh, you know, I, I, keep, I keep correcting some folks who, who say that school buildings were, have been closed. Uh, many of them in my district across the city have been open, uh, staffed by school food workers, cafeteria workers, and our school cleaners um, who put their own life on the line got sick themselves, uh, going through challenges in their own personal lives, um, feeding our families all day, um, serving them, not just with food, by the way, with information, because schools are a point of information and resources for folks. And uh, I, I, I went around my district thanking our schools, and I, had to, I, I saw the number of families interacting, speaking, getting information, and in addition to a meal, having someone to talk to, being a support network for each other. Um, and we are forever grateful, but we have to do more than just say thank you. Um, we ha it has to be reflected in the budget. Um, and you're right, even before the pandemic, DC 37 always talked about what our school for workers are subjected to with very hot temperatures in these cafeterias. Uh, this is not a luxury item. This is a, being able to have adequate ventilation and not working in 100 degree temperatures at work. This is this is a workplace safety issue. It's it's it's, it's a it's really, it's a public health issue. And uh, we yes. are, we, we're with you. Um, that, is, that is really, that is a, that is a priority for us. Um, and just want to, again, publicly acknowledge and thank you and your membership and also your, your SAPIS counselors. There are power professionals who are DC 37. There are nurses, DC 37. So many uh, parent coordinators, many key positions in schools that are critical support systems for our kids. <laughs> Our DT 37 members. We appreciate you, we see you, and we thank you, Mr. Nesbitt. Thank you, Councilman. And that concludes the testimony for this panel. Next, we are going to hear from Ellen McHugh, the Citywide Council on Special Education, Lori Podvesker, Include NYC, Randy Levine, Advocates for Children, Courtney Yadu, New York Legal Assistance Group, Maggie Maroff, the Arise Coalition, and Chris Treber. Following this panel, we will hear from Josephine Okungu, Josh Melendez, and Kenneth Jones. We will start with Ellen McHugh on the current panel. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, this has been a long and interesting morning and half of an afternoon. I hope that some of the recommendations and comments will be taken to heart. There is a longer presentation or documentation that we have, but this is a short version. For those of us who have children with special needs, we are fairly tired of glib statements on holistic and inclusionary education when our children continue to be isolated, separated, and apart from the general population. We are requesting that when we use the words inclusionary and holistic, we also include the fact that there is no one at leadership at the DOE that we know of who has an identified disability, who uses a wheelchair, who's deaf, who has other issues that might impede his or her mobility. As our kids want to see someone like them in leadership positions, we would hope that the DOE would spend some time recruiting individuals with special needs to be on leadership teams. We are coming up to an if only budget. If only we had a hundred social workers, if only we had a hundred psychologists, if only we had more room, if only we had fewer children. We do have fewer children, 30,000 students left this system. With that in mind, it would benefit us all to lower class sizes because it works for children of all types and all persuasions. We would also like to see time expired. The, the iPads and other equipment that have been distributed to individuals be made accessible to those with disabilities and also include English language learners who have been denied in some ways full access to these devices. Thank you very much for your time and effort on behalf of the children. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Ellen. And next we'll hear from Lori. Time starts now. Hi, everybody. Um, we would like to thank the Council's Committee on Education and Chairman Traeger for holding this important oversight hearing on the FY22 preliminary budget. My name is Lori Podvesker, and I am the Director of Policy at Include NYC. For the last 38 years, Include NYC, formerly Resources for Children with Special Needs, has helped hundreds of thousands of New York City families navigate the complex special education service and support systems. With much gratitude, we commend the Department of Education and all staff at 1,600 plus schools for their unwavering commitment to our children and their families during this very challenging year. We testify today to urge the city to prioritize meeting the needs of the near 300,000 students with disabilities in this year's budget. For too many years, our city chose not to allocate adequate funding to support the system with reducing the achievement gap between general education students and students receiving special education services. With help from the federal government on its way, the city can no longer say it does not have the resources to do so. The city must use these targeted funds appropriately to help students with disabilities begin to recover their academic losses, strengthen their literacy skills, and make educational progress. An investment like this now will allow a historically underserved group, mostly Black, Indigenous, and people of color, to gain access in the near future to more opportunities, higher education, and employment. It will also support better integration into our communities. As a result, we result to the we recommend City Council ensures there's adequate funding in the budget for the Department of Education to do the following. Develop a citywide plan to adequately address compensatory services by June 30th, 2021, to reevaluate every student with an IEP in fiscal year 22, immediately lift hiring freeze and hire additional licensed special education teachers, school psychologists, and related service providers. Create Time expired. Centers this summer for on-site evaluations and related services, disseminate guidance documents for schools on the implementation of the citywide compensatory plan by August 30th, 2021, provide compensatory services to all students who did not receive mandated special ed services and specialized instruction as per their IEP since March 16th, 2020, 
and provide parents with more support and training on specific, on specially designed instruction in online learning, behavioral supports, digital literacy, and their educational rights. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Randy Levine. Time starts now. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Randy Levine. I'm the Policy Director of Advocates for Children of New York. With the federal government having approved the largest one-time investment in education in our nation's history, the city needs an ambitious education initiative to pave the way to hope and opportunity for our students. We have submitted detailed recommendations, including the need for a core of professionals to focus on academic support, social emotional support, and outreach, an expanded summer program, one-on-one -on -one or small group tutoring, evidence-based literacy instruction and intervention, compensatory services for students with disabilities, make up language instruction for English language learners, and targeted support for student populations, such as students in the juvenile justice system, significant mental health support, intensive outreach efforts, and extended school eligibility for 21-year-old students who would otherwise age out this year but need more time. I want to highlight a few issues that predate the pandemic and where action is needed even more urgently now. First, while the preliminary budget would expand 3K to four additional districts, it includes no additional support for preschool special education. Data released last week confirm what we've seen on the ground. The city still has a shortfall of hundreds of preschool special education class seats. The city cannot claim to provide pre-K for all while continuing to leave children with the most significant needs out in the cold. This year's budget must include sufficient funding for these legally mandated classes and provide salary parity for teachers of preschool special education classes at CBOs. Second, especially given the impact of the pandemic, funding, including NYPD school safety funding, should be allocated to staff to help support students' social emotional needs. The city must invest in staff such as social workers and behavior specialists and provide an integrated system of intensive mental health supports for students in high need schools, such as the mental health continuum included in the council's FY20 response to the preliminary budget. The city should also invest I'm expired. in school-wide restorative justice practices to address the root cause of student behavior. And finally, the pandemic has underscored the need for a DOE office for students in foster care. Currently, there is not a single DOE staff member focused full-time on students in foster care who have the lowest graduation rate of any student group in the city. Especially following the disruption of the pandemic, schools can be a stabilizing force for students in foster care, but only if someone is focused on addressing their needs. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And next, we'll hear from Courtney. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Courtney Yadu, and I'm an Equal Justice Works Fellow at New York Legal Assistance Group. For more than 20 years, NILAG's Special Education Unit has advocated on behalf of low-income students with disabilities. Our lawyers collaborate with families to ensure that students receive the educational services that they need and are legally entitled to. During the pandemic, many of our clients have experienced profound upheaval, learning loss, and regression. Today, we're here to ask that the City Council prioritize their needs in the budget. Before the pandemic, students with disabilities already faced enormous challenges navigating the special education system. Our clients often waited months and years for necessary services. The pandemic has exacerbated these longstanding problems. With my limited time, I'll share the challenges that four NILAG clients have experienced this year, which are representative of the obstacles that so many families have faced. Our 10-year-old client from Brooklyn has a learning disability and needs a small classroom setting. However, his remote class has 27 students in it, more than double the mandated size. He receives minimal live instruction each day, which he often misses because his speech and occupational therapy sessions are scheduled at the same time. Our six-year-old client from the Bronx has autism and ADHD. Due to his disabilities, he can't meaningfully engage with remote instruction. For that reason, his family opted for blended learning in the fall. However, he didn't receive a school placement until months into the school year. While he was waiting, he didn't receive any educational services. Our four-year-old client from Queens has significant language delays. Her family requested an assistive technology evaluation last January before the pandemic. Over a year later, she still has not been evaluated. Our 15-year-old client from Manhattan lives in a city shelter without reliable internet access. Despite numerous requests, he didn't receive a DOE iPad until July. That device still frequently malfunctions, preventing him from engaging in remote learning. These are just a few of the challenges that our clients have faced. After this year of educational loss, the city must address the needs of students with disabilities. We ask that the council prioritize their needs in the budget. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. And next we will hear from Maggie Maroff. Time starts now. One moment, Maggie, you should see a prompt looking to accept the unmute. There we go. Hi, Malcolm, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Maggie Moroff and I'm here today representing the Arise Coalition. I'll send in my full written testimony later and we'll be attaching to it 10 recommendations from Arise that we believe um, necessary to address the needs of students with disabilities after this year of serious educational disruption. I'm gonna focus my oral testimony, however, on two of those points. The first is compensatory services. I was pleased to hear from DCAO Fodi earlier that they're working on this. And I'm very thankful to you, Chair Traeger, for asking about it. We're looking forward to more details from the DOE. That said, all students had their school life thrown into upheaval this year. Among those most impacted were students with disabilities who are disproportionately Black and Latinx. They lost countless hours of critical special education instruction and support. Many lost skills that they had worked hard to gain prior to the pandemic. The city really needs to roll out a plan for determining what students missed and providing instruction and services to make up for that. This is gonna require hiring or contracting additional special ed teachers and service providers. And we ask that the council make sure that there's funding in that for the budget. The other thing I wanna talk about is literacy instruction. When students leave school without learning to read, the fault isn't theirs, it lies with the system. Most of our students, including those with disabilities, can learn to read with evidence-based core instruction and targeted intervention. This is absolutely an equity issue given the unacceptable disparities in reading proficiency. In 2019, for example, less than half of all third through eighth grade students, just over one third of black and Hispanic students and only 16% of students with disabilities were reading proficiently. We recommend funding in the DOE's budget to train and support teachers and coaches to provide evidence-based, culturally appropriate, appropriate, not appropriated, sorry, uh, targeted literacy. Time expired. Uh, two quick points, um, two quick suggestions really. The city should use those funds to purchase appropriate curriculum that all schools will then have access to in order to improve their core instruction. The city might also consider expanding a program that they launched uh, last summer, pairing trained educators with small groups of students who needed additional literacy support. There's more in my written testimony. Thank you for the chance to testify today. Thank you. And finally, from this panel, we will hear from Chris Treber. Time starts now. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Christopher Treber. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Children's Services with the Interagency Council. Since I have two minutes, I'll limit my remarks to the subject of preschool special education and the children and families who depend on these critical services and the issues of equity, access, and quality. Every child who attends a 4410 preschool special education program is a public school child. They're placed there by the New York City DOE because there's no other educational option for these children. These children live in your neighborhoods and they would have gone to pre-K for all programs if he or she did not have a disability. Based on the mayor's preliminary management report, we know that 86% of all students with disabilities in New York City attend 4410 programs. It's simple, our schools are the schools that serve children in New York City. But our schools have not been treated that way, nor have they been funded that way. In the last 10 years, our preschool programs have received only a 10% increase in tuition, while state aid to school districts has increased by 44%. This has created a challenge for our schools in terms of recruiting and retaining certified teachers. Our teachers are now the lowest paid teachers in New York City. We are happy that the city council prioritized salary increases for early childhood teachers in New York City, but our teachers were left out of that salary increase. It makes it very hard for us, our schools to retain certified teachers and recruit new teachers. If all the kids came back to school, the schools would not be able to fit, not be able to operate all the classrooms because they don't have enough teachers. I see I'm running out of time. So in closing, I want to share with you the most troubling question I was asked by one of our parent leaders about two weeks ago. One of them asked me, can I explain to them why our children are valued any less than children who attend public schools? I had no answer for them. Do you? Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes testimony for this panel. The
sorry. The next panel that we will be calling is Josephine Okungu, Josh Melendez, and Kenneth Jones. Following that panel, we will be calling on Kaveri Sengupta, Eric Agariho, and Roshni Ahmed. We will start with Josephine Okungu. Time starts now. My name is Josephine Okungu. I'm here as a trained teacher, a New York State certified teacher, a former 4410 preschool special ed teacher, a parent to a child with special needs, as a now as an advocate for equity for students with disabilities. Recently, I quit my teaching job from HeartShare, a 4410 preschool for special education not because I hated it and not because I do not love teaching my students, I do. I quit my job because my salary wasn't meeting my basic needs and it was a very tough decision, but I had no choice. My husband had lost his job and so I had to make drastic decisions. Just like every teacher in New York State and District 75 schools, I earned my master's degree, passed all my state exams before being certified. I worked very hard to become a New York State certified teacher. Believe me, it's a daunting process. But after all my hard work, I came to realize that equity in teacher remuneration excludes teachers who work with students who have special needs in 4410 preschool special ed programs. Why do I have to be paid 40% less of what public school teachers and District 75 teachers earn? 44, 10 schools serve three to five year old children and parents whose children attend these schools did not choose to send their schools there, their kids there. Our kids were placed there by the DOE because they need extra support and the DOE has determined they cannot get the support they need in public schools. These kids do not have the luxury of attending their neighborhood public schools. Now that you have all the, this information, why did the city reach a salary parity agreement and agree to pay 3K and pre-K teachers at the same salary Time as expired. public school teachers, but excluded teachers of 44 tens? Please explain to me why this year's budget proposal does not fit, fix this discriminatory policy, which will likely lead to more teachers like me leaving special ed classes and leaving preschoolers with disabilities without the teachers they need. This year, we are asking the city council to demand that the budget help our preschoolers with disabilities. We are asking the city to have, the, to have faith in preschoolers with disabilities and show that you believe in them by investing in them. The city must make sure there is a seat for every preschooler with IEP and and the city must change course this year and include 4410 preschool special ed uh, teachers in this salary agreement. And also I've listened to many of you speak about and testify about spending millions and billions, yet none of you spoke of, about funding special ed preschools. Do you know they exist? Do you know that every year more kids get diagnosis and have some kind of disability? Well, I'm here because special ed preschools exist and we need funding. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Josh Melendez. Time starts now. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Matthew and I'm a youth leader at Susan Brothers Unite. I live in Council District 8 and I'm in seventh grade and I attend James Kiernan High School, uh, Junior High School. After hearing the mayor's plan of 475 police officers I strongly demand that the city council make it a priority to block this as the money used to employ these cops in our schools will be better spent on social workers, guidance counselors, and health workers in our school. <clears throat> I'm excited to go back to school to learn alongside my peers, but I still don't feel safe knowing that uh, cops are gonna be at my school. Cops don't make me feel secure and safe in my school or in my neighborhood because I've seen from personal experience how they treat me and my friends and on my way to school and in front of my school in the entrance and in all and also in the hallways as a student in a music class i have to bring a guitar home to practice uh, to practice and there was a time when i went to school and the and the cops said that they would only let me inside if they checked my bag uh they checked my bag and my guitar in case for a gun 
I got I got scared and I felt nervous. I felt nervous. I wanted to cry as they accused me of having a gun. Me, an 11 year old at the time being harshly judged at the door and being treated like a criminal. Seeing them all over my school just reminds me when I have when I used to have to raise my family member at Rikers. The constant surveillance, the pat downs at the door, the bag searches, it felt exactly the same as going to school. I strongly oppose the idea of trans transferring the cops from NYPD to the DOE or intro uh, 2211 as there, as there was no point for them being in my school unless what you want them there is to continue harass is continue to harass me and intimidate us students need to feel like they belong in a safe and a supportive school and not a school where the system is built to put us in jail I want to I want to go to a school where I don't time like expired of a school cop but in order for this to be we need money to be divested from school policing and put the money into development of school life social workers, guidance counselors, medical professionals, and a general <clears throat> and in general, more resources in all public schools, but specifically in the Bronx and Brooklyn. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Kenneth Jones. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, one of the things that I want to talk to you about is a resource that's available to the DOE. Running the DOE, even before COVID, COVID was an incredible task, and it's Herculean now with the reopening. But you have a lot of nonprofits in the city, many of whom are vendors with the DOE, who are there to help you. They are subject matter experts in the fields that they specialize in. They develop curricula specific to the subject matters, and they can help, especially in schools that were hit hardest by COVID and economically disadvantaged communities help classroom teachers go deeper in subjects. Not every elementary school teacher has the bandwidth to be a subject matter expert in every subject. So some nonprofits focus on a specific area. The Salvadori Center, where I'm the executive director, focuses on STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And just like the deputy commissioner Goldmark mentioned about the New York Times article about ventilation, that's how we teach kids math, science, and the arts. We use the built environment right around them to show them how what they're learning in their grade is relevant to their immediate life. But you know, more importantly, what we do is we actually do it in a way that's accessible for all learners. Visual instruction so that elves can participate. Project-based materials that are hands-on and common so that kids don't need a computer if they don't have one or if their family can't afford broadband that they can still access the creative STEM-based, design-based curriculum that truly brings what they're learning in school to life and making it relevant. So my question for you, not a really question, my um, last statement is to take advantage as you're going through the Herculean task of reopening schools of the nonprofits who are your partners and are willing to work hard side by side with you for student success. Thank you for the time. Thank you, and that concludes the testimony for this panel. Next, we will be calling on Kaveri Sengupta from the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, Eric Agarijo from the Korean American Family, Family Service Center, and Roshni Ahmed from the Women for Afghan Women, and we will begin with Kaveri. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Kaveri Sengupta, and I am the Education Policy Coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Thank you to Chair Traeger and the members of the Committee on Education for giving us this opportunity to testify. Founded in 1986, CACF is the nation's only Pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization, leading the fight for improved and equitable <clears throat> policies, systems, funding, and services. Asian American students comprise 16.2% of the New York City student population. They attend over 95% of our public schools, make up almost one in four L's, and over 15,000 have an IEP. I want to highlight that a critical way that elected officials and DOE can address the rising levels of violence against Asian Americans and help to dismantle the model minority myth is by enacting policies and a budget that are truly supportive of our students. Show them that you see, acknowledge, and care about them. In that vein, CACF leads the 15% and growing campaign, which is a group of over 45 Asian-led and serving organizations that work together to fight for a fair, inclusive, and equitable New York City budget, protecting the most vulnerable APA New Yorkers. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about Schedule C. Um, so in fiscal year 2021, Asian-led and serving organizations received only 4.65% of city council discretionary dollars and less than 1.5% of social service contract dollars when we're 15% and growing of the population. 
Although Asian American students have a high school graduation rate of 80%, the percentage of college and career ready students is significantly lower at over 50%. To that end, City Council must expand funding for the College and Career Readiness Citywide Initiative to ensure that more APA led and serving groups are adequately funded to support those with the highest need. Many of our organizations are already providing these resources without funding. In addition, CACF is a steering committee member for the New Yorkers for Racially Just Public Schools Coalition. It's a multiracial city, multi citywide education justice coalition aimed at centering racial equity and policy and budget decisions for public education. As part of our JPS, we are demanding that the city make significant investments in culturally responsive and sustaining education as means of uh, educating and honoring all communities, especially the con contributions of Asian Americans who have been overwhelmingly invisible in our current time economy. expired. This must include at least $500 million of the federal stimulus funds to include a new culturally responsive curriculum for pre-K to 12 ELA. As DOE, <coughs> excuse me, as DOE continues to expand the community schools model, we reiterate the need to do so in harder to reach Asian communities and emphasize how imperative it is to expand partnerships with Asian led and serving CBOs beyond the current organizational partners, which are unable to cover all of the need. We need more counselors and social workers, not more school safety agents and we need them to be culturally responsive. Like all students, APA students need schools to invest in them as whole children, and their worries and struggles must be acknowledged in and out of the classroom at all levels, from school level staff to DOE leadership. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Eric. Time starts now. Thank you members of the Committees on Education for giving us the opportunity to testify today. Uh, once again, my name is Eric Agarijo, Community Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Korean American Family Service Center. Uh, KFSC, a little about our nonprofit non organization is that we provide social services to Korean and Asian immigrant survivors and their children who are affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse for the past 32 years. All of our programs and services um, are offered in culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. 98% of our clients are immigrants. 100% of our staff members are immigrants themselves or children of immigrant parents. And over 95% of our clients' first language is not English and come from low-income backgrounds, uh, including myself. Uh, so KFSC is at the front line serving a community and the constituents to fill the gap during this unprecedented trauma. The pathway to the recovery is long and hard, and we respectfully ask for the restoration or expansion of the budget for FY 2020, 2022 in education. KFC's programs, like the Hodori program, which I would love to highlight, uh, was established in 1994. It was designed to help children ages 5 to 13, all from low-income immigrant and working families, uh, to ensure that we build self-esteem and improve communications and social skills by engaging therapeutic, creative, and academic activities that are culturally relevant and developmentally appropriate in a safe and healthy environment. Uh, as of May 2020, KFC immediately pivoted our Hodori after-school program to virtual classrooms. As an after-school program that serves 100% immigrant or children or immigrant parents who live under the poverty line, the support for KFC's Hodori program provides is critical. Many of our families are digitally illiterate a limited English prof proficient. Thus, our teachers and program coordinators work additional hours to prov provide technical support for remote Time learning expired. in a linguistically appropriate way. Uh, challenges due to limited English proficiency are already existing issues due to family violence at home, poverty, and cultural differences. Particularly, the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent closings of schools and businesses highlighted these gaps even further. We're also concurrently providing a greater number of parent counseling sessions to support our parents who are navigating unexpected needs around health, safety, financial distress, virtual school requirements, food and housing insecurities, and more. So initiatives and other support will be critical for the sustainability of the organization as we provide culturally and linguistically services in educational programs to serve our immigrant families and their children. Thank you very much for today. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Roshni. Time starts now. 
Hi everyone, my name is Roshni Ahmed and I'm the Advocacy and Outreach Coordinator for Women for Afghan Women. Uh, thank you to all the members here today. I want to talk a little bit about the needs of Asian Pacific American youth in the city who have grown exponentially during this pandemic. Our coalition of 45 Asian-led and serving organizations through the 15% and growing campaign advocates for budget equity to protect the most vulnerable in our community. WA has been providing comprehensive and culturally specific services to Afghan, South Asian, and Muslim families since 2003. 85 to 90 percent of women that come to WA for services are survivors of domestic violence and often illiterate in any language. The lack of education among Afghan adults greatly impacts their children who struggle in school because English is not their first language. These challenges have been further exacerbated during the pandemic. Because their parents are unfamiliar with the school system in the U.S., many of these youth look to WA for guidance in applying for colleges, academic support, and career development. We first started our youth programs in 2005 and now currently have four youth programs for young men and women aged 10 to 20 from low income and immigrant or refugee families. This year our team has worked extra hard to serve as a support system for our youth who graduated high school, we held a drive-by graduation to celebrate their achievements as they are the first in their families to attend college. WA provides academic and career development such as workshops on writing personal statements, resume building, interview etiquette, public speaking, and much more. Youth have also have opportunities to explore various career options in engineering, law, community organizing, public service, education, and others. 99% of our youth program graduates go on to pursue higher education. Among girls, none were forced to marry early, though all were at risk and now have successfully advocated for themselves to finish their education. Asian-led and serving organizations receive only Time expired. 5% of city council discretionary dollars, though we make up more than 15% of the city's population. We call for a restoration and enhancement of critical funding, such as the College and Career Readiness Initiative. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. And that concludes testimony for this panel. Thank you to that panel. I will now be calling on David Chase from Ballet Hispanico and Jennifer Kunla from Brig. Big Brothers, Big Sisters. We will start with David Chase. Time starts now. If we can go ahead and unmute David Chase. And David, you will see a prompt asking you to accept the unmute. There, okay. Good afternoon. I'm David Chase, Associate Director of Institutional Relations at Ballet Hispanico. We are grateful for the City Council's support for our longstanding CASA and arts education programs in New York City throughout the years, yielding a tremendous return on investment for all New Yorkers. I appreciate this opportunity to advocate for funding in the FY22 budget. Support for arts education is more important than ever. As we begin to come out of the pandemic, arts education will support students in countless ways, both emotionally and academically. A study by Americans for the Arts showed that students with an arts-rich education have better grade point averages, score better on standardized tests in reading and math, and have lower dropout rates. For these reasons and many more, we request continued support in FY22 for the CASA program and new support for the Coalition Theaters of Color initiative. Bala Hispanico has an important role to play in the culture sector's recovery through our education programs that will help students succeed in the post-pandemic world. Our arts education programs typically reach 10,000 New York City students each year. Activities include dance residencies in schools, interactive performances, and classroom workshops and master classes. We successfully transitioned all of our programs online last year and continue to serve some 5,000 students. I will close by saying it has been both heartbreaking and inspiring this past year to see students in our Zoom classes dancing in their living rooms, bedrooms, and kitchens. A recent note from the mother of one of our students simply and eloquently sums up the impact of the pandemic, the impact of Valley Hispanico, and the need for arts education. Quote, just wanted to say thank you for all you are doing. I don't see Gannon smiling as much these days, and to see the huge genuine grin on his face while dancing in your class warms my heart, end quote. Thank you for this opportunity today. 
Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jennifer Kunla from Big Brothers Big Sisters. Time starts now. Thank you, Committee Chair Traeger and members of the New York City Council for holding today's hearing. My name is Jen Kumla. I'm an Associate Director with Big Brothers Big Sisters in New York City. I'm here to advocate on behalf of the thousands of youth we serve each year and young people across the city whose education has been disrupted. Big Brothers in New York, Big Brothers Big Sisters in New York City adjusted our operations to best support our families and volunteer mentors in the face of the pandemic. The need of families in New York City became immediately evident with lack of technology, connectivity, and space with, space with which to engage in remote learning. Absence of supports and services previously received in schools, among many others, all which impact the education of our youth. The achievement gap that existed pre-pandemic has only widened in the face of COVID-19. One in four youth we serve live in neighborhoods hardest hit. Our organization supported program youth by providing laptops, helped to navigate remote learning environment and continues to support through mentoring. The disruptions in schooling, lack of supports, along with lingering uncertainty has added stress within families, increasing potential for safety concerns within the home, further jeopardizing a child's access to learning. Big Brothers Big Sisters in New York City's ability to pivot during this time to meet these needs would not be possible without the support of City Council and our community stakeholders. Because of this support, our growing number of college and career success participants can navigate through an already difficult transition. More than 85% of our youth who were matched with a mentor prior to the pandemic remain matched today. Volunteers continue to join us in driving mentorship forward. It is important to support programs dependent on this funding. It is imperative that the New York City Council restores the full funding of our organization and all programs that provide essential services to our city's youth to ensure they thrive and are set up for success. We must recommit to not make cuts. Time expired. Investing in New York City's future leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to this panel. That concludes the testimony for this panel. The next panel that we will hear from is Natasha Mir from the Center for Supportive Schools, Kevin DeHill Fuchel, Counseling in Schools, and Marion White, the New York Foundling. Following this panel, we will hear from Kimberly Olson, the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable, Maeve Montalvo, the Museum of the City of New York, Patrick Rowe, the Bronx Museum of the Arts, and Paulette Healy. So we will first turn to Natasha Mir. Time starts now. Good afternoon and thank you to the Council's Committee on Education for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Natasha Mir and I am a Senior Community Schools Director at the Center for Supportive Schools. Our organization is the lead community-based organization for 20 community schools across New York City and I work with our community schools in Brooklyn and Queens. I also served as a school-based community school director myself at IS349, a middle school in District 32 in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn. Though we celebrate the restoration of the remaining $3.1 million of the original $9.2 million fiscal year 2021 cuts to the city's community schools initiative, the initiative still faces a devastating $9.2 million cut for fiscal year 2022. This comes after the mayor and chancellor's announcement in December of an expansion to the initiative to bring 27 new community schools online by the fall. As part of this expansion, we call on the city to fully restore baseline funding for the community schools initiative for fiscal year 2022. We believe that community schools are the path forward to ensure students' needs are being taken care of and addressed during this crisis and beyond. Make no mistake, however, that we have long believed that every school should be a community school even before the pandemic. If students are coming to their classes hungry, living in temporary housing, receiving inadequate mental or physical health care, or are dealing with social, emotional, or economic hardships exacerbated by this pandemic, it will only be that much harder to focus on academics. The community school strategy addresses those barriers by learning to partner with community-based organizations like CSS in holistic and innovative ways. During the course of the pandemic in our CSS community schools in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, we have responded in ways that we never expected or imagined from setting up emergency food and supplies pantries, to delivering groceries to students' homes, to providing resources for internet access, employment, immigration relief, and bereavement, our community school directors are reaching as many families as they possibly can during these trying times. Time expired. 
working through significant challenges to ensure that students and families have adequate access to not only remote learning, but also teletherapy and individualized mentoring and tutoring supports has also been a very critical aspect of our work over this past year. Community schools can lead the city through an equitable trauma-informed recovery process that will be responsive to community concerns and will center students' social emotional well-being as well as their short and long-term academic success. Fully funding the community schools initiative in New York City for fiscal year 22 is vital to students recovering from the trauma and learning losses of this crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we will hear from Kevin. I'm starts now. Thank you, Chairman Traeger, uh, education committee members and all council members present. I'm the executive director of Counseling in Schools, a CBO that supports the education of over 7,000 students, their family members and supports teachers and school staff uh, in over 70 locations throughout the city. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and have worked with Counseling in Schools over the past 27 years. Among the work we do is to lead uh, the community school strategy in 12 schools and provide subcontracted mental health supports for 10 other community schools. I speak here today as a member uh, as a as member of the steering committee of the Coalition for Community School Excellence and speak to lift up the need to fully fund this strategy. It is important to appreciate that community schools advance an education strategy rather than implement a program. This important difference is seen in the mission-driven participation of CBOs like Counseling in Schools, Center for Supportive Schools, Good Shepherd Services, and others, which provide on-the-ground staff who relate to, connect with, and stand with students, their families, and school staff in all that they experience. We were there before the pandemic, and we did not relinquish our connection during. In the face of budget cuts on city and state level, and through significant funding delays, we have been there. While I am proud of our work, it is unfair and unjust that our successful work uh, continues to force us to look over our shoulders for funding and to continue to fight and advocate for an equitable distribution of funds for students and families who uh, historically do with less. I call on the council to return the full funding to the community school strategy to pre-pandemic levels. And as the strategy expands to more schools, that this funding be baseline to recognize the support that the strategy provides towards an equitable education for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Marion White, the New York foundling. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Marion White and I'm here on behalf of the Child Abuse Prevention Program of the New York foundling. The foundling is one of New York City's oldest and largest uh, nonprofit providers of human services and our Child Abuse Prevention Program, CAP, educates thousands of children each year about their right to personal safety. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Chairman Traeger and the committee members for their unwavering, for their unwavering commitment to our community's children. For the past two years, CAP has been allocated a generous grant of $248,000 from the Initiative to Combat Sexual Assault, which was crucial to our ability to prevent abuse from occurring and from going unreported. The foundling has requested renewed funding for CAP to address the ongoing threat of child abuse at this critical moment in our community. Changes necessitated by the pandemic have left tremendous stress on families and strained family relationships. This places children at serious risk. Just last week, 10-year-old Aiden Wolf was killed at home by an abusive family member. Increased online activity has also created a dangerous opportunity for internet predators. At the same time, children were cut off from teachers and other mandated reporters who are on the front lines of detecting and reporting abuse to the authorities. CAP is designed to help third and fourth grade children recognize situations that may be abusive and assure children that they have the right to seek help from a trusted adult if they experience abuse. Our program uses relatable child-sized puppets to discuss safe, unsafe, and confusing touches. And after the workshop, and this is important, children have the opportunity to stay and speak one-on-one -on -one with a trained counselor or our prevention specialist who present the program. This year, while we've been doing it remotely, we have breakout rooms from Google Meet or from Zoom where the children can seamlessly speak to the school counselor about any concerns that they have. And they're also given an activity- Time expired. If they would like to speak privately with the counselors. 
In cases where a child uh, shares a serious case of abuse, our team of prevention specialists are trained to respond appropriately and work hand in hand with schools to make reports to either the state central registry or law enforcement. We look forward to continuing our partnership with schools and with the city council to prevent abuse from continuing unreported in our community as we emerge from this crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes the testimony for this panel. I'd like to thank this panel. Um, the next panel that we're going to call, which has an addition, uh, Liz Ackles from the Community Food Advocates, Kimberly Olson, New York City Arts and Education Roundtable, Maeve Montalvo, Museum of the City of New York, Patrick Rowe, the Bronx Museum of the Arts, and Paulette Healy. Following this panel, we will hear from Lainey Hameson, Class Size Matters, Karen Sproul, Class Size Matters, and Rebecca Cook Mack. We will go ahead and start with Liz Ackles. Time starts now. Thank you, um, Chair Traeger and members of the committee. Um, thanks for the opportunity to testify. I'm Liz Ackles with the Community Food Advocates and also representing the Lunch for Learning campaign. Um, as you know, uh, the Lunch for Learning campaign uh, worked with the council closely to get universal free school lunch. And I'm here to talk about what we think is the next significant um, building block to go on top of uh, the foundation of universal free school lunch. And that's the cafeteria redesign that was uh, talked about earlier uh, by Councilwoman Gibson. Um, we think the cafeteria redesign model that makes um, food court style um, cafeteria environments, serving lines more friendly, welcoming to students and addresses two of the biggest barriers to school food participation, and that is food appeal and cafeteria, cafeteria environment. It makes it more like a college, a college cafeteria setting. As Karen Goldmark spoke to earlier, there's significantly higher participation in schools with cafeteria redesign and four times more fruits and vegetables served. And yes, the students do love it. It's highly cost-effective at about 500,000. It's a, a capital budget project. $500,000 per school. Although there is pre-planning, it's done over a weekend. And we are calling for the scaling up of the cafeteria redesign um, over five years, $150 million investment in the capital plan to be rolled out to half high schools and half middle schools over five years. We, we hope to have the council support in this and thank you for your time. Thank you. And next we will hear from Kimberly Olson, the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Traeger and the Committee on Education for your leadership and commitment to our students. My name is Kimberly Olson and I come to you today as the Executive Director of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable. The Roundtable is a service organization who builds our efforts around the values that arts are essential and that arts education is a right for all New York City students. Our 120 plus member organizations have worked in longstanding partnership with the DOE to ensure that every child has access to quality arts learning. As the city begins to rebuild and envision a post-pandemic era, it's imperative that we invest in arts education as part of the city's recovery process. The long-term impact of COVID-19 on students and schools will take years to understand. However, the trauma, systemic racism, and lost instructional times are stark realities that students now face in the classroom every day. The need for investment and equity in arts ed access comes when the need for arts in our schools has never been so clear. Studies show that participation in arts education translates to the development of social emotional learning skills like self-management, self-discipline, and relationship building. Students participating in the arts also, um, it leads to higher levels of social tolerance and civic engagement. We understand the tremendous financial impact that COVID has had on our schools and the city, yet this lack of investment in arts ed has been recurrent. Prior to the pandemic, 67% of principals noted that funding for the arts is generally insufficient according to the Arts and Schools Report data. Now, this current school year, 22% of certified arts teachers are spending more than half their time teaching a different subject area. 
And we've also lost a 70% cut to arts services, including cuts to arts partnership grants that directly serve students with disabilities and multilingual learners via partnership with arts, education, arts and cultural organizations. We believe equity and excellence in education means universal access to the arts. With that in mind, the city must restore the 70% cuts to arts services. Make Time the expired. Make the supplemental funding through fair student funding SAMA requirement and prioritize funding the Office of Arts and Special Projects Strategic Arts Plan. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Maeve Montalvo. Time starts now. Chair Traeger and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Maeve Montalvo. I am a native New Yorker and proud Bronx resident and a product of New York City Public Schools. And I am also now Director of Education at the Museum of the City of New York. I am here to provide testimony on the value of cultural institutions for educational services and to advocate for funding in the FY22 budget so that we can continue to be of service to the city. The Museum of the City of New York is one of 33 organizations within the CIG, the Cultural Institutions Group, that are located on city-owned land or in city-owned buildings. Throughout the pandemic, CIGs have remained committed to providing free offerings for nearly 10 million individuals, many of them seniors, school children, or members of other communities particularly hard hit by the pandemic and ensuing isolation. At the Museum of the City of New York, we engage learners in, of all ages in examining the city's past so that we may understand the present and envision our roles in shaping the future. This year, we launched free culturally responsive and sustaining education programming to support our city's students and teachers. Examining equity in NYC features historic examples of how New Yorkers have faced past crises and fought for justice, from New York's major role in the Black freedom movement to the fights for educational equity and accessible healthcare to LGBTQ activism so that students can see themselves and their communities represented in the curriculum. For years, we've partnered with the DOE Social Studies Department to produce the Hidden Voices Project, a curriculum supplement that honors the innumerable people who are often hidden from the traditional historical record, who have shaped and continue to shape our history and identity. People like Wang Ching Fu, a Chinese American man who in 1874 became one of the first people of Chinese descent to gain American citizenship and who in the face of the United States State government's Chinese Exclusion Act founded the Chinese Equal Rights League to advocate for the Chinese American community and assert that Chinese Americans deserve equal rights and treatment. I'm expired. We honor and recognize him. In this moment of trauma, cultural institutions across the city are providing responsive, representative, and yes, even joyful learning experiences. We can be partners in creating equitable education environments for all of our city's students. We are grateful for the council's continued support of culture and the arts over the years. And at a minimum, we ask that the cultural budget be held harmless and maintained at FY21 levels as we await further information so that we can continue to be key partners and players in service of our city's students. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Patrick Rowe from the Bronx Museum of the Arts. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Patrick Rowe. I'm director of education at the Bronx Museum of the Arts. Bronx Museum is a member of the Cultural Institutions Group, a coalition of 34 cultural institutions who share a public-private partnership with the city. We are located in all five boroughs and collectively employ over 11,000 individuals. Founded in 1971, the Bronx Museum is the only contemporary art museum in the borough. Since 2012, we have offered a free admission policy to eliminate barriers to entry and ensure communities who are under-resourced have unlimited access to arts and culture. One year ago in March 2020, we shifted priorities and worked to deliver free virtual arts education programs and resources to K-12 students and families under the umbrella, the Bronx Museum at Home. To ensure our students and families in all of our programs can fully participate, we offer free high quality art materials for pickup at the Bronx Museum or at our partner schools. Our school partnerships have remained strong. For example, our 14 year partnership with PS73 in the Highbridge neighborhood of the South Bronx has continued through live streamed art instruction with over 400 students. We've also continued our CASA after-school partnership with PS73, as well as our Art A Catalyst for Change programs at four partner schools, all supported by the council. These are, these are just some of the many art education programs the Bronx Museum has committed to provide to students the past year. The city council's unwavering support of culture, cultural institutions and our work as arts partners to New York City Public Schools has made this work possible and we are very grateful. The CIGs have contributed to the public service of New Yorkers throughout COVID and collectively spent $2 million to ensure New Yorkers have continued access to quality virtual programming. These free offerings reach nearly 10 million individuals, many of them seniors, school children, and communities hard hit by the pandemic. 
We are grateful for the council's support and ask that the, that the essential arts education programs, our institution, the other CIGs, the cultural community at large have mounted this past year, continue to remain viable to New York City students and families who have come to rely on our offerings. We also ask that the cultural budget be held harmless and maintained at FY21 levels as we await further information on COVID federal relief that may be made available to the city and state. Thank you. Time expired. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Paulette Healy. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Well, Lucas just wanted to say hi real quick, uh, Councilman Traeger. <laughs> hey, Councilman Traeger, and thank you for your support. It is so great to see you, and it's thank you so much for being here. And I, and I think I saw a pretty cool picture of a recent adventure that, that uh, were you in a nice uh, hike or nice uh, traveling recently? Um, no, it's, it's all virtual. Yep. <laughs> all he's, become, he's, been, he's become quite the master at green screening and Photoshop, so. Yep. Well, he, he got me and I, <laughs> you have to teach me how to do that because I, I still don't know how to. So <laughs> it, it, is, it is so great, great to see you. It, it, it's such a pleasure. Please, the floor is all yours. Okay. Well, I actually took him away from after school today, so he won't be testifying today, but he will at the next hearing. So yeah. thanks, buddy. Um, thank you again for providing this platform for um, parents to be able to elevate the concerns that we're having within our community. Um, I wanted to um, just uh, uh, refer to the testimonies and elevate everything that our fellow community advocates, Randy, Lori, Maggie, Chris, Ellen, and my sister Rashida um, has said about um, the challenges that our uh, vulnerable children have been having this entire time during COVID uh, with special emphasis on prioritizing funding to uh, pre-K for students with um, disabilities, our students attending 4410 schools and special supports for our students that are aging out. Um, in the testimony that I've submitted, um, I did refer to healing centered schools and the healing centered approach um, throughout our entire city in terms of addressing not only the quote unquote achievement gap and learning loss that our children are facing, but also how to talk to our children through their grief. Um, earlier this week, I sat in an IEP meeting um, of a parent who was time pleading expired. for- The clock thing. didn't start at the right time, so go ahead. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, earlier this week, I attended a, an IEP meeting with a parent who was asking for counseling services for her daughter because she was struggling with grief and loss. She had lost over 10 people in her family from COVID. And um, she was struggling with her, with her studies and uh, was not consistent with her attendance. And the school, psychiatrist, school psychologist told the parent that in order for her child to receive counseling, she would need to be classified as an emotionally disturbed student. This is unacceptable, especially with the, the citywide grief we are all suffering from with all of the loss of our colleagues, our teachers, our paras, our family members. This is, this is not how we want our students to be welcomed back into the building. So healing centered schools need to be done now, they need to be done quickly, and they need to be done system wide. Also, in terms of um, school construction authority, they have time and time again have not prioritized D75 accommodations in their newly built buildings, which is a travesty considering all of these new buildings will be in line to ADA accessibility, and they are not prioritizing the students that need it the most. Whenever we've had these conversations with SCA, it's always told to us that it's too hard or it's going to take away from the other kids. Well, our students with disabilities are our kids and they have not been prioritized. They should not have to continue being bussed out of their communities in order to continue their, their education. We are only getting a, a high school, a new high school uh, setting in Brooklyn as of now in District 16 centrally for all of our Brooklyn D75 students to go to. And that is unacceptable. They should be able to go to a school within blocks of where they live. Lastly, I wanted to emphasize what um, Maggie had said about lifting the hiring freeze to allow um, hiring of more social workers, more behavioral specialists, and more guidance counselors, because we need to make sure that all of these 
um, all of these stakeholders are in place in order to properly transition our kids back into the schools. And we need to reinstate our ENL teachers who have been excised because of compliance. Did you know that because of the accommodations made during COVID, the compliance rates are going up because if you put an ICT child into a class of 60 or more, that is considered being in compliance. If you provide related services once to a family, that is considered compliance. If you have a content teacher with an extension in ESL, that fulfills ELL compliance and therefore can demote ESL teachers that are specified in culturally responsive uh, um, ENL instruction to be demoted to paras, teachers assistants, school aides, or excise altogether. We need to prioritize those who are experts in their field to address the supports that need to, that need that our children with learning challenges need. Lastly, I just wanted to say I stand in support of all of our youth who came out to speak against um, uh, further policing and to ask for police free schools, because as a city, we cannot continue to fully fund NYPD at the expense of our schools and our students. Thank you so much for the time. I, I thank you and uh, I, I, I would be happy to get a lesson uh, on how to create beautiful great virtual backgrounds because I, I am so jealous because you, you, you travel to new places all the time. And I, I just, Chris, I want to thank you. Also, um, if the parent would like, the parent that was told that, that outrageous thing uh, about, uh, if, if, if they could maybe email me uh, what happened in school details, I'd be happy to follow up uh, with DOE directly. Um, in any case like that, please bring it to my attention because that, that really is outrageous. And again, thank you so much. I truly appreciate that, your, your time. Thank you. Thank you, and that concludes testimony for this panel. The next panel that we will hear from will be Lainey Hameson, Class Size Matters, Karen Sproul, Class Size Matters, Rebecca Cook Mack, and Fatima Gaidi. The panel after this one will be Marcus Romero, Oswald Velasquez, Kia Duncan, reading for Aisha Ijaz, Alyssa Figueroa, and Kate McDonough. We will start with Lainey Hameson. Time starts now. Thank you for holding these budget hearings today, Chair Traeger. <clears throat> Sorry. My name is Lainey Hameson. I'm the Executive Director of Class Size Matters. We are advocating for $1 billion out of the estimated $2.5 billion in federal funds from the American Rescue Plan to be used next year and the year after to lower class size, which is specifically mentioned in the law as a priority for these funds for the sake of a safer and more positive learning environment. That amount could pay for the salaries of about 10,000 new teachers, which could reduce class size in as many as 40,000 classrooms, as adding a new teacher lowers class size for all the other students in the school in the same grade or subject. In addition, we propose that the DOA hire more than 1,000 more school counselors and about 1,500 more social workers, which would increase the number of these positions to one for every 250 students, the recommended guidelines for these professions. This would cost another 365 million, which would still leave over 1 billion of these federal funds for other uses. If New York City children ever needed smaller classes, they will need them more than ever next year to make up for the myriad losses they have suffered over the course of the last year and the inherent deficiencies of remote learning. Even in normal times, research shows smaller classes lead to better outcomes for all kids and more engagement, especially for those who need the help the most. There is now enough funding for this and there's no possible excuse for not doing it. Moreover, the need for smaller classes for the sake of social distancing is clear. According to most experts, it's very unlikely that younger children will have been vaccinated by next fall. Even with three feet of social distancing, the current guidelines of the CDC, we estimate that most New York City students will not be able to attend school daily. A standard classroom is defined by DOE as 500 to 750 square feet, and only about 20 students can fit into a 500 square foot classroom, and about 25 in a 750 square foot room. Charts showing how many kids would be able to fit in these rooms are in my written testimony. During the 2019-2020 school year, 58% of elementary schools students, 74% of middle school students, and 81% of high school students were in classes of 20 or more, and more than a third of elementary school students, nearly two-thirds of middle school students, and 70% high school students would not fit in classrooms of 750 square feet. Just one more issue to add. In October, Chair Traeger, you wrote a letter to DOE urging them to report to 
disaggregated class size data by the legal deadline of November 15th in different categories for in-person learning versus blended versus remote, since many parents and teachers had complained of huge remote online classes. To this day, the DOE has not provided any disaggregated data, even though they had access to that information since October. And I very much hope you will continue to demand that they provide it. Thank you so much. Well, and Laney, I, I will go a step further and say that uh, I was not uh, particularly pleased or with the inadequate answers today about class size uh, from DOE. It's a question I ask every, uh, every new, new chancellor and uh, I'm not sure if we got a clear answer. And, you know, I, uh, I deeply, it, and again, I value your work, Laney. You've been on this from the beginning uh, but I also speak from personal experience about the impact on class size being working in a classroom. It does make a difference. And, and this is a proven strategy. This is not, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. It's a proven strategy that it does improve outcome, outcomes um, and it needs to be seen um, as, a, as a priority. And this is gonna require greater investments to hire more teachers and to uh, make sure that we build that additional space and you've been on this. So I just wanna publicly thank you, Laney for always highlighting this need, Pro a proven strategy. We don't have to have a study or a theory class on it. It's a proven strategy. So I wanna publicly thank you, Lainey, for that. Yeah, I, I thank you so much, uh, Chair Traeger. I think this year, less than any other year in my long um, history of advocating for this issue, we have no excuse. The money is absolutely there. And um, if we are ever going to reduce class size, uh, next year is the year to do it. I was disappointed as well by the chancellor's testimony where she said, this is a contractual issue. It is a contractual issue, but it is also an issue in terms of affording all the kids in the city to a truly equitable education. And I think um, the previous chancellor was pretty forthright about this. And I was disappointed that, that the new chancellor wasn't as well. Yeah, and, and in, clo in closing that uh, the painful stories I've heard about classes going to 60 kids virtually um, ICT classes, which, which, you know, again, speaking of mandates have to be lower, uh, going to 40, 50 kids, there is no way, that is not education. That is called crisis management at, at its worst, but that is not education. So thank you, Amy, for thank piling you. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Karen Sproul. Time starts now. Am I unmuted? Yes. Can yes. you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Chair Traeger. You know, we love you. You have been an ally for us for many, for a long time. And I just appreciate you really do. So I just want to put a personal spin on and reinforce what Lainey has said. Um, uh, first of all, my name is Karen Sprawl. And I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon. Uh, I'm the mother of three with one school age son with special needs. Um, together, we all have attended New York City public schools in every decade since the 1960s. But it wasn't until 2007 when my youngest child entered kindergarten that I became deeply involved with public education advocacy. I'm also here to provide testimony on behalf of New York City Kids PAC, which is a political action committee that myself, that includes myself and parent leaders from all five boroughs that informs electorates and support candidates for office who have demonstrated a commitment to improving our public schools. I'm here to advocate for $1 billion. I know that's a big number, but hear me out. Uh, the more, more of the more than $2 billion that city schools will receive in both the next two years to spend on lowering class size both for the sake of safety and social distancing, but also to improve the education that New York City children receive. We know from countless, as you just mentioned, countless research studies that lowering class size leads to enormous health and economic benefits, which we would desperately need after this. We, as well as substantial savings, and most importantly, it enhances the chances of successful academic outcomes, especially for disadvantaged children like my son. When my son entered kindergarten in 2007, he was first enrolled in a charter school that pushed him out saying that they could only provide for him they could not provide the smaller class size that he needed. And public school that he was transferred to, he was fortunate enough to be put in a classroom with only 20 kids. His class size remained between 18 and 23 throughout third grade, despite the difficulty learning challenges that he faced with ADHD. Time expired. Thrived. He thrived during those years, both 
in general and inclusion classes. At one point, he was well above grade level and the teacher suggested that we apply to the gifted program. I'm gonna to jump to my last paragraph, just hear me out. Um, uh, 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 at the same time, the number of public school students diagnosed with having special needs have increased rapidly to more than 224,000 at the cost of $2 billion annually. Yet nearly a quarter of these students with disabilities do not receive all of their mandated services. I am convinced that fewer children would be diagnosed with special needs in the first place if class sizes were smaller. I would like to suggest to the DOE that city council the following, the city allocate at least $1 billion to lower class sizes, which will likely save millions more on special education costs for private placements. We also support the proposal to spend $365 million for additional counselors, social workers, which would leave at least a billion dollars of federal funds for other uses. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you and next. Next, we'll hear from Rebecca Cook-Mack, followed by Fatima uh, Gady. Uh, Rebecca? Time starts now. Hi, um, I'm the parent of two public school students and I also attended New York City public schools myself. Thank you for holding this hearing and for you know, listening to, to so many people for so long today. This system is critically important to my family and countless others, yet for far too long, our schools have been underfunded. At my wonderful school, we fundraise for arts, science, music, and basic school supplies, paper. This should not be. This underfunding is a policy choice. It is one that this city has made and it drives inequity. We can do better. Um, we've been given an opportunity to invest in our schools. We should seize it. The city should commit to making at least half of the estimated 2.25 to $2.6 billion of federal rescue funds available for hiring teachers that are chosen by schools. This money should be used to support teaching and reduce class sizes. The pandemic has revealed just how overcrowded our classrooms have been for years. Um, research shows that, and, and you've heard others, others talk about, smaller class sizes lead to better outcomes for all kids. They result in better grades, certainly more engaged students, fewer disciplinary refer, uh, referrals, and less teacher turnover. Class size matters. As a parent, I see it. This year has made that so clear. And it's time to say enough to the inequitable system that has meant small class sizes available to only those with extra funds to support them or at private schools. We can do better. The city should champion longstanding advocacy by groups like AQE and embrace the campaign for fiscal equity to hold Albany accountable for fully funding our schools. We should invest now with these federal dollars and we should fight for what our kids deserve from the state we should have a student funding formula that doesn't disinvest in our schools. And I'm, let me finish up real quickly. Not one penny of these funds should be spent on standardized testing. We test too much. Not one cent should be spent on policing our schools. They are over-policed. And not a single penny should be spent on the ridiculous contract that the DOE is pursuing to do a survey of wellness of our students when they return. Teachers, will meet the children and figure out what the kids need and we should invest in teachers. As Congressman Jamal Bowman has argued, and he is right, this is the perfect time to lower class sizes when we return to schools. These federal recovery funds should be spent on classroom teachers. Schools should given, be given a flexibility in determining who to hire and class sizes should be reduced for all. Thank you very much for having this hearing. Thank you. And finally, we'll hear from Fatima. Time starts now. Uh, hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Fatima Getty. Um, I have two children that are in public schools. One is in the first grade and one is in high school. Um, I am speaking to ask you to allocate funding towards class size reduction, especially when schools go back to normal, um, whatever that means. Uh, but too often what is considered normal in New York City 
is not good enough. My oldest son has ADHD and IEP. He has been in ICT classes since he was in the fourth grade. He was supposed to have them in the first grade, but he went to Success Academy and they never gave it to him until we went to public school. Um, these classes are way too large and they always have been. Um, and we're unable to provide him with the atten attention he needs, even with two teachers. Um, sometimes he would get alone time in elementary school and they would have to go into the closet. Um, with 28 or 30 more students, his classes are too crowded, too noisy, and too distracting. Uh, stimulation is not overstimulating. A child with ADHD is not conducive uh, for learning at all, and it's a known fact. Um, it would be far better if they split the classes in half and put two, uh, 15 students in each. As a mother, I'm often overwhelmed with just two children on my own, so I can't imagine how this feels uh, for adults, even if they had training uh, with 30 kids. Um, with these massive classes, it's impossible for teachers to provide the quiet atmosphere my son needs or other children need to focus. This is especially difficult as some of the other students in the class may act out or um, be disruptive because they're overstimulated themselves. Um, but I don't blame the students um, because that's normal, you know? Um, what I do blame is the fact that these classes continue to grow and they're overcrowded. Um, I'm also concerned about sending my children back to school next fall, unvaccinated, given uh, the COVID crisis to be Time sure. Expired. I'm almost finished, sorry. Um, uh, and then they're going to cram them all back together. This is the first time, sadly, that my son has been able to get one-on-one -on -one, uh, attention uh, because less kids are showing up uh, because of lack of access to the internet. So he gets more one-on-one -on -one time. When he was in school, he would have to stay after school to get one-on-one -on -one time, even with teachers in the classroom. I support class size matters in the effort to allocate $1 billion of federal funds for reducing class size next year, both for social distancing and to provide my sons and other children with the attention they need to achieve academically and give them a better chance to succeed in their lives and future careers. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes the panel for this testimony. That, that concludes the testimony for this panel. Uh, the next panel that we will hear from is uh, Marcos Romero, Oswald Velasquez, Kia Duncan, Alyssa Figueroa, and Kate McDonough. Following that panel, we will hear from Chauncey Young, Griselle Cardona, Renette Summers, Chaplain Sandra Mitchell, Jennifer Stewart, and Tanisha Grant. We will start with Marcus Romero. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Marcus Romero. I'm a part of Sisters and Brothers United. I'm currently a sophomore at LaGuardia High School of the Arts and live in Council District 12. Let me take you back to of June 6 of 2020. In the midst of the Black Lives Matter protests and unrest, I performed my first ever speech with others on the steps of Tweed, where we call for justice and countless who have been killed and harmed by the police of our country. And more specifically, called for a fraction of the police budget to be repurposed to help out schools, to help out committees, to help out the dreamers of New York, not to limit schools, oppress communities, and prevent treatment of dreamers as a delusion. We call for the complete removal of police from our schools, and you can cannot believe my reaction the next day where a statement was released where the city of New York was going to repurpose the budget to help everyone instead of just the police. But then I waited. I waited. And I waited. At the end of a tiring budget process, the council voted on a budget that would transfer the school safety division, aka school cops, from NYPD to DOE, and we were devastated. Our vision for police-free schools was already being co-opted by a false and harmful vision for real school safety. Fast forward some more here. We are on March 2020, 2022, 2021. After finding out there were plans for the city to continue to funnel money into the school budget, specifically to 475 new school safety officers in schools, the MTA is soon shutting down services and the police is now getting robot dogs. So just tell me why... Do I continue to find myself yet again calling to the council to what's best for students? Why is this so difficult? Our visions for schools is that we would dismantle school policing fractures, culture and practice, ending school militarization and surveillance, and building a new liberatory education system. This vision can be possible if the city council will simply make bold decisions that make our budget reflect the things time we expired. I yield my time. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And next we'll hear from Oswald Velasquez. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. My name is Osvaldo Velasquez. I'm from the Bronx, currently attending to college, and I would like to talk about a huge problem we have at hand. Um, we have non-necessity for police in our schools. It is very unreasonable for Mayor de Blasio to spend um, $20 million to hire 475 school cops. Um, how many times do we need to cry for help? We are not okay. We don't. We need to be nurtured and guided through these difficult times. We must make room for trained professionals and mental health and RJ and conflict resolution and anti-violence work. Uh, Mayor de Blasio will fail us once again if he moves forward with a plan to keep and not more police in our schools and communities. This money can be invested in hiring more guidance counselors throughout New York City uh, schools. Um, currently, the major has cut seven hundred million dollars from this year's um, education budget. New York City itself already spent four hundred and fifty million dollars on school cops. We have more school cops um, than guidance counselors and social workers combined together. That should tell you something. Uh, why do we need more school cops? There is no legit evidence of the effectiveness of, of cops in helping us thrive in schools. Um, we cannot ignore the fact that um, police have acted in valiant ways in schools. Um, there is the existence of police is violence and transferring them to a different department will not change nothing about the harm that they had caused to students. Um, New York City cops have been reported from time to time to verbally, physically, and sexually abuse young um, people under their power. As long as there is cops in school, I don't feel safe. It's neglect to have them involved in supporting or assisting any mental health related circumstances. Um, last time expired. Lastly, please don't send the message to black and brown students that New York City rather police us than invest in our education and future. Please stand in solidarity and push for police, free schools. Thank you. No more cops in schools. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Kia Duncan. Time starts now. Hi, reading for Kia Duncan, who's reading for Aisha. Hi, my name is Aisha Ajaz, youth participant with Future Tomorrow at Urban Youth Collaborative. I am 16 years old and from New York City. Firstly, I'm honored to give my testimony about our school policing system. I'm here to speak out against the DOE transfer and any additional funds for recruitment and placement of scouts in our schools. As a high school student, I have seen that our schools are missing out on so many facilities that are really needed by the students, while we spend so much money on policing. This prevents other facilities from being provided to students and teachers. Schools are institutions dedicated to students, teachers, and education. Therefore, that's where most of our funding should, should go. Um, our, my school is full of needy students who may come from poor and not so supportive backgrounds. Dealing with family issues on a daily basis affect our mental health, um, our grade performance, and our attendance rates. I understand that there's a difference between safety and security. When I first attended Franklin Plain Lane campus, the first people I encountered at the front desk were cops and the equipment uh, and equipment that did not resemble what I understood to be a school environment. As a person of color, what would make me feel safe are, is more funding for mental health, as well as more funding for youth activities and spaces where youth voices are amplified. Our schools need more laptops, calculators, and other technological products, not hand-me-downs. We need more teachers and after-school help for students. At Franklin Plain Lane, I have no art teacher, only one Spanish teacher, and minimal access to college programs and facilities. All this can change if we increase the school funding by, by, by investing in the school safety division uh, and honor the demands of the police free schools movement. Why do we have 5,245 school safety agents in our New York City public schools? How can we justify the need for security when students are suffering from um, inner mentor dangers which can lead to suicide? Why is the city planning on spending $20 million to hire 475 new school cops while the mayor continues to cut funding from public education? Do we care more about policing bodies than we do about the safety, the well being of students? The Urban Youth Collaborative is requesting a significant reduction in the NYPD school safety division budget, which is vastly funded by the Department of Education, Time as well expired. as increased funding for support staff and resources in our schools. We must not confuse the message of police free schools. More funding should be allocated for the well being of students. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Alyssa Figueroa. Time starts now. 
Hi, my name is Alyssa Figueroa, and I'm the coalition coordinator of the Urban Youth Collaborative. The Urban Youth Collaborative is a coalition made up of youth leaders from across the city. We have worked together since 2004 to fight for racial and social justice in schools. I'm testifying today on behalf of this coalition in favor of re reallocating the school policing budget from the school safety division and invasive security measures to creating a new paradigm for safety by investing in social, emotional, and mental health supports for underfunded and marginalized school communities. The movement for police-free schools in New York City and across the country is not just about what we are removing from schools. It is about what we are adding to schools. We want to add the support staff and resources students need to address the whole student. We want to add guidance counselors, restorative justice coordinators, nurses, school psychologists, social workers, and programming that creates a nurturing learning environment. New York City should have police-free schools because school policing is racist. School policing has a racist history born out of resistance of, to integration in the 1960s. It was, is, and always will be racist. And we see the effects of this racist legacy play out today. Black and Latinx students in New York City make up 90% of all youth arrests, issued summons, and juvenile reports. New York City should have police-free schools because school policing also makes schools less safe. To date, there has been no substantial evidence that school cops make schools safer. Instead, it just feeds Black and Latinx youth into the school-to-prison pipeline. Experiencing a, an arrest for the first time in high school nearly doubles the odds of a student dropping out. A court appearance nearly quadruples those odds. New York City should have police-free schools because school policing also wastes money. Students need supportive staff and programs, especially right now, and yet the city continues to spend $450 million on school cops. $450 million funded over a decade's worth of restorative justice programs in schools. Intro 2211 and any other plan to transfer school cops from the NYPD to the Department of Education does not change these facts. Instead, it just invests precious funds into new school policing infrastructure, further entrenching the criminalization of Black and Latinx students. And spending $20 million to hire new school cops is a slap in the face. $20 million could hire 224 social workers, 208 school psychologists, or 197 guidance counselors. These positions are what students have been calling for and now more than ever as they attempt to learn and live through a global pandemic. The city should permanently prohibit hiring any new school cops. The city is pushing a false narrative that dismantling the school policing division means mass layoffs. This narrative irresponsibly hides a legacy of school-based police violence behind shallow arguments of economic justice. A true concern for economic justice would mean fighting to end a policing system that by design displaces Black and Latinx students from their schools, uh, com compromising their employment trajectories. This narrative also avoids any accountability from the city for its lack of investment in accessible pathways to employment in the public service sector, while instead pouring billions into the creation of jobs that criminalize people of color. We call on council members to stop using this false argument as an excuse for inaction. Numerous cities have already taken to completely removing police from schools. New York City needs police-free schools and we need them now. We urge you to reject the transfer of school cops between departments, block the hiring of any new school police, and instead invite you to work on real solutions that make New York City a more equitable place to live, learn, and grow. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Kate McDonough. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, my name is Kate McDonough. I'm the Coalition Director for Dignity in Schools Campaign New York, which is a coalition of over 20 New York City-based organizations consisting of students, parents, educators, and advocates who all work for education justice and ending the school to prison pipeline. Um, I was in eighth grade at an under-resourced school in the Bronx with no windows when the NYPD took over school policing. Um, I don't really have words for what it feels like to work with young people who weren't even born when that decision happened and to be calling for something radically different. Um, I don't even know if I have the words to fully address the pain of having their visions um, not be taken seriously, to be having their pain be overlooked when we propose bills like intro 2211. Um, and I think it's important to note that young people did not create this system. 
um, and that we owe them better and we can do better and we can create something that actually invests in supportive, well-paying jobs that care for young people. So with that, um, I will use the rest of my time to sit in silence in support of all of our youth leaders who've been calling for so long, for many decades for police-free schools and hope that we actually get there. Time expired. And that concludes testimony for this panel. Thank you to that panel. Next, we will be calling up Chauncey Young, Griselle Cardona, Ronette Summers, Chaplain Sandra Mitchell, Jennifer Stewart, and Tanisha Grant. Following that panel, we will be calling up Anthony Tassi, Lisa Schwartzwald, Daryl Hornick Becker, Leah Van Halsema and Lena Billick. We will start with Chauncey Young. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Chauncey Young, a Bronx parent in District 9 and the director of the New Settlement Parent Action Committee. PAC is a steering committee member of the Healing Centered School Working Group, the Dignity in Schools Coalition, and the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice. PAC has been a leading organization in the equity work in the Bronx and New York City schools for almost 25 years and helped form the Bronx Equity and Access Team that we co-facilitate with then Executive Superintendent Misha Ross Porter, bringing together all Bronx districts, parents, student leaders to work for a more equitable Bronx community. First, although it was not mentioned in today's SCA report with the Bronx and District 9, I would like to thank former SCA president and current COVID-19 czar Lorraine Grillo, interim actor, uh, SCA president Caboto, and council member Gibson and Chancellor Marisha Ross Porter for addressing uh, a demand of the Highbridge community for over 15 years and committing to repair the play yard and rooftop play area of the public school 126. 126 was built as the first project of the New York City Education Construction Fund in 1970, a precursor to the new uh, School Construction Authority. We've worked with the Lorraine Grillo on this project for nearly 10 years, and she made a commitment to funding this project prior to her departure, and she has done so. We thank her and Councilmember Gibson for making this a reality. PAC stands in solidarity with youth advocates across New York City who have long demanded police-free schools and who have been silenced by the DOE. I'm here today to talk about how we can make healing-centered schools a reality. Our working group is determined to create an environment for all students, which is physically, psychologically, and emotionally safe. We know that SEAs and metal detectors do not create safety, but instead often inflict harm on our students, particularly our black, brown, and queer students. Moving SEAs under the leadership of the Department of Education will not change that fact, nor will more training or money. A more supportive school re requires reducing harmful practices and investing in a healing-centered practices and resources for students. Last year, when we heard so many people say they could not support, that we gave that position, and that is our healing-centered school working group roadmap. Please look at the roadmap and help us adopt this as many cities have across the country. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we'll hear from Griselle Cardona. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. My name is Grizel Cardona. I am a single mother of three. I currently reside in the Bronx, specifically in District 9. I wanted to touch base on a few things as a few um, and many of my, um, I'm going to say, colleagues here on this call. Um, let's remember that 85% of the student population is either Latinx, Black, or Asian, and yet there are no comprehensive curriculum and courses that respect or affirm our students. Last time this year, the Department of Education had um, uh, promised to commit to purchase a K through eight culturally responsive curriculum. And sorry for my children in the background, um, but didn't due to COVID. And I'm asking that um, that all do commit, including the Department of Education, um, to commit to this and not wait another year and prolong um, 
because call, being culturally responsive is super important to the, our students um, in the New York City public school system. The other thing I do want to say is that I wanted to thank Council Member Barron on bringing up the um, the talk on social workers and principals being the ones to run the schools. Remember, running the schools. Um, and I say that for a reason. We do need social workers in our schools. It is very difficult um, for one social worker to deal with um, five plus schools in one building. And in the Bronx, we have overcrowded schools. And again, I, I'm so with those on um, class size matters because again, it is too much um, for one person to deal with the whole entire building. Another thing that I wanted to touch on was the students with disabilities. We need to stop leaving them in the back end. Our kids are, are very much as, just as important as others um, in the New York City public school system. I have a son in D75, my other son in CSE and my daughter in District 9, they all have IEPs. So please let's invest money in our students because they will fill your seats. In, in I'm the expired. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Ronette Summers. Time starts now. Ronette, you should see a ask on your screen to accept the unmute. Okay, we can come back. Uh, let's uh, call on Chaplain Sandra Mitchell. Time starts now. Can you hear me? Yes, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you so very much. Um, my name is Chaplain Sandra Mitchell. I am a mental health advocate and mental illness and substance misuse counselor and a proud member of the Parent Action Committee and the, collaborate, and the Collaborative, which includes but not limited to Dignity in Schools and the Healing Center Schools Working Group. I wanna thank you, Chair and Council Member Traeger for being a champion for our youth and community schools and safety and the safety and well-being of our children and fighting valiantly while you were a public school teacher yourself and also generational your, 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 your dad uh, for safe school climate and tackling the budget in order to make sure that we have the have equity in the next necessary schools necessary tools that our children deserve to attain an excellent education. Uh, I stand also stand in solidarity with the youth that have uh, stated that they have been slighted and silenced while not being allowed to assist in the creation of their own educational experience. I um, stand in solidarity with them. I also want to embrace the opportunity and thank uh, Vanessa, uh, uh, Council Member Vanessa Gibson and her phenomenal work in building and uh, making sure that we have in infrastructure for the sustaining of the buildings and, and safe environment for our children to have, to have on school. Um, I just wanna cut to the chase. Um, I am here to uh, ask and to stand before God and man to ask for a permanent budget for schools. No negotiating against cuts, no more meetings, hearings to fight against what should be given, no more cuts. We need, you need these hearings to be so that we can make things better. And that would be a better um, um, use of your time, of your precious time. Also, I'm standing here asking for police-free schools. It, our children are not criminals, they're not growing up criminals. And um, it hurts my heart when I hear that children are being let out uh, in handcuffs because they are having an, they're having a bad day. They're allowed to have a bad day. Also, I'm here to stand for trauma responsive uh, care and best practices uh, and be student centered and healing. I'm expired. I'll wrap up. Um, hire psychologists, not psychiatrists, who seek to focus on what is wrong and to medicate and label and medicate. No, we need psychologists who seek what's working good and build on that to create person centered supports and healing centered schools and be a support also for our social workers, nurses, um, uh, guidance counselors, because they're dealing with social and emotional issues and they need help and healing. And then also wrapping up, we need to reinvest in our global education and economic future by becoming student-centered for Latinx, African-Americans, also we are called as Blacks, Indigenous and Asian uh, population. Also, lastly, I'll say we need anti-bias training and cultural competitions, cultural competency training to be understood and implemented and also, I just want to thank 
uh, Paul Forbes from the Department of Education, Deshaun Robinson, and Natalie Zwerger of NYU. I thank you for your time, peace, and blessings, and I know we can do this. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jennifer Stewart. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Jennifer Stewart and my son Desmond is in pre-K at HeartShare, a 4410 preschool special, special education program. I can tell you that kindness is in abundance in 4410 schools, but funding is not. I'd like to also emphasize that 4410 preschool programs are the only public option for parents of preschoolers with disabilities. Today, I heard the words for all our children, equity and 3K and pre-K for all thrown around a lot by council members, but preschoolers with disabilities were the elephant in the room. They were not included in this all. And I wish you could all understand the gravity of this feeling as a parent. It's an absolute constant feeling that my child is being treated differently. And I know I'm not the only parent who feels that way. I'm disappointed in my city, a place that prides itself on being tolerant, inclusive, and progressive. It's easy to just pass the buck and say it's a state funding issue, but at what point does the city look at the blatant neglect by our current governor and say, this is not okay? When you say things like all young children will have a seat, you are blatantly ignoring the 1,000 to 1,900 preschoolers with disabilities that don't have any seat at all. All young children do not have a seat, but I guess our young children don't count. My child was almost one of those with left without a seat by a New York City Department of Education district employee. Her job was to ensure my son had a seat. She had that one job and almost left my son without a seat, but I bet she makes a lot more money than his current teacher who is breathtakingly dedicated to her job. As a former pre-K teacher, it makes my heart sink to hear that they're getting paid what they're worth. But what about our teachers? We aren't asking for more, we're asking for equity. And in 2021, we shouldn't have to ask you for equity. We shouldn't have to jump through hoops for equal treatment. I wanna, know what, I wanna know what you're going to do to stop this discrimination against the disabled community. You have to do something because what do you expect to transpire in the next five years? In the past five years, 31 4410 schools have closed because our teachers are the lowest paid in the entire city. Where do you think those current 4410 teachers will go with the salary incentives NYC is offering to three and pre-K for all teachers? Do you really think 4410 schools can hold on to teachers and recruit new ones while competing with a $30,000 wage gap? They can't. So if this keeps up in five years, there won't be any more 4410 schools. Have you thought this out at all? Where will children go after they age out of early intervention? How can they succeed in the New York City Department of Education without preschool? And until you prove otherwise by investing in our children via their teachers and schools, we can only assume that you don't wanna invest in their futures because you don't believe in their present. This is a slap in the face. The city has decided that our kids are not even worth mentioning. The city has actively chosen to invest in literally every other three and four year old in New York City, as long as they're not disabled. So please show us you believe in our children by acknowledging their existence and then by investing in their teachers and schools. If you don't step in now, these schools will close. Please don't let this be your legacy. They're not just our kids, they're your kids too. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Tanisha Grant. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Tanisha Grant. I am the CEO of Parent Support in New Parents New York, and I am the lead on the laptop initiative where we've given over 150 children the laptops that they deserve. Um, Chair Trigger, always appreciate you doing your job because so many don't. Um, I'm a big believer and learn um, in letting people tell their story. So I'm gonna tell mine. I'm a survivor of public education. A survivor. Because I come from something called the closed adoption. So before I went to school, this country, this city, this state said that I could never know where I came from. I am 45 years old and I don't know what my mother or father looks like. 
And then I was thrown into a system that sent me straight to the prison pipeline. I was in handcuffs at 11 because I was hangry, unnourished, and a black little girl. Let's be clear. This education system is created on hurting black people. Let's be clear on that. It is based in inequity to keep black children from learning. Since it was created, let's be clear on that. It has now affected all black indigenous people of color. Time I expired. am a generation behind my children. My 27 year old had bald spots at 12 because of school. We cannot fix a system that is built on an equity chair to a trigger. It all has to change. Every program that comes out chair trigger has to be built in equity. Has to be for every child. The person before me talked about her child. I have a four year old autistic nonverbal grandson. You are all preaching to the choir. Why do we need healing centered schools? Because I am traumatized that I have to be on this call all day. I am triggered in ways that most of you will never understand. So let's stop having all these conversations, Chair Trigger, and let's do something about it. Because our children are hurting. Generations of children like me are hurting. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will go back to Ronette Summers, um, see if she's able to join us. I'm starts now. Okay, it looks like we have lost her. Uh, we do a catch all at the end for anybody who has logged in, logged off, or logged back and may have missed their name. So um, we will uh, return to that. So um, that concludes the testimony for this panel. The next panel that we're going to call is Anthony Tassi, Literacy Partners, Lisa Schwartzwald, New York Immigration Coalition, Daryl Hornick Becker, Citizens Committee for Children of New York, Leah Van Halsema, Committee for Hispanic Children and Families, and Lena Billick, Children's Aid. We will start with Anthony Tassi. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Traeger and members of the committee for convening this important hearing. As you've heard from many witnesses, there are many, many important issues that you're facing today in this budget. And I wanna commend uh, the chair of this committee, uh, Council Member Traeger, for being everywhere at all times during this pandemic, having your eyes on the issues in your district and across the city. So I really commend your tireless advocacy on behalf of the students of the public school system. As a public school parent, I can tell you this has been obviously an unprecedented situation that we've faced and many people are trying very hard, but we obviously have some structural issues that we need to address. Top of the list for me, and I think for many people, is the treatment and engagement of parents in the system. We do have a fundamentally uh, unique and unprecedented opportunity to change how we integrate parents into the system. The thought process we use to understand that parents at this are at the start of the process of educating children, not a nice to have, not a should have, but a must have in every way. So I would advocate uh, that this committee ensure that the family engagement role at the Department of Education is fully funded 
is expanded with new funds that are becoming available from the federal government and that its role be understood as essential uh, to children having uh, a decent shot at academic achievement, that the role of parents is essential to addressing the equity issues, the very serious equity concerns that many other witnesses have testified about uh, today. And I would also recommend that the Department of Education's platform, the Parent University, be taken a look at as a golden opportunity to expand access to meaningful parent education opportunities, not as a means to communicate information about what's happening in schools, but as an opportunity to partner with parents and caregivers and help them build the skills that they need not only to back their children's education, but to succeed in today's economy. So Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for convening this hearing and please do uh, ensure that the family engagement function DOE moves into the 21st century and takes advantage of this once in a lifetime opportunity we have before us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Lisa Schwartzwald. Time starts now. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, my name is Liza Schwartzwald and I'm a senior manager of education policy at the New York Immigration Coalition, an advocacy and policy umbrella organization for more than 200 multi-ethnic, multi-racial and multi-sector groups across the state working with immigrants and refugees. For a year now, we have seen how public education has undergone a seismic shift with school closures, remote and hybrid learning and numerous changes in leadership, including at the highest level with the most recent transition uh, of the new chancellor. Unfortunately, throughout these changes, immigrant students have been left behind and families have been left in the dark. Much more needs to be done by the city to support families' complex and intertwined academic, emotional, and economic needs. We request that city council and the DOE work together to first urgently develop and implement a plan for catching up L's L's with disabilities and students with limited English proficient parents. According to 2020 data, L's continue to have the highest dropout rate of any subgroup in the city at 23%. Second, fund grants to community-based organizations and schools already well positioned to support L's and immigrant families. Third, fully fund and implement the NYIC's Education Collaborative Communications Plan to ensure that families have reliable access to important and timely information. And four, restore $12 million in adult literacy funding to address the multi-generational root causes of inequitable remote learning. Our recommendations offer a comprehensive response to address the gaps in services and supports identified by findings from our Education Collaborative survey of 100 immigrant parents and more than 20 immigrant students from New York City Public Schools. They reported that the main barriers to academic success since March 2020 were, one, a lack of appropriate communication and language access, two, academic regression and learning loss, three, inadequate and insufficient family engagement, and four, lack of access to English technology and systems navigation skills necessary to meaningfully support and engage in online learning. Thank you. I'm expired. Liza, I apologize. I know your name and I always get it wrong. And everybody does, it's fine. It, everybody sees it as Lisa, don't worry. <laughs> I know. I apologize. I apologize. And any other names, believe me, my last name, people mess it up, so I apologize. And, 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 I, and I just wanna just give a public shout out and thanks to the New York Immigration Coalition um, first of all, for highlighting these issues even before the pandemic, but certainly their, their need is even greater. But also when the DOE rolled out their, their technology, uh, iPad distribution, uh, NYIC immediately pointed out the barriers that many of our immigrants, students and families face in getting the technology. And uh, we had to advocate to break down those barriers and still more work to do. But thank you for being on this from day one. Uh, this is a stellar stellar organization that helps all of our families. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, council member. Uh, next we'll hear from Daryl from the Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Daryl Hornick Becker and I'm a policy associate at the Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Thank you, Chair Traeger and all the members of the Education Committee for holding today's hearing. For our full set of recommendations, I refer you to my written testimony. Today I'll highlight just a few areas where action is needed. First, the city must restore cuts and invest in wraparound supports, including summer programs and community schools. After this year, students will require the academic and social engagement that summer programs offer. And yet, despite the focus on summer enrichment that we heard from the chancellor today, the preliminary budget eliminates summer sonic camps. The administration must restore and baseline these funds for summer youth programs. And as the DOE develops new summer opportunities, CBOs must be included in the planning of those programs. 
Also, the city cannot place an emphasis on recovery while cutting holistic student supports like community schools. Community schools still face a $9 million baseline cut for fiscal year 22, even after the mayor announced an expansion to bring 27 new schools online this fall. We urge the administration and council to fully restore and baseline funding for community schools and call on the DOE to fully fund the new expansion RFP. Second, vulnerable student populations continue to need targeted supports. We urge the department to develop and fund a recovery plan specifically for English language learners that includes what we just heard, robust academic and language supports, including over the summer, direct grants to CBOs well positioned to support immigrant families, and a new communication plan that prioritizes immigrant families. CCC also urges the administration to take several actions to support students in temporary housing, including expedite its Wi-Fi installation at shelters, provide reliable tech support, and fill the vacant positions dedicated to students who are homeless within the department. Lastly, the city must invest in behavioral health supports for students. We were pleased to see the budget include $35 million for students' mental health, but the city cannot prioritize mental health while also funding and possibly expanding police presence in schools. The city should redirect the budget for school policing and use new federal funds to hire more trained staff, including social workers, and fully implement school-wide restorative justice practices. Time expired. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Leah. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you to Chair Traeger, as well as to the members of the Committee on Education for this opportunity to present testimony today. My name is Leah Van Halsema, and I'm with the Committee for Hispanic Children and Families, known by its acronym CHCF. So our work as a child care resource and referral agency and as one of the contracted DOE networks um, focuses on overwhelmingly supporting early educators in residential settings, family child care providers who are mostly Spanish speaking women of color. Under DOE contracted networks, we've seen that the provider rates still do not reflect the actual cost of care and that pay is dependent on enrollment, leaving network providers exceptionally vulnerable in a time when enrollment has plummeted during the pandemic. Further, significant delays in improving family subsidy eligibility and family placement and programs have led to severe disruptions in enrollment for providers whose businesses already function on extremely razor thin margins, even when fully enrolled. It's also important to note that there are thousands of independent family child care providers, either by choice or necessity, beyond the scope of the DOE's pay funded programming. The city must recognize that these unaffiliated providers are essential to New York City's infrastructure for working families. The city cannot afford to let existing child care deserts grow by depriving families that are, I'm sorry, depriving programs that are open and available to offer care throughout the city. An additional city program that CHCF has continued to proudly participate in while adjusting to the realities of the pandemic is Cities First Readers. CFR has given CHCF and our partner agencies and libraries the crucial capacity needed to engage families and providers in rich, flexible early literacy work to enhance and strengthen connections between young learners and their caregivers and to prevent the long-term consequences of this year's learning loss from hobbling a generation of learners. In addition, we also serve 300 students at the Bronx High School of Business as the partner CBO for this community school. Time expired. This model has been proven to be so effective for student engagement and academic growth. We echo our partners who have already testified in terms of baselining and restoring the funding for community schools this next year. Please see our written testimony for full detail, but we call on this committee to continue supporting and growing the programs that we know work for children and families. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, on this panel from Children's Aid, next we will hear from Lena. Time starts now. Hi, uh, my name is Lena Billick, Policy Analyst at Children's Aid and Steering Committee Member of the Coalition for Community Schools Excellence. Uh, thank you for to Chair Mark Trigger and the members on the Education Committee for allowing us to testify today. Um, for over 168 years, Children's Aid has been working to ensure there are no boundaries to the aspirations of young people. Our 2,000 staff empower 50,000 young people and their families across the city. For 25 years, we've also operated community schools with DOE, and we currently partner with 19 schools. During the pandemic, community schools have stepped up to provide crucial support to students and families. At our partner schools, We've provided wellness checks, mental health and social emotional support, delivered food, supported with remote learning and device access. The list goes on and I could be here all day. This is what community schools are designed to do. 
and community schools are needed now more than ever. Despite this, and despite knowing this, the mayor's administration cut 9.16 million last year from the DOE's community schools initiative. After a months long campaign against the cut, led by advocates, students, parents, principals, and our champions on the council like Chair Traeger, the city issued a restoration of the cuts for FY21. Though we celebrate that restoration, we wanna be very clear, community schools still face a $9.16 million cut for FY22. These cuts would negatively impact 30,000 students and their families. This after the mayor announced his expansion to add 27 new schools to the initiative by the fall. We're calling on the city with our partners to fully restore all cuts to community schools, baseline the, the, the funding and fully fund the expansion. The community school strategy holistically addresses barriers to learning and success, often caused by systemic and historical racism and inequality and worsened by the pandemic. To cut these programs with Time one expired. hand while proclaiming expansion of the initiative with the other is unacceptable. Community schools must be fully funded and invested in for an equitable path to recovery for New York City students. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that concludes testimony for this panel. Thank you to all the panelists. The next uh, panel that we will be calling up is Carlos Castel Croak from the New York, League of, New York League of Conservation Voters, Farah Ahmad, Natasha Capers, Coalition for Educational Justice, Madeline Borelli, and David Chung. The uh, panel we'll be calling after that is Taj, Sut Taj Sutton. And then from the Sisters and Brothers United, Brian Aju, Gio Ayala, Crystal Reyes, and Gabrielle Reyes. We will start with Carlos Castel Croak. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castel Croak, and I am the Associate for New York City Programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City. Um, and I'd like to thank Chair Traeger for the opportunity to testify today. NYLCV supports a fiscal year 22 budget that secures progress on many environmental, transportation, and public health priorities Mayor de Blasio has committed to in one NYC and beyond. It is unacceptable and unsustainable for the Department of Education to continue allowing bus companies to pollute our air with diesel buses. A transition to cleaner fuel technologies is necessary for the health and safety of our most vulnerable populations. In addition to greenhouse gas emissions, diesel school buses emit harmful particulate matter into the air and the cabin of the buses that damage the respiratory systems of children. NYLCV estimates that there would be a reduction of roughly 18 million pounds of NOx, 74,000 pounds of PM25, and 29 million short tons of greenhouse gases over 16 years, which is the average lifetime of a bus, if we replaced New York City's diesel school buses with all electric models. That would be the equivalent of removing 62,000 passenger vehicles from the road. Asthma is also the leading, leading cause of school absenteeism, absenteeism in New York City, a disturbing metric that illustrates how poor air quality and particulate matter can directly affect early learning and childhood development. We ask for 30 million in the fiscal 2020 budget for the purchase of electric school buses. This funding along with grants from the New York Truck Voucher Incentive Program will cover the difference in cost of replacing 15 to 17 diesel buses with type A electric school buses along with the necessary charging infrastructure. This relatively small number of buses is not as large of an, large as of an investment as we should be making to protect our children from the harmful effects of particulate matter and climate change but the city must take steps to start electrifying its school bus fleet so that we can work towards full electrification. In addition to the current investment needed to start transitioning away from dirty diesel buses to clean buses. Time expired. Council to consider passing legislation such as intro 455 to mandate that all school buses be electrified by the year 2040. Uh, lastly, real quick, um, NYLCV helped to launch the New York City Clean School Bus Coalition to bring together environmental organizations, parent advocates, and community groups to help fight for this important issue. And our coalition will continue to advocate for the electri electrification of school bus fleets and look forward to working alongside the council in this effort. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Farah. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Chairman Traeger, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to speak on our city's education budget for the upcoming year. My name is Farah Ahmed and I'm a community organizer with Jobs to Move America. We work in coalitions here in New York and across the country to fight for a just climate and worker-centered economy. 
We, alongside our allies from the Clean School Bus Coalition, urge the committee to make a critical investment of $3 million in electric school buses in the upcoming year. As others will testify, there is simply no good reason to continue poisoning kids, school bus workers, and the communities that host bus depots with toxic diesel fumes when cleaner technology exists. The transition to electric buses is causing major changes in the industry and we believe are important for the council to consider from the operation of the buses to the installation of electrical infrastructure and the manufacture of the school bus and its components. The department and its contractors must work closely with its union partners who operate our school bus fleets to ensure that drivers and technicians receive the training and job protection they need. Technicians in particular may need specialized training to ensure that the maintenance of the buses is not outsourced. We also urge the committee to plan for much greater investments in the coming years. If we get the policy right, this is an opportunity for the city to create good green jobs in the bus manufacturing industry while helping lower electric school bus prices at the same time. Just yesterday, our organization published a report which discusses in detail how we can deploy clean buses in New York State and here in the city while creating good jobs. We've included this report in our testimony as an exhibit. We're happy to provide additional assistance and information to the committee as needed in collaboration with our coalition and union partners. Parents, unions, environmental justice advocates, and community groups want to see time expired on our streets. It is time for our city to take the lead. Thank you very much for your attention to this critical issue. Thank you. And next we will hear from Natasha Capers from the Coalition for Educational Justice. Time starts. Hello, I'm Natasha Capers, director of the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice and mother of two New York City public school students. I would like to start by saying that this very body that claims to uphold culturally responsive sustaining education and language access has violated every principle of those beliefs. Not having simultaneous interpretation throughout the entirety of this hearing is beyond wrong and this body must immediately implement practices that would eliminate the barriers for all New Yorkers to be able to fully take part in the democracy of their city. And none of you, have called out this hypocrisy. This is not what language justice, racial justice, or democracy is. The hypocrisy and lack of respect for non-English speaking New Yorkers is shameful. And while everyone went over their allotted two minutes, the only two people urged to wrap it up were the two Spanish speakers using consecutive interpretation. Do better. In 2016, Parents across race, language, religion came together for CJ's launch of our culturally responsive education campaign, calling on the Department of Education to invest in curriculum, books, resources, and professional development that would allow students to have the better, richer, more fulfilling, historically accurate education that they deserve. This promise has still yet to be fulfilled. From our report in 2020 that um, Council Member Rodriguez cited, we see that five out of the nine curriculums have more books featuring animals as cover characters than Latinx, Black, and Asian people combined on cover characters, co covers of books. Of 42 texts in pre-K for all, only zero are Black authors, zero Native authors, zero Middle Eastern authors, one Latinx author one Asian author and 40 white authors. Of the 110 books in McGraw-Hill Wonders sixth grade curriculum, every single author we could identify as white. Let us be clear, CRSC is not about celebrations, heroes, holidays, or knowing a few trivia facts. It is deeply insulting to hear it boiled down in this way today and over and over again. It is about the humanity that doesn't just live or exist within white bodies. We are human too. Our humanity matters. Black, Latinx, Asian, Muslim, indigenous and immigrant people are human and we deserve to be seen in all of our intersections of gender, religion, sexuality and ability and spoken about and we shouldn't have to beg to do so. 
yet. Here we are again, begging for our system to do what is right, to make the investment in the humanity of every New York City student, including the 85% who identify as Black, Brown, and Asian. New York City must make the investments of half a billion dollars to make this a, a reality, to make CRSC curriculum a reality and ethnic studies programming happen in New York City schools now. The next person we will hear from, lost the page. The next person we will hear from is Madeline Borelli. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Madeline Borelli. I'm a District 21 special education teacher, a proud public school parent, and a member of Teachers Unite. In my career with the DOE, I have witnessed firsthand the dramatic effects of school policing on students of color, and that is nothing compared to the actual lived experiences of black and brown students. Some of those experiences you heard shared with you today. Alternatives to school policing exist. Many of the brilliant young folks and community organizers you have heard from today have put hours into creating and outlining alternatives to violent school policing. These alternatives require imagination, radical community care, and ultimately funding. I mentioned in a previous testimony that budgets are moral documents. So when a school loses a counselor or a social worker due to funding cuts during a pandemic, but the city has the money to hire 475 new school cops, it is clear where our morals lie. Imagine the radical shift that 475 more counselors or social workers could have in our schools, or 475 more youth advocates, parent coordinators, translators, and nurses, 475 more paraprofessionals, black and brown educators or restorative justice coordinators. We have to let go of this tired notion that cops keep us safe. We have seen time and time again that the only thing they protect and serve is the property of the rich and white. And this is no different in our schools. The fact that so many New York City students' educational experiences are marked by othering and push out is directly related to the fact that we constantly prioritize policing over students' well-being. So I'm here today to demand a just budget that fully divests from school policing and one that invests in students' mental, emotional, cultural, and physical health. Why is it that when one of my students is in crisis, they're more likely to be met with a cop in a uniform than a counselor? Why is it that in my seven years in the DOE, I have seen more students placed in handcuffs than I have seen engaged in restorative circles? So much talk today about equity, but what is equitable about the fact that 90% of all NYC students arrested are Black and Latinx? So if you, true, if you truly care about equity, then you city council members will not only vote no on intro 2211, but you will demand an FY22 education budget that divests from policing and reinvest in our communities and in the culturally sustaining practices that we need to reach and teach all students. Thank you. Thank you. And the next person that we will hear from is David Chung. Hi, everyone. Starts now. Hello, my name is David Chung. I represent Teachers Unite, Park Slope United Methodist Church, Church of Life After Shopping, PS15, Patrick Daly, and PS20, Clinton Hill, where I'm a proud parent, teacher, and SLT member. Uh, I'm here to urge you all to let go of policing, imprisoning, and punishing, and instead adopt a restorative justice approach to safety citywide. And in the DOE, it means investing in teachers, administrators, counselors, psychologists, paraprofessionals, school aides, nurses, therapists, and school programs. If you're not familiar with restorative justice, please look it up. I don't have time to explain it to you in two minutes. Thank you for spotlighting my video. Sorry, my camera's not working. Uh, but we don't want people who do wrong to change because they live in fear of being shamed or punished. We don't need to put others down to empower ourselves. That weakens us all because we all make mistakes. We want wrongdoers to change their behavior because why? Why do we want wrongdoers to change? Because we care about them. We deeply, truly care about them. It's not about us against them. If we don't care about wrongdoers, then we can just lock them up and keep schools as a police state for our children. 
but we can't expect improvements. We can't expect children to care because intimidating, imprisoning, and policing sends that message loud and clear. We don't care about you. Are you with me? So I'm expelled. Now, if we're a city that really cares about each other, then we all can understand each other. We all can examine our own mistakes and repair harm without intimidation, fear, and punishment. Because wrongs are committed by us. We all make mistakes. We are them. They are us. So let's stop intimidating and policing. Let's start to listen, breathe, talk, think, pray together, play together, learn together, work together. That is how restorative justice makes progress. Look up restorative justice, please. The day we give into fear, distrust, and division is the day we lose, no matter what side we're on, no matter what the issue is. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will hear from Caitlin Delphin, who wasn't on when I had announced the panel, but she was on this panel. So I see she's on now. If we can unmute Caitlin, please. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Caitlin Delphin, and I'm a special education teacher at a high school in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. I'm also a member of Teachers Unite. Um, and I'm here today to speak in opposition to the continued funding of policing in our schools and in opposition to intro number 2211. We need action now to fund more teachers, counselors, and social workers, as well as restorative justice professionals and community outreach um, providers. And we need to reduce policing in schools. Budgets speak volumes about where we place priorities. And right now the DOE budget is prioritizing policing and surveillance over the health, welfare, and actual safety of our students. This has been a long, hard year for all of us and our children have been impacted in huge ways as well. Despite this past year's difficulties, we've had moments of connection, joy, and students letting their true selves shine through, which um, unsurprisingly has been at sometimes easier for them uh, when they're able to be at home and away from the oppressive and police environment of this physical school building. We need to be building on these positive moments moving forward to help our students begin to heal. My students have gained so many important skills in the last year, self-motivation, time management, multitasking on top of the academic skills and learning they're doing, despite the schedule changes and uncertainty that we've all faced with, been all been faced with. But I am not at all concerned about an achievement gap arising among my students. I'm so proud of everything that they've accomplished. And I'm amazed at the independence and persistence that my high schoolers have shown. I've seen them build skills and continue to learn in this very difficult environment but I am extremely concerned about a care gap. These students are seeing a city that is beginning to slowly recover from the last year. However, rather than resources for their recovery at school, they're seeing the prioritization of policing over their health and education. This will be apparent to students from the very moment they walk through the doors of my school. They will not be welcomed by additional counselors or social workers or teachers to help them with the traumas of having to care for sick family members or feeling the weight of the family's finances on their shoulders or the social isolation they face. They will not be welcomed by more teachers to help refocus students who've had to be more involved in their younger siblings' schoolwork than their own or who still don't have access to adequate technology. They will not even be welcomed back to the school by working technology, which they still need to access their classes since due to resources and limited numbers of teachers, classes are still being taught remotely, even to students who are coming into the building at this time, as is true in every other high school I've heard about. Instead, when they get to the school, they'll be welcomed by scanning, which persists at our school despite a lack of violent incidents, the discontinued existence of the school, which prompted the scanning in the first place, and the documented use of metal detectors, primarily in outer borough schools serving majority black and brown students. Right now, my students do not need that scanning and surveillance and oppression. My students need love and support. They need additional counselors and teachers to help begin the healing process and support them in moving forward. They need staff trained in restorative justice who see them as whole people. We know, and my students know, that the current DOE budget does not prioritize them. They know this because they see the news and they see that other cities are defunding policing in their schools and other towns are supporting the return to schools. And they feel it because there's always scanning there to greet them. There's always a school security agent around the corner, but there's a long wait for an appointment with a counselor and their teachers are trying but stretched thin. Let's not miss another chance to show our children that they are the priority. 
Thank you. And that concludes the testimony for this panel. Um, and chair, just for the record, so for folks watching um, at home, the New York City Council website, the registration page, and the invitation email that comes out by committee staff for every hearing is very clear that the City Council offers accessibility, accommodations, and non-English non language interpretation. And how to access all of that is on our website, the registration page for hearings, and the hearing invite. So if anybody ever needs anything, that information um, is disseminated out there to the public. The next panel that we are going to call is Taj Sutton, Brian Aju, Gio Ayala, and Crystal Reyes. Following that panel will be Gregory Brender, Nora Moran, Mary Chang, and Hope Kennedy. We will first hear from Taj Sutton. Time starts now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, wow, there's so much to say. I think so I've been to a lot of these city council hearings and there are so many friends represented here and so many wonderful organizations led by educators and parents and students. And something that I've noticed throughout this pandemic is that we continue to say phrases like student voice and parent engagement and that we support our educators. And then when they come on these meetings and they wait for hours and hours to amplify the voices of the students and communities and, and staff that they represent, the budget does not reflect their desires, their needs, or their morals. I think the pandemic has made it very clear that budgets are moral documents. And although we've heard a couple people say that they don't believe the additional policing is necessary right now, that's not enough. Because what that means is that you might decide that it's necessary later. And I don't know about other folks on the call, but I haven't forgotten the city council budget where the entire city asked city council to defund the police. And you emphatically as a body said, no. I know there were individual fights and struggles, but in the end, the people, the students, the parents, the educators, the paras, the grocery store workers, the MTA employees, we didn't get what we wanted because what we wanted was the resources to back up the supposed values that we have in this so-called progressive city. And what we got was an increase to the budget and policing while the education and hospital budgets were slashed, which during a global pandemic is unconscionable and would be unconscionable any other time. What I'd really like to point out is that a lot of these councils are comprised of individuals in seats of power congratulating themselves on each other and each other on a job well done. I would love to see that energy spent really listening to families, really listening to educators, really listening to the dozens and dozens of students that came here. And it doesn't matter if you as an individual didn't have a bad experience with a school safety officer. The entire world watched George Floyd get murdered, watched Breonna Taylor get murdered, watched Tony McDade murdered. And if we don't think that that has an impact on education, on students, on families, we are living in a dream world. Please honor the call for police free schools from the Urban Youth Collaborative and all of their partners on the call today. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next, oh, next, we will hear from Brian. Time starts now. Uh, my name is Brian. I am a core leader at Sisters and Brothers United and the UIC. Um, and I strongly agree. Uh, I encourage the panel, not the panel, I encourage everyone, including Traeger, to hear and understand what every single person here from UIC and DSC is asking for, which is police free schools and divestment from police and implement more money into students for their mental health um, and social and emotional health. With that being said, I would like to use the remainder of my time to stand in silence to symbolize how you are silencing students' calls for police free schools. Thank you.
time expired. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Gio Ayala. Hi, my name is Giovanni. Hi, my name is Giovanni Ayala. I am a former alumni of Sisters and Brothers United. Um, I am here to ask for the removal of police from public schools in New York City, specifically those um, with predominantly PLC, Black, and LGBTQ youth. Um, as someone who grew up with an IEP and a parent who predominant, whose predominant language was not English, I found it really difficult to be able to attend my classes when I was younger, just because I was always told that I couldn't be part of the group as someone who didn't know um, English. Um, English not being my first language made it really hard for me to get all the information I needed. Even applying to high school was such a difficult task for us. Um, I ended up going to high schools that I didn't even know um, I was applying to because no one provided the assistance um, that my mother and I needed in order to move forward with that task. Um, eventually, with the passing of time, it got much harder um, when my mom tried to get information for me to join even things as um, college access programs. I was told that I wasn't able to go to those programs because there was no language information for me in Spanish. Um, and it's not just Spanish language that I'm asking for, it's everybody. Any language that someone wants to speak, um, they should be able to speak in their nat native languages. If New York is a progressive city, why aren't we giving people the opportunity to um, give themselves the voice and not always have to have to go through other channels in order to get what they need? Um, and I would like to use the remainder of this time to sit in silence. Um, and I'm again asking for the removal of police from schools. Time expired. Thank you. And next we will hear from Crystal Reyes. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Crystal with Sisters and Brothers United, the program director, and I'm also with the Urban Youth Collaborative and Dignity in Schools. I am also going to use my time, my two minutes to sit in silence and solidarity with the call for police free schools and symbolize what the council has been doing and silencing the voices of young people for all this time. Um, thank you. Time expired. Thank you. And that concludes uh, testimony for this panel. The next panel that I'm going to call up is Gregory Brender from the Daycare Council of New York, Nora Moran, United Neighborhood Houses, Mary Cheng, Chinese American Planning Council, 
Hope Kennedy, Sheltering Arms, Trey Lane Haynes, and Diana Cruz. We will first start with Gregory. Time starts now. You're not unmuted, Gregory. Gregory. You should see a, there you go. Is it working now? You can hear yes, me? go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon and thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Gregory Brendan. I'm here on behalf of the Daycare Council. Uh, the Daycare Council greatly appreciates this con committee's continued support of early childhood education. Um, as you know, Chair Traeger and many others of this committee uh, fought hard to get salary parity for the early childhood workforce. And we continue to count on this committee and the council uh, to be a strong ally of, it, of early childhood education. Uh, the early childhood system is in a period of both great opportunity and crisis. Um, we face crisis because of the huge changes that operating during a pandemic and changing policy procedures face, but we also have opportunity because uh, President Biden has led the largest um, new investment in early childhood education in more than a generation with the American Recovery Plan. With the city support and with the city and state wisely using the federal recovery funds, we believe we have the opportunity to strengthen early childhood education and to make it, to make it so that it can truly support New York City's recovery, especially for our working families and particularly working mothers who have been most impacted by the pandemic. I want to run through a few of the recommendations that I've given our written testimony of ways that we need to invest in early childhood education now. One is to continue to pay the full value of early childhood contracts based on capacity, not enrollment. Enrollment is fluctuating due to the pandemic and also in many cases artificially low because of backlogs at the city's end in uh, processing applications from families seeking uh, to obtain childcare. Uh, we also want to ensure that the city guarantees equity and access to health and safety procedures that um, uh, between what's happening in public schools and what's happening in community-based uh, organizations providing early childhood. This includes access to on-site nurses, professional cleaning, training around health and safety protocols, and incentive pay for, for staff who come in when their own health may be at risk to keep programs open. Um, but thank you. Uh, the last thing just wanted to say, um, we support the, um, there are many organizations looking to maintain their capacity uh, be, who have not lost or lost contracts in the birth to five RFP and we support them. And thank you again for the opportunity to speak to this committee. Thank you, Gregory. Next, we will hear from Nora Moran. Time starts now. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Nora Moran. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at United Neighborhood Houses. We're the membership organization of New York City Settlement Houses with 40 members in New York City, uh, providing early childhood education programs, uh, running learning to work programs, community schools, uh, lots of after school programming, uh, a lot of educational supports. Um, our testimony is, is broad, our written testimony and focuses on a couple things, but I'll highlight a few here. Um, the first is uh, on early childhood education. Certainly wanna echo all the comments from the daycare council. Uh, you know, we certainly need to make sure we maintain full funding for contracts right now in center-based and family child care networks. We've seen uh, significant fluctuations in enrollment due to the pandemic and city delay in processing applications. We want to make sure that that system is stable as we move forward. Um, we're also very concerned looking ahead about the birth to five procurement. In the Settlement House Network, we saw lots of shifts in slots and coverage, a uh, reduction in infant and toddler slots. Um, as well as a reduction in hours being able to, to serve families. Um, you know, we know that uh, there are sort of new investments made in other neighborhoods, um, but that can't come at the expense of uh, you know, existing centers and their capacity. We need to make sure we're growing the network overall and serving more families, um, given how crucial the need is for subsidized childcare in the city. Um, on learning to work, uh, we have several settlement houses who are learning to work, uh, run learning to work programs. Um, certainly wanna call for the full restoration of the learning to work program. Uh, we're very concerned that at this time when we're seeing greater rates of disconnection among New York City's youth, um, that we're you know, not investing in this population and not making sure that they're served. Um, and our last point is just on summer. You know, it's very heartening to hear the chancellor mention, uh, you know, a summer of fun and mention wraparound supports for students. Um, however, community-based organizations need to know the plan now. Um, right now, they think that there's no summer sonic funding for middle school students and that we have no middle school programming this summer. Um, so it's really important that uh, decisions be made as soon as possible. 
um, they cannot be last minute and that the planning really involves CBOs. So that way um, we have a smooth uh, summer that is able to serve as many children as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Mary Chang from the Chinese American Planning Council. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Traeger and members of the City Council for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mary Chang. I'm the Director of CPC's Childhood Development Services. I oversee 12 early childhood and school age programmings. And as a former CPC student and now staff, I can truly say that CPC strives to empower our community members as agents of social change. CPC's early childhood programs have been a critical safety net for thousands of working class AAPI and immigrant families. Under COVID, child care programs have been extremely stressed and under pressure, and now the community is faced with additional fears from increased hate crimes. When the cities get, with the city getting federal um, investment money in child care, we urge that the city councils to support restoration through CCBG, state and federal sources, so that DOE can stabilize providers looking at losses under the birth to five um, grant. The first round of birth to five RP awards through the DOE resulted in our coalition of settlement houses sites, looking at a loss of 39% of all slots and 72% of all extended days, toddler slots and three K slot losses. Since January, we're happy to announce that the DOE has partially restored slots one-to-one -one on providers and professional awards. However, many of us are still facing the prospect of partial, partially funded centers and closed classrooms making it difficult to remain open long-term. I also wanted to highlight some of the recent birth to five RFP preliminary budget concerns. There were caps placed on fringe rates, which will impact our unionized staff, and also DOE placed certain budget lines as indirect. These costs were administered for electricity, as well as for health and safety measures like janitorial cleaning supplies were also classed as indirect. It's really, those are already important during normal times, but during pandemic, we must have adequate access um, to cleaning supplies and maintenance staff in order to be really protecting our children's safety. Um, we are continue to be concerned about the transition for families into the new birth to five as CBO start, the start date at July is near and closer to us. Our current process of educating families on the different categories of care, like 3K half day versus extended day, which is subsidized has been truly confusing. We're hoping that the process of eligibility um, because it's currently very severely delayed as well as HRA cases that have been ignored for families. Um, parents and directors are frustrated and confused by the continued delays and worried about the future. The city needs to prioritize investing in working class families of color and community led efforts in order to, in, of recovery in order for New York City to be fully recovered from COVID-19 and, and, and from the hate crimes. Um, we hope that the city council will help us advocate for restorations in the upcoming year. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Hope Kennedy from Sheltering Arms. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Hope Kennedy and I am the Education and Site Director in Corona, Queens, one of Shelter and Arms' 10 early child education centers throughout New York City, South Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Harlem. Thank you, Chair Traeger and members of the New York City Council Committee on Education for the opportunity to testify before you today. Shelter and Arms serves mm -hmm. nearly 15,000 children, youth, and families each year and employ more than 1,100 staff from across the city. I'm here today to speak about three key issues under the oversight of the Committee on Education. The DOE RFP, Birth to Five and Head Start, Early Head Start Services, the need for increased investment in mental health and academic support for students and parents, and the needs of students and support. The RFP, the Department of Education began the process of rebidding the entire early child education system in 2019. We are now three months away from contract start dates. Enrollment for 2021 20, and 2022 school year has already begun. And there is considerable confusion for both providers and parents. While we know the DOE is trying to meet the needs of our communities, we are, we are concerned that the process is being rushed, including the calculation of need in our communities. We are not confident that our contracts will be registered by the start date of July, 2021. 
We do not have any finalized contracts for preliminary awards that are set to begin in just three months. Many providers, including Shelter and Arms, receive partial awards for far fewer seats at some of our sites than we currently, than we currently serve, including in communities that have now been identified by the DOE as high need communities where they need additional seats. Proposals for the DOE's most recent RFP, which will award additional seats in these high need communities most impacted by COVID-19 are due next week for contracts that are scheduled to begin in just three months. The city council must ensure that contracts for the city's early child education system, which is absolutely vital for the recovery of our communities are completed in a timely and transparent manner that gives both providers and families the confidence and stability we need as we enter the 2021-22 school year. Mental health and academic support. We urge the city council to invest additional resources, including on-site mental health counseling in our ECE centers to support the growing mental health needs of staff and families, especially our BIPOC mothers. Research continues to point to the increased need of mental health support in communities, especially our BIPOC women. Our program is designed to work with parents and New York City has recognized that the trusting relationship parents have with their children with their child care provider makes us an effective access point to needed care. Similarly, we know that the impact of the pandemic has caused many students to fall behind in school from the earliest years of development all the way through high school. Even in preschool, some children are receiving one-on-one -on -one tutoring to ensure they are ready to enter kindergarten. Children of all ages are going to need additional support in the coming school year and beyond. The city must invest additional resources to support children and their parents, including tutoring and expanded after school services to ensure the learning gap between families who can afford additional support and those who can't does not continue to grow. Lastly, students in foster care. Shelter in Arms also provides foster care services serving more than 220 school aged children and youth each year through our family foster care program and two group homes. We stand with nearly 30 foster care agencies, child advocacy organization, and calling on the city to include 1.5 million to establish a DOE office focused on supporting students in foster care, $5 million to provide bus transportation for students in foster care from kindergarten through sixth grade. This funding is vital to supporting the well being of students in foster care. At minimum, the city council should ensure that the fiscal year 22. Budget includes funding for at least one DOE staff member focused full time on students in foster care. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and for fighting for our children, families, and staff. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Charlene Haynes, followed by Diana Cruz. Time starts now. Mr. Haynes, you're not unmuted. You should see a message saying accept the unmute. Okay, now you go ahead. Good evening, my name is Trelane Haynes. I'm a staff attorney at Legal Services NYC in our Brooklyn office. Thank you, Chairman Traeger and members of this committee for the opportunity to testify before you today and for supporting our efforts to ensure equal access to justice for all New Yorkers. To that end, Legal Services Education Advocacy Project is requesting an allocation of $500,000 for fiscal year 2022 in support of ex expanding assistance to students with disabilities to receive compensatory educational services. As Chair Traeger stated this morning, students with learning disabilities have suffered tremendously during this pandemic, and it is our goal at LISNI to assist as many families as possible in securing compensatory educational services for their children. We also want to expand representation of students who have experienced trauma and will need social emotional support. LISNI has worked with the DOE this past year to bring the healing centered schools approach to our public schools, given the trauma that students have experience since the pandemic began, it is imperative that we have adequate resources to assist families with accessing support in this area. We also want to expand our assistance to students and parents who do not speak English as their first language. English language learners and limited English parents have faced tremendous obstacles navigating the school landscape, both online and in person. Lisney is currently litigating a federal lawsuit 
regarding the DOE's failure to provide mandatory interpretation services to these parents. We must expand our efforts to ensure that those students are accommodated <clears throat> and educated properly. We also need to expand our disciplinary work in all boroughs to ensure that students are not harshly penalized or suspended for COVID related infractions or other offenses. Trauma in children manifests itself in many different ways. We are dedicated to representing families in disciplinary hearings and advocating to challenge and eliminate on campus arrests where no imminent threat of bodily harm exists. And last but not least, we must end the technical among our children in New York City. Statistics have shown that a lack of technological devices and Wi-Fi has led to unequal academic achievement for low-income students. So therefore, we must make sure that we advocate for children in low-income communities, children in homeless shelters, and children living in foster homes to ensure that they have access to high-quality Wi-Fi and technological devices. Again, the Legal Services Education Advocacy Project is advocacy project is requesting an allocation of five hundred thousand dollars for fiscal year twenty twenty two. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. And finally, for this panel, we will hear from Diana Cruz. Thank you, Committee Time Chair, for taking. Now. Thank you, Committee Chair, for taking the time to listen to our testimony. My name is Diana Cruz, and I am here representing Hispanic Federation and the Latino Education Advocacy Directors Lead Coalition. Created by Hispanic Federation, this coalition consists of over 35 leading education advocacy organizations committed to improving Latino academic outcomes and opportunities in New York State. We cannot echo enough the immediate need for our families and students presented from our advocate partners here today. During the past year, educators, students, and parents navigated a set of exceptional challenges. And we commend the city for allocating resources to support the digital divide, food relief across New York City, social emotional supports, and summer youth employment. However, we know it's not enough. And now with the passage of the American Rescue Plan, the city will receive additional funding to address educational inequities and learning loss. Hispanic Federation and the LEAD Coalition strongly believe that the funds must be used to, to implement the following. One, intentional outreach supports for parents and students engagement. Two, opportunities for further technology trainings to improve digital, digital access for students, parents, and educators. Three, improve hiring practices for bilingual and diverse teachers. And four, target support for college career and career readiness for underserved students to fulfill their future goals. Improving communication practices means that the city must continue to invest in supports that engages, engages families, prioritizing immigrant families and families with students with disabilities. By involving trusted community-based organizations, pairing groups and others to disseminate information in various languages across the city. As for the digital divide, it is not enough to have connectivity to internet and a device when individuals do not know how to use technology. We highly recommend that the city allocates funding to create culturally relevant and linguistically appropriate professional development trainings focused on remote instruction. The pandemic has also impacted many teachers of color who may leave the profession. We ask the city to invest in resources that will focus on the recruitment, hiring, and retention of diverse educators. Now more than ever, post-secondary career readiness is interconnected with economic opportunity. We must, we must redesign courses and create more clarity on pathways that lead to thriving careers. Our final ask is that the city must focus on summer planning now as the pandemic continues to worsen the academic gaps for students of color. We must ensure that equitable summer opportunities are available, communicated properly and timely with families. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And that concludes testimony for this panel. The next panel that we will hear from is Luis Porto, New York Roadrunners, David Garcia Rosen, Fair Play NYC, Jenny Veloz, Fair Play Coalition, Devon Longley, Fair Play Coalition, and Quadira Coles, Girls for Gender Equity. We will first hear from Luis Porto from the New York Roadrunners. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Traeger. My name is Louis Porto, and I serve as a youth program coordinator at New York Roadrunners. Thank you for your opportunity to testify today. New York Roadrunners' mission is to help and inspire people through running. While we may have been best known for organizing the New York City Marathon, our organization is one of the largest nonprofit providers of free youth fitness programs in New York City. <clears throat> We're asking the City Council once again generously to fund our services for youth on their its physical education and fitness initiative which is critical to NYRR's ability to bring our program at no cost to roughly 800 New York City educators and 100,000 students in every single city council district annually. <clears throat> Sorry. 
have a unique reason for presenting this testimony today. Being born and raised in Spanish Harlem, my first exposure to running was through NYRR's free youth programming nearly 20 years ago. I can personally attest to the, to the lasting impacts of this program. Participating in this program took me from being a shy asthmatic kid to the outgoing athletic person I am today. It built the confidence and the desire to be physically active for life, and it's what enabled me to eventually earn a Division I collegiate track and field scholarship. As an employee at NYRR, I have come full circle, and now I work to empower teachers which, with the quality of physical fitness programs, support, and equipment as they strive to shape our city's youth. My colleagues and I worked hard to adapt our youth program to address unique challenges facing teachers in 2020, creating hundreds of new activities that safely can be used while kids are learning in person or remotely. NYRR remains committed to supporting NYC teachers this school and beyond. The importance of this seemingly simple job should not be underestimated. Helping kids be physically active and empowering those who teach them has long lasting effects. I respectfully thank the, ask the city council to reinforce the importance of keeping students active by renewing funding under its physical education and fitness initiative so that NYRR may continue to, at no cost, help youth across the five boroughs today. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. And next we'll hear from David Garcia Rosen, Fair Play NYC. Hey, my name, is David Time starts now. my name is David Garcia Rosen. I'm the Director of School Culture and Athletics at the Bronx Academy of Letters, Urban Assembly. This year's Public Schools Athletic League budget will once again fund world-class sports programs at the city's whitest high schools, while leaving Black and Latino students at the city's most segregated high schools, begging once again for athletic crumbs. This year's proposed budget will fund 44 teams at the city's whitest high school, Tottenville, for a quarter million dollars, including badminton and table tennis, while tens of thousands of Black and Latino students will continue to have no funding for soccer, basketball, football at their segregated schools. This year, once again, white students will have access to an average of 25 teams, while Black and Latino students all across the city will have no sports to play when the last bell of the day rings at their school. This has to be the year we finally bring an end to this racist systems and policies at the PSAL by supporting and funding the vision of Deputy Chancellor LaShawn Robinson for equity at the PSAL. 10 years ago, we had CEO Eric Goldstein who famously said, there will be no Marxist redistribution of sports in NYC. He is thankfully gone from the DOE. And now we have a new PSAL leader, Seth Schoenfeld, who meets with teams to take charge, fair play, integrate NYC, and supports their vision for equality at the PSAL through shared access and umbrella programs. 10 years ago, we had Deputy Chancellor Grimm, who wouldn't even look at a presentation about the inequitable distribution of sports, dismissing it with a shrug, saying we have no money for this. Today, we have Deputy Chancellor Robinson, who has a plan to bring equity to the PSAL, but just needs the support of this council and the mayor to make it happen. We now even have a chancellor who was a principal at a school in the Bronx with only 13 teams, 12 less than the average white student at a New York City public high school. This council cannot approve $1 in this year's budget for the PSAL unless they agree to stop violating the civil rights of black and Latino students in New York City's public high schools and provide every student in New York City with equal access to high school sports. This is the year we can make it happen and this is the year we must make it happen. We can't wait any longer. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. Council Member Traeger, do it. Let's do it. I'm in. And this is the year for us to get it done. It's awesome. a major priority. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Jenny Velaz from the Fair Play Coalition. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jenny Velaz. I'm a community organizer with New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and I'm here representing the Fair Play Coalition. The Fair Play Coalition is a coalition of students, teachers, coaches, principals, parents, activists, and advocates standing together for all high school students in New York City public schools to have equitable access to the PSAL and to all athletic fields and courts controlled by the DOE. Thank you to the New York City Council for allowing us the opportunity to speak on this critical issue of access to after school sports and how the Department of Education allocates PSAL resources. Due to the COVID pandemic, students have been without after school sports for a full year. With the return to sports on the horizon, we wanna emphasize that a return to the status quo is not acceptable. A return to sports must take health, safety, and equity into consideration. We are here to ask that the council ensure that when the DOE budget is finalized, any and all money allocated for restoring PSAL sports when it is safe to do so only be given to the DOE under the condition that it be distributed in an equitable, in an equitable manner citywide. 
We should look at the current suspension of in-person school and PSAL sports as an opportunity to fix what we all know has been broken. This is not our first time addressing this issue. We have also provided similar testimony over the last few years. Unfortunately, the same inequity still remain. The PSAL continues to treat public high schools unequally, providing more resources to larger, more integrated schools, while smaller schools that are predominant, predominantly Black and Latinx are left with scraps. So today we humbly ask the council to ensure that the PSAL doesn't simply do the easy thing of bringing back bad habits, but that it takes advantage of the pause on all sports to reinvent the system to ensure that equity is at the core of the PSAL as it comes back to as as it comes back as much as health and safety are. And I want to echo my Fair Play Coalition partner, David Garcia Rosen, in saying that the time to do it is now. We have the opportunity. Let's get it done. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Devon Longley from the Fair Play Coalition. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Devon Longley. I'm a senior at Bronx Academy of Letters. I'm, I am an artist and a class representative for the Fair Play Coalition. In my time advocating for Fair Play Coalition, I learned more about society and what it means to fight for sports we love. In this past year, all schools around the city, my school, like all schools around the city, my school completely shut down sports. For the first time, students around the city felt what we had to go through, no ability to practice or play the sports that we love. Because all, because, sorry, because even though all students were equal in the total lack of sports in most of 2020, before COVID, we already understood what it meant to be deprived by, sorry, what being deprived of playing the sports we love felt like. The severity of this inaccessibility have led students into a spiral, damages students' mental and physical states. In 2019, my students have four, in 2019, my school had to forfeit all of its soccer games due to the lack of resources, even though our team included school um, students from another school who also couldn't support a team on their own. As a result, students with the passion of soccer were unable to enjoy the feeling of playing the sport they loved and had to find an un alternative means to play the sport. But, be but, <clears throat> but most underfunded schools in New York City don't have that option for students. Oftentimes, they use sports as an escape such as men, many of the students who, who were part of my uh, soccer team. This is meaningful to me because I want to enable the future for generations um, to have access to sports because you cannot replicate the feeling of playing competitively alongside teammates and having that experience. I personally have always wanted to play volleyball, but my school um, applied for boys volleyball, team, volleyball, sorry, a boys volleyball team even before I was a freshman and was denied a team. This is why we this is why we have to discuss what policies and changes we need to make so that we can tr have a trusted equitable system going forward. School is reemerging along with sports and we should take this opportunity to make a versus heard and educate those who are unaware of this. I grew up not knowing of the lack sorry I grew up not knowing of the lack of opportunity we had um, time holds that. Uh, <laughs> no worries take your time Devon. I I I'd like for you to finish your testimony. Okay, um, now that students and athletes all around New York City understand what it means to not have the experience and accessibility of playing their favorite sports, everyone knows what this accessibility, inaccessibility means. We should return back to normality with the access and, equ and equity of sports, no matter the disparity of the school or the student. When I, when I became a class representative for the tours that represent this issue, it became my mission to ensure that my voice is heard by those in, in our community and by the PSAL. We will ensure to have equitable opportunity for black and brown students even after my role is over. Vaughn, that was excellent. I'm very proud of you. I, I was a former high school teacher taught seniors. It is not easy to come out at even virtual city hall government and you did a phenomenal job and you spoke a lot of truth to power just now. Um, and, and Devon, did I hear correctly that you attend Bronx Academy Letters, is that right? That's yes. where uh, that was uh, Principal Principal Aaron Gary's school. Is that right? Yes. Um, uh, my my condolences to your to your entire school community. I, I I had the honor of speaking with her when at the height of the pandemic, uh, and she was fighting so hard for her students, and I'll never forget that. And actually, her her story and the story of other schools is what led us to prioritize the single shepherd program to save those vital single shepherd counselors and social workers. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna fight for them again this year, but this is the year once and for all uh, to make that much of an impact on PSAL equity because 
when the mayor talks about uh, reopening the programs, it's not reopening the programs for all kids. It's just some kids. Uh, this is the year that we, we provide opportunities to, to all the zip codes across the city of New York for all of our children. Um, this is a top priority for me and for this council. And we're going to get something very big done this year. Thank you, Devon, Thank for you. your great work. Very proud of you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Quadira Coles from the Girls for Gender Equity. Time starts now. Good evening, Chair Traeger and members of the committee. My name is Quadira Coles and I am the policy manager at Girls for Gender Equity. We are here again to demand that the council prioritize police free schools and invest in students in education with services, programs and support that addresses the inequities that were laid bare by the pandemic and transition to remote learning. There is a citywide consensus that the emotional and mental well-being of students, as well as support and preparedness of school staff, should be atop of the city's education priorities. Neither school communities nor students were prepared for the major changes brought on by the pandemic, and these experiences will continue to shape how students show up in their new educational settings now and in the future. The mayor has misled the public into believing that he defunded the NYPD by $1 billion when, in fact, he did not. And now with the fiscal year 2020 budget, we are reminded that the reductions were not only modest, but non-reoccurring. In addition, despite the mayor's map, including the transfer of school safety division to the DOE, the division is still operating under the NYPD's budget. The fiscal year 2020 budget plan has the NYPD's school budget larger than ever. These are just a few instances where city government has promised one thing to the public in the name of police reform and done the complete opposite in practice and implementation. As, plan, as plans come to lay and decision-making remains non-transparent to the public, aside from comments captured during oversight hearings, we call on the council to reject any potential new hiring of school cops in the fiscal year and in the years to come. We want to use this education budget oversight opportunity to raise components of the mayor and council's police reform reinvention proposals that will require newer or additional expenses. To start the proposed reforms by city council and mayor further entrenches policing in schools instead of meeting the needs of school communities. This culture of surveillance and criminalization pushes students out of schools and forces them into the carceral system. You all have the opportunity through budget negotiation process to er eradicate violence at the hands of law enforcement in schools and redirect the money once okay. spent to transform our schools in a direction of healing support rather than exp expediting misguided reforms through compliance with executive order 203. We strongly encourage, again, the city council to reject the mayor's attempt to codify school safety transfer through executive 203 as described in his draft. This transition will require an opaque and potentially boundless financial commitment that could otherwise go to building something that more closely mirrors what we need rather than what is convenient or the lowest possible lift. These proposals are skewed towards priorities of the NYPD instead of new big sustained investments in the whole school community. We are grappling with a long legacy of police violence. Refusing to dismantle the division means that police complicity, complicity and policing culture will continue to be an interruption of young people's education. If the mayor and city council close a if the mayor and city council close the COVID achievement gap and make sure that students and staff are supported next year, the focus should be on supporting pathways to young people's leadership, employment, and resources in their school and communities, not policing. Finally, I want to reiterate that the public deserves an honest and quick response regarding the 475 new hires to the school safety division. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. And that concludes uh, the testimony for this panel. The next panel that we are going to call is Rachel Gazik from the New York Edge After School Programming, Carly Mikalo from Ramapo for Children, Solangel Amanti Go, the Brotherhood Sister Soul, and Na Shorm Adu. And we will start with Rachel from the New York Edge After School Programming. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Krager, for your leadership on behalf of our city's youth and for the council's longstanding support of New York Edge, formerly known as Sports and Arts and Schools Foundation. I'm here today on behalf of our fiscal year 22 citywide funding request of a million dollars under the council's after school enrichment initiative. 29 years ago, New York Edge was created at the suggestion of the New York City Council to provide free wraparound summer camps for children attending summer school. 
From these beginnings, we have grown into the largest provider of after school and summer programming in New York City, traditionally serving over 40,000 students a year at 134 locations throughout the five boroughs. Our mission is to help bridge the opportunity gap among students in underinvested communities by providing programs to design to improve academic performance, health and wellness, self-confidence, and leadership skills for success in life. It's the belief of our board and staff that every child is gifted and talented, if only given the necessary tools, resources, and supports. And our name implies we strive to provide every student in our program with the edge that they need to succeed in the classroom and in life. Fiscal year 21 council citywide funding is also supporting our current after school programming. Um, currently we are running 107 programs, including seven learning labs throughout the five boroughs. And as the public school system resumes in-person instruction, more and more of our staff will return to the classroom. This year has brought new collaborations with partners, including Teach Rock, founding legendary guitarist of Stephen Van Zandt, Mets on the Moves, US Olympic handball team, the New York Knicks, author and illustrator Tay Diggs and Shane Evans. New York, its students and families are extraordinarily grateful for the support for, provided by the New York City Council these past 20 year, 29 years. We're now looking for you to meet the needs of the next generation of young people by supporting fiscal year 22 citywide funding request of a million dollars, which will bring us back to our fiscal year level of funding. Thank you. Thank you. And the next panelist we will hear from is Carly Nicalo from Ramapo for Children. Time starts now. Good evening. I'm Carly McCullough. I'm here representing Ramapo for Children, which is an organization that provides capacity building for parents and any adult who works in our schools. Thank you for everyone present for this opportunity to share our testimony. I am the Director of Resilience and Trauma-Informed Initiatives, and I'm here today to echo what has been shared many times um, to this body to continue funding for restorative justice in our schools. The funding does exist in this budget, but it needs to be allocated as such. Um, and we have uh, heard countless times on this panel that uh, the school safety and officers are an easy way to find this funding that actually supports our schools. Our restorative justice team promotes the values and practices of restorative justice, which has the potential to transform our schools and our communities, but only with long-term and system-wide commitment. When restorative justice, that usually looks like a five-year commitment per school. Um, restorative justice provides a foundation for strong relationships and strong supportive learning environments. Much of that support and strong relationships was severed over the last year, but trauma-informed restorative schools are designed to get everyone, teachers, staff, students, admin, uh, food people, facilities, and families through these trying times. People are not well across all levels of education. Without support for intentionally building and sustaining community resilience, we could easily see an increase in unaddressed secondary trauma for young people and their families that could last generations. At Ramapo for Children, we've had the honor to see firsthand how restorative justice initiatives that are currently taking place, funded by OSID, in the middle schools in all five boroughs have already helped those school communities reintegrate into hybrid learning as they re-enter schools. Continued funding demonstrates a commitment to the well-being of our communities, the future of our city, and an opportunity to heal from the systemic racial and social inequities that are plaguing our schools. Time expired. We ask the city council, DOE, and all stakeholders to prioritize a commitment to the continued funds for restorative initiatives. If we don't find or reallocate the money now, it has the potential to have vast and long-term consequences for this school going generation. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Solangel Amanti Go, followed by Nashorme Aidu. Hi. My name is Solangel Almonte and I'm a youth organizer with the Brotherhood Sister Show. I'm a high school student at Community Health Academy of the Heights. A proper education begins outside the school. In one of the world's richest cities, providing housing and food to low-income high public high school students should not be looked as a choice but mandatory. Many NYC public school students are homeless and barely surviving. These students and their families struggle financially while being criminalized for being low-income, Black, and Latinx. 
NYC must provide students with technology, food, physical, and mental health care, whether we're in a pandemic or not. The people who are always left behind have not been considered during this pandemic. What is being what is being done for homeless students? What is being done for students who live financially on civil homes without food, heat, or Wi-Fi? What is being done for students who live in abusive homes? The same thing that was being done for them before the pandemic, nothing. There is a lot New York City must do for its public school. There is a lot New York City must do for its public school students inside the school building. And the need for children be. It looks like your connection is has cut off. Are you still there? Okay, we'll go to the next panel. Let's try logging out of the Zoom and logging back in, um, and then we will um, come back to you. So let's go ahead and um, unmute Nashorme. Time starts now. Good evening. My name is Nashame Adu. I'm the policy director for Expanded Schools. We are a local intermediary that supports local nonprofit organizations for after school programs via funding um, and coaching and TA support. I'm here today to specifically speak with you about our, our program called the Middle School Expanded Learning Program, also and well known as MS Extra. Um, this work is coordinated by the New York City's Middle School Quality Initiative which is an invaluable investment in supporting students in schools as they work towards equity in education and amelioration of literacy in middle schools, particularly as COVID experience, as students have experienced COVID learning loss as they continue to adjust to remote and socially distant learning. We know that proficient literacy skills in middle school are essential um, to, towards building out the lives that we all want for our young people and that 66% of New York City's children from low-income communities do not receive the support needed to achieve proficient literacy skills, which then has um, a positive correlation with high school dropout rates and has detrimental effects on their post-secondary and career endeavors. And so we're here today to ask that funding for the middle school expanded learning program, also known as MS Extra, is fully restored at 1.5 million, along with other programs associated with the Middle School Quality Initiative. What makes MS Extra different from other programs is that it focuses on the lack of comprehension for students who do know how to speak, how to read fluently throughout their middle school years. Students who struggle with reading comprehension spend an hour per day engaging in small group tutoring led by trained professionals in which they analyze various culturally relevant texts. Throughout the implementation, they are able to see themselves mirrored in literature as a way that they can eventually find windows for discovery of other cultures and experiences. Participating schools also extend the learning day by 2.5 hours so that young people can engage in arts, sports, academics, and social emotional learning. Time expired. To build their skills. Again, this is a resource that was completely critical prior to COVID and, and just continues to prove its relevance and importance as a, a really critical tool towards COVID recovery. So we ask that you do support this in the upcoming budget, um, along with the many other needs that we see for young people in our most vulnerable communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And it looks like we got back Solange. So we'll go ahead and unmute and we will try um, one more time to get the testimony. Time starts now. Um, there's a lot of New York City must do for students inside the school building and the need for trustworthy support student, student support staff in school is at the top of the list. This is essential for a healthy school culture. One social worker, one counselor for school is not enough. Being a teenager is hard enough. Living in New York City is hard enough. Being a teenager in New York City is not it's not easy, especially when you have no one to talk to. Each student is going through their own personal and family issues. Each student deserves the attention and time from professional adults. Some students go to high school never meeting the counselor or social worker. And the few that meet them don't trust their counselor or social worker. The only professional adults outside of the classroom who speak at young children are school safety agents. And these police officers are not listening to us. They're policing us. Trust needs to be earned. Trust takes time and student support staff. Replace school safety agents with student support staff. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes 
uh, the testimony for this panel. Next. Next, I'll be calling on Tamara Geyer, Kamala Carmen from New York City Opt Out, Iman Hamby from Sisters and Brothers United, and Jennifer Finn, Teachers Unite. The panel after that will be Travis Mariani, Sisters and Brothers United, Wesley Guzman, Sisters and Brothers United, Leopold Spone Geller, O F E N Y, and Nia Morgan, Urban Youth Collaborative. We will first start with Tamara Geyer. Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you're on muted. Go ahead. Amazing. So, first of all, thank you, Chair Traeger, and thank you for the committee in general for the opportunity to testify. My name is Tamara Geyer. I am a parent and a parent association president from South Williamsburg. Um, and I'm really happy to see you here so long on this call and so involved, although I do look forward to the day when our civil servants who are supposed to listen to us from the DOE actually go after the public and hear all of these comments first. Anyway, I'm here to talk about, as many have before, the budget as a moral document, right? We all know that this committee knows it more than anyone else. You guys have acted on that very often, even in the recent past. But what these dual pandemics have illuminated is that there are certain items which can't be half-stepped can't be reevaluated, can't be put off for later, and we have a very limited amount of money to work with. So, starting on the recent history started by the PEP that did not um, extend the Pearson contract for GNT, we need to examine all high stakes testing. We cannot use the language we hear coming out recently of learning loss to institute more high stakes testing to investigate this. We know what student needs. They need small class sizes. They need counselors. They need schools where there are no cops in them, right? These are all places where we can save money and return our schools to a much more human, one-on-one, -on -one, culturally responsive atmosphere that will craft a generation that will grow up not only to do us proud, but to really sort of save us from all the mistakes that we have made. So I'm not here to tell you today what to spend money on because I think that's very clear. I'm telling you that there are some things- Time expired. That we should not spend money on. A previous speaker said not $1 to testing, not $1 to policing. We have an opportunity here to do so much better for all of us and thank you for your time. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Kamala Carmen from New York City Opt Out. Hi, uh, my name is Kamala Carmen, and I am a public school parent. I'm also a co-founder of the grassroots organization NYC Opt Out. I testified before this committee about two years ago. It was a memorable occasion because Anthony Ramos and his uh, former high school teachers, uh, Sarah Steinweiss, also testified at that meeting. And the point of their testimony was that had Steinweiss not been able to look past Anthony Ramos's uh, pretty poor standardized test scores to see him holistically, he may never have gone on to acting conservatory and then on to uh, being in the original Broadway cast of Hamlet. Uh, Steinweiss's story didn't have such a fairy tale ending. Uh, she felt so hamstrung by the strictures of teaching in a test-based environment that this talented teacher left the system, which is a loss for our city school children, um, including any future Anthony Ramoses. So it was ironic and deeply disappointing when at that same hearing shortly afterwards, Linda Chen, who is the NYC DOE uh, chief academic officer, um, confirmed that the city would be imposing further testing, standardized testing on our children, in this case, the MAP tests. Um, then as now, we are told that we need these tests to know how our schools are doing, how our children are doing. And uh, Council Member Traeger, I specifically recall that you said, if you really want to know what they're doing, this is what you said to her, you can pick up the phone and call them. You can speak to the schools. You can speak to the principals. You can speak to the teachers. Um, and you were exactly right, because our teachers, like, uh, uh, like uh, um, Steinweiss, have uh, expertise. They have 
master's degrees, sometimes they have uh, doctorates, and they are trained in crafting assessments for the students who are in front of them, not th that reflect those students, not some theoretical student that's for the, uh, you know, uh, the off the shelf uh, product um, assessment like the map. So um, at this budget hearing, I ask that not one penny be spent on the map or similar uh, testing instruments. Um, you have heard all the good ways we could be spending that money. Don't use it for something as inessential as the map. This coming year will be more crucial than ever that we see our children as more than data points, not to mention that the US Department of Education in a study found that the map has no statistically relevant impact on student achievement. Finally, on the subject of another set of tests, the federally mandated state test, I bring your attention to former Chancellor Carranza's outgoing promise that all parents be given information about opt-out in multiple languages. I want everyone on this call to be aware that they have the right to opt their children out of these tests and for the DOE to honor this promise in a timely manner. And this year that expense extends to the Regents exams as well as the third through eighth grade tests because the Regents exams are not graduation requirements this year. Thank you. And I wanna thank you uh, publicly uh, for re-upping Anthony Rollins' story, which I'm going to continue to also amplify during my career because uh, a child that our system labeled as underperforming is now one of the top performers globally. He just came back from Budapest recently. This, this summer, we're going to finally see In the Heights, which I cannot wait to see. Um, and I am so proud of him. And he inspired me and challenged me to invest more in the arts uh, and theater in my district and across the city. And uh, we recently announced that we made a significant seven and a half million dollar investment in John Dewey High School to build a beautiful Broadway theater auditorium. But the bigger story here, to your point, is that the system failed him. The system tried to label him as underperforming through the use of standardized exams and adequate supports, when in reality, this, this kid's a shining star and we should have brought that out of him much sooner and earlier. Um, and uh, I also want to say for the record that because New York State is still, you know, or the federal government and, and the state requiring the administration of state exams next year, that is contributing to significant staffing demands of our schools. Because when the mayor announced about the opt-in period, again, being reopened, one of the initial things I heard from principals, again, schools, schools want, principals want schools to safely reopen. They want to help their children. But one of the demands is to administer the exams. And they don't know how to make this work with inadequate staff and support. So just imagine we're prioritizing exams over services for children. It is outrageous. It's outrageous it is, it, and other districts are, are letting their parents know that they can opt out. And, and our district, and, we're the biggest one in the state. We need to do it. And, and quite frankly, it, it would allow, if, if, if they could just get rid of these tests, it, it would allow actual services for children rather than people scrambling on how to administer this test that quite frankly, the, the results are, 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 are meaningless, quite frankly. And, and so I, I just, I, I applaud you for amplifying this even before the pandemic. Um, and I also am on the record saying that as far as the high school regions, again, never really measured uh, student performance and work. Um, and there are proven models, project-based learning, which I've always been supportive of. So thank you for always amplifying that. Thanks for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Iman Hamdi. Time starts now. Uh, you're on, hello, can you hear me? Yes, you're unmuted. Go ahead. I'm at the Point CDC and I attend Bronx Earthwise High School. I live in the Hunts Point area of the Bronx and I'm here in support of police free schools. The council needs to focus on increasing money for support systems that help young people in, in, dif in different circumstances. A mental health professional should support youth when dealing with a mental health crisis. Social workers or counselors can help lower tensions when a fight happens. 
the police are an armed force and should not be who schools rely on for safety because students are scholars, not criminals. For me and my other classmates, it would reduce a lot of stress and we would feel a lot safer at school. I know a lot of you think that putting police in schools is the most secure method to keep them safe. It's not. And if I put them at more risk, I assure you that even minor offenses like late attendance have led to countless arrests of black and brown youth. This needs to end. Black and Latin ex students in New York City have consistently been targeted for harsher punishments than their white peers and arrested at a higher rate. As a result, black and Latin ex students make up 90% of all youth arrests, court summons, and juvenile reports issued by school police. The representatives here today have an opportunity to end decades of abuse first set into motion by former mayor and current seditionist, Rudy Giuliani. Today, I call upon the council to stop funding the school and two prison pipeline and make our schools free from police. Invest in us and invest in all the New York City students. Thank you. Thank you. And next, we'll hear from Jennifer Finn, Teachers Unite. Time starts now. It looks like we lost Jennifer, so we will now um, go to our next panel. Um, the next panel is Travis Mariani from Sisters and Brothers United, Wesley Guzman, Sisters and Brothers United, Leopold Spongellert, O-F-E-N-Y, and Nia Morgan, Urban Youth Collaborative. We will start with Travis. Time starts now. Okay, we will um, come back to Travis. Uh, we will go to Wesley Guzman from Sisters and Brothers United. If we can go ahead and unmute Wesley. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Wesley Guzman. I'm a youth leader from Sisters and Brothers United, and I would like to use my two minutes to sit in silence to symbolize how you are silencing students and calls for police-free schools. Time expired. Thank you. And next we will call on Nia Morgan before we go back to Travis. Nia Morgan. Time starts now. Um, thank you, Chair Tiger and City Council. Um, I will be brief. Um, I just echo a lot of what youth and advocates have said today, uh, opposing police in schools, as well as the inequities that exist throughout our New York City public education system. I will just add a point that not folks like folks haven't highlighted yet today, and that is how much New York City is an outlier um, in New York City public school, like 
an outlier in having police in school. And I'm speaking as an individual, not in my official capacity as a staff member at the Urban Youth Collaborative. Um, the fact that our city spends um, $450 million on police and schools just through the executive budget, not even through all the money that goes towards metal detectors and surveillance equipment is an outlier. The next largest school, school system that uses police in schools is Los Angeles United School District. And they just cut their budget 35% from 70 million to 35 million. Yes, so 35, 45, 45 million, they cut it 25 um, million dollars. Um, and that that means that our, the next largest school district not only cut it, but is so much smaller than our policing budget that it's almost unconscionable. In fact, it is unconscionable, the fact that we spend so much money on this. The system did not appear out of nowhere. It was designed to act this way and to actively police um, Black and Brown youth in particular. It also was a way to funnel resources away from the students who needed the most. Um, it was a way to control students and not to actually educate and support them. Um, so I just would also like to echo the needs of the most marginalized students to, and for them to be centered in all of our conversations. Um, it's not just black and brown youth. Um, it's folks who have disabilities, folks who are who identify as queer. Um, it's folks who need language access. Um, they deserve more than equity. They deserve justice and it's far past time for that. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will go back to Travis Mariani. Time starts now. Okay. Um, he's not accepting the unmute. So there have been a lot of people that have been coming on and dropping off throughout today's hearing, some people who I had seen on our registration list. So if anyone has dropped off and is now back on the Zoom and has not testified, please use the raise hand function now and I will call on you in the order that you raised it. Seeing no hands, that concludes the public testimony for this executive budget hearing, Chair Traeger, and I turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm, and thank you to the entire uh, council uh, staff for your help for preparing us uh, for today's important hearing. Uh, so much work happens behind the scenes, on the scenes, and I really appreciate the council staff, my staff and the education committee staff. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we, have, we still need a lot of more information. Uh, we didn't get a lot of answers from the, D, from the DOE today, um, as you know, we welcome the new transfer, but the staff there at the DOE, um, just for the public record, you know, we did submit a list of questions to them in advance to get answers today, and we're, we will follow up to get those answers. Uh, I also, I, you know, a couple of questions came up during the course of the hearing with regards to their, uh, the administration's proposal or idea of hiring additional school safety agents, which for us in the council is a non-starter. Uh, I made that clear at the previous hearing. I, I will re 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 repeat that position. And, you know, the mayor's office sent me messages that folks were not supposed to say that. Well, we want that off the table and we want that money invested in our school communities in meaningful ways towards uh, social workers, counselors, restorations of programs, community schools, LTW, PSAL, a whole, whole host of things that we know our kids actually need and actually make a difference in school communities. Um, and uh, so we will, we'll, we'll be following up. And uh, again, thank you everyone for your testimony and folks who have email written testimony, email testimony over, we, we do review it. And I thank everyone for their time and this hearing is uh, adjourned.